Audiobook title, Matt, 038, 000-91, by Matt Chu 07 Part 02. This work belongs to author, Matt Chu 07. Source, Wattpad.com. On me Matt screamed to Kelly and Fred as they began circling the creatures, trying to hit them with their silenced rifles. Suddenly, John came back and ordered them to switch to shredder rounds. Matt swapped clips then he, Fred, and Kelly opened up again, but this time at the floor the creatures were standing on. The wood splintered and cracked then the creatures plunged down through the hole. John, Kelly, Matt, and Fred quickly began to push over a large stone monolith and they were joined by James, who was missing part of his left arm. Matt saw a small box that contained a crystal begin to fall towards the hole so he stopped pushing, ran over and grabbed the box before it got to the rim of the hole. But when he looked down he saw a plasma blast like the one a few minutes ago on its way up to meet him. Matt tried to move out of the way, but it was too late. The blast hit the rim of the hole and the conclusive force sent Matt flying out of the room. He dropped the box and hit the wall on the other side of the main hall. When Matt regained consciousness he saw Kelly standing over him with her hand out. He grabbed it and Kelly helped him up off the floor. He saw John and Fred ahead of them helping James down to the basement. Kelly grabbed the box and slid it into her pack, then she and Matt made their way down to the basement and into the sewers. They saw John and the other two ahead of them and they made their way over. The four jogged through the muck and didn't stop until they had cleared the drainage system and emerged in the rice paddies on the edge of Cote d'Azur. Fred rigged the ground return relay to the pipes overhead and ran a crude antenna outside. Matt looked back at the city. Banshee flyers circled through the skyscrapers. Spotlights from the hovering Covenant transport ships bathed the streets in blue illumination. The grunts were going crazy, their barks and screams to an impenetrable din. The Spartans moved toward the coast and followed the tree line south. James collapsed twice along the way then finally slipped into unconsciousness. Matt slung him over his shoulder and carried him. They paused and hid when they heard a partook of a dozen grunts. The aliens ran past them, they either didn't see the Spartans, or they didn't care. The animals sprinted as fast as they could back to the city. When they were a click away from the rendezvous point, the chief opened the comm link and said, Green team leader, we're on your perimeter, and coming in. Signaling with blue smoke. Ready and waiting for you, sir, Linda replied. Welcome back. The chief set off one of his smoke grenades and they marched into the clearing. The pelican was intact and the marines stood guard outside while the civilians were safely inside the ship. Blue and red teams were hidden in the nearby brush and trees. Linda approached them. She motioned for her team to take James from Matt's hands and get him onto the pelican. She turned to the chief and said, Sir, all civilians on board and ready for liftoff. The chief then ordered the Spartans to take one last look around the perimeter to make sure nothing followed them. Once the Spartans confirmed the perimeter was secure, they boarded the pelican. The pelican lifted into the air. In the distance, the suns were warming the horizon, and Cote d'Azur was outlined against the dawn. Matt turned to Linda. See, I'm fine. You had nothing to worry about, he told her over a private comm channel. I can see that, she replied. I'm glad you made it back in one piece. The pelican suddenly accelerated at full speed straight up and then angled away to the south. Chief, sir, the pilot said over the comm channel. We're getting multiple incoming contacts, about 200 banshees inbound. We'll take care of it, Lieutenant, the chief replied. Prepare for EMP and shockwave. The chief pulled out the remote radio transceiver and held it out to Matt. Care to do the honors? I thought you were going to do it. Matt asked with a tilt of his head. No, I'd rather you do it. You are the highest ranking Spartan after all. Matt took the transceiver from John. Well, that case, gladly he said as he activated the remote radio transceiver. He quickly keyed in the final failsafe code, then sent the coded burst transmission on its way. A third sun appeared on the horizon. It blotted out the light of the system's stars, then cooled, from amber to red, and darkened the sky with black clouds of dust. Mission accomplished, Matt stated proudly. You know I've always wondered something, John said over a private comm channel as they watched Cote d'Azur become a blip in the distance, if you're the highest ranking Spartan. Why do you not like leading? Matt sighed. He'd been expecting a conversation like this to happen, but he didn't think it would happen at a time like this. I've never thought of myself as a leader. I can understand that. You should try being a team leader sometimes. Perhaps the next mission, let's say. I think you'd be good at it. Sure, I'd like that, Matt said, even though inwardly he was downright terrified about the prospect of leading a team. 
John clapped him on the back. That's the spirit. I'll give you some tips when we get back to base. Location Sigma Octanus System, UNSC Iroquois, July 18, 2552, 2110 hours. Captain Key stood on the bridge of his ship surveying the damage on one of the tactical screens. It was a big loss, but a victory over the Covenant nonetheless. Sir? said Ensign Lovell. Yes, Ensign, he replied. Randomized vector is plotted and slipspace engines are charged, awaiting your go, said Lovell. Okay then, Ensign, take us. Sir, said Lieutenant Dominique. We're receiving a message from the Leviathan. Admiral Stanforth, well. Let's hear it, Lieutenant, ordered Keys. He wants you and the senior staff to transfer to the Leviathan ASAP. Apparently, the Iroquois is to stay here, she replied. Did he say why? Keys asked. No, sir. Very well then, get your gear in order then meet me in the hangar in 30 minutes, Keys said to his staff as he left for his quarters to collect a few things. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 25 Red Flag Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 25 Red Flag Location Epsilon Eridani System Planet Reach Fleetcom Military Complex August 27, 2552 0800 hours This was the third time Matt had been in the highly secure briefing room on Reach. The amphitheater had an aura of secrecy as if matters of grave importance had regularly been discussed within its circular wall. Certainly, every time he had been here, his life had changed. His first time was his indoctrination into the Spartans, a lifetime ago. He recalled with a start how young Dr. Halsey had looked then. The second time was when he graduated from the Spartan program when he had last seen Chief Mendez before reconnecting with him on Onyx. He had sat on the bench next to him and John, where both aforementioned Spartans were now sitting along with Linda. And today, he had a strange feeling that everything was about to change all over again. Clustered around him were two dozen Spartans Fred, Linda, Joshua, James, Kelly, and many others he had not spoken to in years. The constant battle had kept the tight-knit Spartans light years apart for more than a decade. Dr. Halsey and Captain Keyes entered the chamber. The Spartans stood at attention and saluted. Keyes returned their salute. At ease, he said. He escorted Dr. Halsey to the center stage. He sat while she stood at the podium. Good morning, Spartans, she said. Please take your seats. As one, they sat down. Assembled here this morning, she said, are all surviving Spartans save three who are otherwise engaged on fields of combat too distant to be easily recalled. In the last decade of combat, there have only been three Kias and one Spartan too wounded to continue active duty. You are to be commended for having the best operational record of any unit in the fleet. She paused to look at them. It is good to see you all again. She slipped on her glasses. Vice Admiral Stanforth asked me to brief you on the upcoming mission. Due to its complexity and unusual nature, Please disregard your normal protocol and ask any questions you have during my presentation. Now, onto the business at hand the Covenant. Holographic projectors overhead warmed and sleek Covenant corvettes, frigates, and destroyers appeared in a neat row on Dr. Halsey's left. On her right were a collection of Covenant species, roughly Onet heard their normal size. There was a grunt, a jackal, the floating, tentacled creature John had seen on Sigma Octanus IV, as well as the heavily armored behemoths Matt and Blue Team had bested. A spike of adrenaline burned through Matt at the sight of the enemy. Intellectually, he knew that the images were not real, but after a decade of on and off fighting, his instincts were to kill first and to get the details later. The Covenant are still largely unknown to us, Dr. Halsey began. Their motivations and thought processes remain a mystery, though our best analysis points to some compelling hypotheses. She paused, and added, the following information is, naturally, classified. We know that the Covenant, our translation of their name for themselves, are a conglomerate of a number of different alien species. We believe that they exist in some kind of caste structure, though to date the exact nature of that structure remains unknown. Our best guess is that the Covenant conquer and absorb a species, and adapt its strengths into their own. Matt didn't like the sound of that at all. The Covenant's science is imitative rather than innovative, a byproduct of this societal absorption, Dr. Halsey continued. 
This is not to say that they are lacking intelligence, however. During our first encounter, they gathered computer and network components from our destroyed ships, and they learned at an astonishing pace. Too fast if they gathered data from destroyed UNSC ships, Matt thought to himself. By the time Admiral Cole's fleet arrived at harvest, the Covenant initiated a communications link and attempted a primitive software infiltration of our ship AIs. In a matter of weeks, they had learned the rudiments of our computer systems and our language. Our own attempts to decipher Covenant computer systems have only been partially successful, despite our best efforts and decades of time. Damn, decades ahead of our time. Linda said to herself. Since then they have made increasingly successful forays into our computer networks. That is why the Cole Protocol is so important and carries the punishment of treason for failure to comply. The Covenant may one day not need to capture a ship to steal the information within its navigational databanks. Matt stole a glance at Captain Keys. The captain cupped an antique pipe in one hand. The Navy officer puffed on it once and stared thoughtfully at Dr. Halsey and the examples of the Covenant vessels. He slowly shook his head. As I stated earlier, Dr. Halsey continued, the Covenant is a collection of genetically distinct groups in what we believe is a rigid caste system. She waved toward the grunts and jackals. These are most likely part of their military or warrior caste, not the highest ranking caste, either, given how many are sacrificed during ground operations. We believe there is a race of field commanders, which we are currently calling elites. She stepped toward the floating, tentacular aliens. We believe these are their scientists. As she moved closer, the figure animated, the image showed the creature disassembling an electric car of human manufacture. Matt instantly recognized John's battlefield recording. She pointed to the giant armored creatures. This was recorded on Sigma Octonus IV, a heavily armored warrior superior to either grunts or jackals. The massive aliens also sprang into motion, lumbering into combat, until Dr. Halsey froze the images in place. She turned and strolled back to the podium. ONI hypothesizes at least two additional castes, a warrior capable of commanding ground forces and possibly piloting their ships, and a leadership caste. We have deciphered a handful of covenant transmissions that refer to, she paused, checking notes on the data screen in her glasses. Ah, yes, prophets. We believe that these prophets are in fact the leadership caste and that they are viewed by the covenant rank and file with almost religious reverence. Dr. Halsey removed her glasses. This is where you come in. Your mission will involve these so-called prophets and will be executed in four phases. She can't be serious, can she? Linda whispered to Matt. Command must be getting desperate if they're resorting to something like this. I guess she is, Matt whispered back. Phase one. You will engage the Covenant and sufficiently disable, but not destroy, one of their ships. She turned to face Captain Keys. I leave that in the capable hands of Captain Keyes and his newly refitted ship, the Pillar of Autumn. Captain Keyes acknowledged her compliment with a curt nod. He tapped the stem of his pipe on his lips thoughtfully. Matt was unaware of any Covenant ship ever being captured. He had read the reports of Captain Keyes' actions at Sigma Octonus IV, and considered the odds of actually capturing a Covenant vessel. Even for a Spartan, it would be a difficult mission. Phase 2, Dr. Halsey said. Spartans will board the disabled Covenant ship, neutralize the crew, and crack their navigation database. We will do precisely what they have been trying to do to us find the location of their homeworld. Matt saw the chief raise his hand out of the corner of his eye. Yes, Master Chief, ma'am. We will be given mission specialist personnel to access the Covenant computers. In a manner of speaking, she said and looked away. I will come to that point in a moment. Let me assure you, however, that these specialists will cause you no serious complications during this phase. In fact, they will prove rather useful in combat. Shortly, you shall have a demonstration. Like Captain Key's statement that winning isn't everything, Dr. Halsey's reply was another puzzle. How would such computer specialists not be a liability to the Spartans in combat? Even if they could fight, it was unlikely they'd be anything but weak links in combat. If they couldn't fight, the Spartans would be forced to babysit a vulnerable package in a hot combat zone. Phase 3, Dr. Halsey said, will consist of taking the captured Covenant ship to their homeworld. Several questions immediately formed in Matt's mind. Who would pilot the alien ship? Had anyone ever deciphered the Covenant control systems? It seemed unlikely since the UNSC had never captured one of their ships before. Were there Covenant recognition signals that had to be sent when entering their space? Or would they just steal their way in Z-STEM? 
When a plan had so many missing pieces of data, the Spartans had been trained to stop and reconsider its effectiveness. Unanswered questions led to complications, snags, and snags led to injuries, death, and failed missions. Simple was better. He held his questions, though. Dr. Halsey surely would have planned for these eventualities. Phase four, she continued, will be to infiltrate and capture the Covenant leadership and return with them to UNS-controlled space. Matt shifted uneasily. There was no intel or reconnaissance of Covenant-held space. What did a Covenant leader, a prophet, even look like? Chief Mendez had told him to trust Dr. Halsey. Matt decided to hear all the details before he asked any further questions. To do so might undermine her authority. And that's the last thing he needed the other Spartans to see. And yet, there was one thing he had to clarify. Matt raised his hand. She nodded toward him. Yes, Commander. Dr. Halsey, Matt said, you did say, capture the Covenant leaders, not eliminate them. Correct, she replied. Our profile of Covenant society indicates that if you were to kill one of their leader castes, this war could actually escalate. Your orders are to preserve any captured Covenant leaders at all costs. You will bring them back to UNSC headquarters, where we will then use them to broker a truce, possibly even negotiate a peace treaty with the Covenant. Peace. Matt considered the unfamiliar word. The alternative to winning wasn't necessarily losing. If you chose not to play a game, then there could be neither winning nor losing. Dr. Halsey took a deep breath and slowly exhaled. Some of you already suspect this, but I shall state it anyway for emphasis. It is my opinion, and that of many others, that the war is not going well, despite our recent victories. What is not widely known is how badly it is going for us. ONI predicts that we have months, perhaps as much as a standard year, before the Covenant locates and destroys our remaining inner colonies, and then moves against Earth. Matt had heard the rumors, and promptly dismissed them, but to hear the words from someone he trusted chilled him to the core. Your mission will prevent this, Dr. Halsey said. She stopped and frowned, lowered her head, then finally looked up at them again. This op is considered extremely high risk. There are unknown elements involved and we simply do not have the time to gather the required intelligence. I have persuaded Fleetcom not to order you on this mission. Admiral Stanforth is asking for volunteers. Matt understood. Dr. Halsey was unsure if she would be spending their lives or wasting them on this mission. He stood without hesitation, and as he did so, the rest of the Spartans stood as well. Good, she said. She paused and blinked several times. Very good. Thank you. She stepped away from the podium. We will meet with you individually within a few days to continue your briefing. I will show you how you will get our computer experts on board the Covenant vessel. And I will show you the one thing that will let you get through this mission in one piece Mjolnir. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 26 Crystal Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 26 Crystal, Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, UNSC Military Reservation 01478B, August 29, 2552, 0700 hours. The firing range was uncharacteristically quiet. Normally, the air would be filled with noise, the sharp, staccato crackle of automatic weapons fire, the urgent yells of soldiers practicing combat operations, and the bark, curse-laden orders of drill instructors. Matt frowned as he guided the warthog to the security checkpoint. The silence on the combat range was somehow unsettling. Even more unsettling were the extra security personnel. Today, there were three times the normal number of MPs patrolling the gate. Matt parked the warthog and was approached by a trio of MPs. State your business here, sir, the lead MP demanded. Without a word, Matt handed over his papers, orders direct from the top brass. The MP visibly stiffened. Sir, my apologies. Dr. Halsey and the others are waiting for you at the PENR area. The guard saluted and waved the gate open. On survey maps, the combat training range was listed as UNSC Military Reservation 01478B. The soldiers who trained there had a different name for it, Painland. Matt knew the facility well. A great deal of the Spartans' early training had taken place there. The range was divided into three areas a live-fire obstacle course, a target practice range, and the PR, 
prep and recovery area, which more often than not doubled as an emergency first aid station. Matt had spent plenty of time in the aid station during his training. Matt walked briskly to the prefabricated structure. Another pair of MPs, MA-5B assault rifles at the ready, double-checked his credentials before they admitted him to the building. Ah, here at last, said an unfamiliar voice. Let's go, son, on the double, if you please. Matt paused, the speaker was an older man, at least in his sixties, in the coveralls and lab coat of a ship's doctor. No rank insignia, though, Matt thought with a twinge of concern. For a moment, the image of his fellow Spartans, very young, clubbing, kicking, and beating ununiformed instructors into unconsciousness flashed into his memory with crystal clarity. Who are you, sir? He asked, his voice cautious. I'm a captain in the UNSC Navy, son, the men said with a thin-lipped smile, and I've no time for spit and polish today. Let's go. A captain, and new orders. Good. Yes, sir. The captain in the lab coat escorted him into the PR's medical bay. Undress, please, the men said. Matt quickly disrobed, then stacked his neatly folded uniform on a nearby gurney. The captain stepped behind him and began to swab Matt's neck and the back of his head with a foul-smelling liquid. The liquid felt ice cold on his skin. A moment later, Dr. Halsey entered. This will just take a moment, Commander. We're going to upgrade a few components in your standard-issue neural interface. Lie back and remain still, please. Matt did as she said. A technician sprayed a topical anesthetic on his neck. The skin tingled, then went cold and numb. He felt layers of skin incised, and then a series of distinct clicking sounds that echoed through his skull. There was a brief laser pulse and another spray. He saw sparks, felt the room spin, then a sense of vertigo. His vision blurred, he blinked rapidly and it quickly returned to normal. Good, the procedure is complete, Dr. Halsey said. Please follow me. The captain handed the commander a paper gown. He slipped it on and followed the doctor outside. A field command dome had been assembled on the range. Its white fabric walls rippled in the breeze. Ten MPs stood around the structure, assault rifles in hand. Matt noted these weren't regular Marines. They wore the gold comet insignia of Special Forces Orbital Drop Shock Troop, Helljumpers. Tough and iron disciplined. Matt remembered an incident that occurred years ago with John that involved ODSDs. Matt felt his adrenaline spike as soon as he saw the soldiers. Dr. Halsey approached the MP at the entrance and presented her credentials. They accepted them and scanned her retina and voice print, then did the same to him. Once they confirmed his identity, they immediately saluted, which was technically unnecessary, as Matt was out of uniform. He did them the courtesy of returning their salute. The soldiers kept looking around, scanning the field, as if they were expecting something to happen. Matt's discomfort grew, not much spooked an orbital drop shock trooper. Dr. Halsey led him inside. In the center of the dome stood an empty suit of Mjolnir armor, suspended between two pillars on a raised platform. The commander knew it was not his suit. His, after years of use, had dents and scratches in the alloy plates and the once iridescent green finish had dulled to a worn olive brown. This suit was spotless and its surface possessed a subtle metallic sheen. He noted the armor plates were slightly thicker, and the black under layers had a more convoluted weave of components. The fusion pack was half again as large, and tiny luminous slits glowed near the articulation points. This is the real Mjolnir, Dr. Halsey whispered to him. What you have been using was only a fraction of what the armor should be. This, she turned to him, is everything I had always dreamed it could be. Please put the suit on. Matt stripped the paper gown off and, with the help of a pair of technicians, donned the armor components. Dr. Halsey averted her eyes. Although the armor's components were bulkier and heavier than his old suit, once assembled and activated, they felt light as air. The armor was a perfect fit. The Beolier warmed and adhered to his skin, then cooled as the temperature difference between the suit and his skin equalized. We've made hundreds of minor technical improvements, she said. I'll have the specifications sent to you later. Two of those changes, however, are rather serious modifications to the system. It may take some getting used to. Dr. Halsey's brow furrowed. Matt had never seen her worried before. First, she told him, we have replicated, and I might add, improved upon the energy shield the Covenant Jackals have been using against us to great effect. This armor had shields. Matt had known that ONI research had been working on adapting Covenant technology. Spartans had standing orders to capture Covenant machines wherever they could. The researchers and engineers had announced some breakthroughs in artificial gravity, 
Some UNSC ships were already undergoing trials with the GRAF systems. The fact that the Mjolnir armor possessed shields was a stunning breakthrough. For years, there had been no luck back engineering Covenant shield tech. Most in the scientific community had given up hope of ever cracking it. Maybe that's why Dr. Halsey was worried. Maybe they hadn't worked out all the bugs. Dr. Halsey nodded to the technicians. Let's begin. The techs turned to a series of instrument panels. One, a slightly younger man, donned a comm headset. Okay, Commander. The tech's voice crackled through Matt's helmet speakers. There's an activation icon in your heads-up display. There is also a manual control switch located at position 12 in your helmet. He chinned the control. Nothing happened. Wait a moment, please, sir. We have to give the suit an activation charge. After that, it can accept regenerative power from the fusion pack. Stand on the platform and be absolutely still. He stepped onto the platform that had held the Mjolnir armor. The pillars flickered on and glowed a brilliant yellow. The pillars started to spin slowly around the base of the platform. Matt felt a static charge tingling in his extremities. The glow intensified and his helmet's blast shield automatically dimmed. The charge in the air intensified, his skin crawled with ionization. He smelled ozone. Then the spinning slowed and the light dimmed. Reset the activation button now, Commander. The air around the mat popped, as if it jumped away from the Mjolnir armor. There was none of the shimmer that normal Covenant shields had. Was it working? He ran his hand over his arm and encountered resistance a centimeter from the surface of the armor. It was working. How many times had he and his teammates had to find ways to slip past a jackal's shield? He'd have to rethink his tactics. Rethink everything. It provides full coverage, Dr. Halsey's voice piped through the speakers, and dissipates energy far more efficiently than the Covenant shields the Spartans have recovered, though the shield is concentrated on your arms, head, legs, chest, and back. The energy field tapers down to a hair under a millimeter so you don't lose the ability to hold or manipulate items with your hands. The lead technician activated another control, and new data scrawled across Matt's display. There's a segmented bar in the upper corner of your HUD, the technician said, right next to your biomonitor and ammunition indicators. It indicates the charge level of your shield. Don't let it completely dissipate. When it's gone, the armor starts taking the hits. Matt slipped off the platform. He skidded, then came to a halt. His movements felt oiled. His contact with the floor felt tentative. You can adjust the bottom of your boot emitters as well as the emitters inside your gloves to increase traction. In normal use, you will want to set these to the minimal level, just be aware your defenses will be diminished in those locations. Understood. He adjusted the field strengths. In zero-g environment, I should increase those sections to full strength, correct? That is correct, Dr. Halsey said. How much damage can they take before the system is breached? That is what you will learn here today, Commander. I think you'll find that we have several challenges in store for you to see how much punishment the suit can take. He nodded. He was ready for the challenge. After weeks spent traveling in slip space, he was long overdue for a workout. Matt slid back his helmet visor and turned to face Dr. Halsey. You said there were two major system improvements, Doctor. She nodded and smiled. Yes, of course. She reached into her lab coat and withdrew a clear cube. I doubt you've ever seen one of these before. It is the memory processor core of an AI. Like Deja. Yes, like your former teacher. But this AI is slightly different. I'd like to introduce you to Crystal. Matt looked around the tent. He saw no computer interface or holographic projectors. He cocked an eyebrow at Dr. Halsey. There is a new layer sandwiched between the reactive circuits and the inner beolius of your armor, Dr. Halsey explained. It is a weave of additional memory processor superconductor, the same material as an AI's core. Yes, Dr. Halsey replied. An accurate analysis. Your armor will carry crystal. The Mjolnir system has nearly the same capacity as a shipborne AI system. Crystal will interface between you and the suit and provide tactical and strategic information for you in the field. I'm not sure I understand. Crystal has been programmed with every ONI computer insurgency routine, Dr. Halsey told him. And she has a talent for modifying them on the fly. She has our best covenant language translation software as well. Her primary purpose is to infiltrate their computer and communication systems. She will intercept and decode point-to-point -point covenant transmissions and give you updated intelligence in the field. Intel support in an operation where there had been no reconnaissance. Matt liked that. It would level the playing field significantly. 
This AI is the computer specialist we'll be taking onto the Covenant ship, Matt said. Yes, and more. There will be another AI joining you, and John will have the other. Crystal's presence will allow you to utilize the suit more effectively. Matt had a sudden flash, AIs handled a great deal of point defense during naval operations. Can she control the Mjolnir armor? He wasn't sure he liked that. No. Crystal resides in the interface between your mind and the suit, Commander. You will find your reaction time greatly improved. She will be translating the impulses in your motor cortex directly into motion. She can't make you send those impulses. This AI, he said, will be inside my mind. That must have been what that upgrade to his standard issue UNSC computer interface had been for. That is the question, isn't it? Halsey replied. I can't answer that, Commander. Not scientifically. I'm not sure I understand, Doctor. What is the mind, really? Intuition, reason, emotion, we acknowledge they exist, but we still don't know what makes the human mind work. She paused, searching for the right words. We model AIs on human neural networks, on electrical signals in the brain, because we just know that the human brain works, but not how or why. Crystal resides between your mind and the suit, interpreting the electrochemical messages in your brain and transferring them to the suit via your neural implant. Interesting, Matt thought silently. So, for lack of a better term, yes, Crystal will be inside your mind. Ma'am, my priority will be to complete this mission. This AI, Crystal, may have conflicting directives. There is no need to worry, Commander. Crystal has the same mission parameters as you do. She will do anything necessary to make sure that your mission is accomplished. Even if that means sacrificing herself, or you, to accomplish it. Matt exhaled, relieved. Now, please kneel down. It's time to insert her memory processor matrix into the socket at the base of your neck. Matt knelt. There was a hissing noise, a pop, and then cold liquid poured into his mind. A spike of pain jammed into his forehead, then faded. Not a lot of room in here, a smooth female voice said. Hello, Commander. Did this AI have a rank? Certainly, she was not a civilian or a fellow soldier. Should he treat her like any other piece of UNS issued equipment? Then again, he treated his equipment with the respect it deserved. He made sure every gun and knife was cleaned and inspected after every mission. It was unsettling, he could hear Crystal's voice through his helmet speakers, but it also felt like she was speaking inside his head. Hello, Crystal. Hmm. I'm detecting a high degree of cerebral cortex activity. You're not the muscle-bound automatons the press makes you out to be. Automaton. Matt whispered. Interesting choice of words for artificial intelligence. Dr. Halsey watched Matt with great interest. You must forgive Crystal, Commander. She is somewhat high-spirited. You may have to allow for behavioral quirks. Yes, ma'am. I think we should begin the test straight away. There's no better way for the two of you to get acquainted than in simulated combat. No one said anything about combat, Crystal said. The ONI brass has arranged a test for you in the new Mjolnir system, Dr. Halsey said. There are some that believe you two are not up to our proposed mission. Ma'am Matt snapped to attention. I'm up for it, ma'am. I know you are, Commander. Others require proof. She looked around at the shadows cast by the Marines outside the fabric walls of the command dome. You hardly need a reminder to be prepared for anything, but stay on your guard, just the same. Dr. Halsey's voice dropped to a whisper. I think some of the ONI brass would prefer to see you fail this test, Commander and they may have arranged to make sure you do, regardless of your performance. I won't fail, Doctor. Be careful, Commander, Dr. Halsey said quietly. She gestured at the pair of technicians to follow her, then turned and walked out of the tent. Matt didn't understand why Dr. Halsey thought he was in real danger, he didn't have to understand the reason. All he needed to know was that danger was present. He knew how to handle danger. Uploading combat protocols now, Crystal said. Initiating electronic detection algorithms. Boosting neural interface performance to 85%. I'm ready when you are, Commander. Matt heard metallic clacks around the tent. Analyzing sound pattern, Crystal said. Database match. Identified as, as someone cycling the bolt of an MA-5B assault rifle. I know. Standard issue weapons for orbital drop shock troopers. Since you're in the know, Commander, Crystal quipped. I assume you have a plan. Matt snapped his helmet visor back down and sealed the armor's environment system. Yes. Presumably your plan doesn't involve getting shot. No. 
So, what's the plan? Crystal sounded worried. I'm going to finish counting to ten. Matt heard Crystal sigh in frustration. Matt shook his head in puzzlement. He'd never encountered a so-called smart AI before. Crystal sounded like a human. Worse, she sounded like a civilian. This was going to take a lot of getting used to. Shadows moved along the wall of the tent, motion from outside. 8. There was a snag in this mission and he hadn't even reached the obstacle course. He would have to engage his fellow soldiers. He pushed aside any questions about why. He had his orders and he would follow them. He had never dealt with ODSDs before. 9. Three soldiers entered the tent, moving in slow motion, black armored figures, helmets snug over their faces, crouched low, and their rifles leveled. Two took flanking positions. The one in the middle opened fire. 10. Author's note Did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 27 Test Run Author's note If you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 27 Test Run Location Epsilon Eridani System Planet Reach UNSC Military Reservation 01478B August 29, 2552 0745 hours. Matt blurred into motion. He dove from the activation platform and, before the soldiers could adjust their aim, landed in their midst. He rolled to his feet right next to the soldier who fired first and grabbed the man's rifle. Matt brutally yanked the weapon away from the soldier. There was a loud cracking sound as the man's shoulder dislocated. The wounded trooper stumbled forward, off balance. Matt spun the rifle and slammed the butt of the weapon into the soldier's side. The men exhaled explosively as his ribs cracked. He grunted and fell unceremoniously to the floor, unconscious. Matt spun to face the left flank gunner, assault rifle leveled at the man's head instantly. He had the men in his sights, but he still had time, the soldier was not quite in position. To Matt's enhanced senses, amped up by crystal and the neural interface, the rifleman seemed to be moving in slow motion. Too slow. Matt lashed out with the rifle but again. The trooper's head snapped back from the sudden, powerful blow. He flipped head over tail and slammed into the ground. Matt sized the man's condition up with a practiced eye shock, concussion, fractured vertebrae. Gunner number two was out of the fight. The remaining gunner completed his turn and opened fire. A three-round burst ricocheted off the Mjolnir armor's energy shield. The shield's recharge bar flickered a hairbreadth. Before the soldier could react, Matt sidestepped and slammed his own rifle down, hard. The trooper screamed as his leg gave out. A jagged spoke of bone burst through the wounded man's fatigues. Matt finished him with a rifle but to his helmeted head. Matt checked the condition of the rifle, and, satisfied that it was in working order, began to pull ammo clips from the fallen soldier's belt pouches. The lead soldier also carried a razor-edged combat knife, Matt grabbed it. You could have killed them, Crystal said. Why didn't you? My orders gave me permission to neutralize threats, he replied. They aren't threats anymore. Semantics, Crystal replied. She sounded amused. I can't argue with the results, though, she broke off, suddenly. New targets. Seven contacts on the motion tracker, Crystal reported. We're surrounded. Seven more soldiers. Matt could open fire now and kill them all. Under any other circumstances, he would have removed such threats. But their MA5BS were no immediate danger to him and the UNSC could use every soldier to fight the Covenant. He strode to the center pole of the tent, and with a yank, he pulled it free. As the roof fluttered down, he slashed a slit in the tent fabric and shoved through. He faced three Marines, they fired, the commander deftly jumped to one side. He sprang toward them and lashed out with the steel pole, swiped out their legs. He heard bones crack, followed by screams of pain. Matt turned as the tent finished collapsing. The remaining four men could see him now. One reached for a grenade on his belt. The other three tracked him with their assault rifles. Matt threw the pole like a javelin at the men with the grenade. It impacted in his sternum and he fell with a hoof. The grenade, minus the pin, however, dropped to the ground. Matt moved and kicked the grenade. It arced over the parking lot and detonated in a cloud of smoke and shrapnel. The three remaining Marines opened fire, spraying bullets in a full auto fusillade. Bullets pinged off Matt's shield. The shield status indicator blinked and dropped with each bullet impact, 
The sustained weapon's fire was draining the shield precipitously. Matt tucked and rolled, narrowly avoiding an incoming burst of automatic weapons fire, then sprang at the nearest Marine. Matt launched an open-handed strike at the man's chest. The Marine's ribs caved in and he dropped without a sound, blood flowing from his mouth. Matt spun, brought his rifle up, and fired twice. The second soldier screamed and dropped his rifle as the bullets tore through each knee. Matt kicked the discarded rifle, bending the barrel and rendering the weapon useless. The last man stood frozen in place. Matt didn't give the men time to recover. He grabbed his rifle, ripped off his bandolier of grenades, then punched his helmet. The Marine dropped. Mission time plus 20 seconds, Crystal remarked. Although, technically, you started to move 40 milliseconds before you were ordered to. I'll keep that in mind. Matt slung the assault rifle and bandolier of grenades over his shoulder and ran for the shadows of the barracks. He slipped under the raised buildings and belly crawled toward the obstacle course. No need to make himself a target for snipers, although it would be an interesting test to see what caliber of bullet these shields could deflect. No. That kind of thinking was dangerous. The shield was useful, but under combined fire, it dropped very quickly. He was tough, not invincible. He emerged at the beginning to the obstacle course. The first part was a run over 10 acres of jagged gravel. Sometimes raw recruits had to take off their boots before they crossed. Other than the pain, it was the easiest part of the course. Matt started toward the gravel yard. Wait, Crystal said. I'm picking up far infrared signals on your thermal sensors. An encrypted sequence, decoding, yes, there. It's an activation signal for a lotus mine. They've mined the field, Commander. Matt froze. He'd used lotus mines before and knew the damage they could inflict. The shape charges ripped through the armor plate of a tank like it was no thicker than an orange peel. This would slow him down considerably. Not crossing the obstacle course was no option. He had his orders. He wouldn't cheat and go around. He had to prove that he and Crystal were up for this test. Any ideas? He asked. I thought you'd never ask, Crystal replied. Find the position of one mine, and I can estimate the rough position of the others based on the standard randomization procedure used by UNSC engineers. Understood. Matt grabbed a grenade, pulled the pin, counted to three, and lobbed it into the middle of the field. It bounced and exploded, sending a shock wave through the ground, tripping two of the lotus mines. Twin plumes of gravel and dust shot into the air. The detonation shook his teeth. He wondered if the armor shields could have survived that. He didn't want to find out while he was still inside the thing. He boosted the field strength on the bottom of his boots to full. Crystal overlaid a grid on his heads-up display. Lines flickered as she ran through the possible permutations. Got a match, she said. Two dozen red circles appeared on his display. That's 93% accurate. The best I can do. There are never any guarantees, Matt replied. He stepped onto the gravel, taking short, deliberate steps. With the shields activated on the bottoms of his boots, it felt like he was skating on greased ice. He kept his head down, picking his way between red dots on his display. If Crystal was wrong, he probably wouldn't even know it. Matt saw the gravel had ended. He looked up. He had made it. Thank you, Crystal. Well done. You're welcome. Her voice trailed off, picking up scrambled radio frequencies on the D-band. Encrypted orders from this facility to Fairchild Airfield. They're using personal code words, too, so I can't tell what they're up to. Whatever it is, I don't like it. Keep your ears open. I always do. He ran to the next section of the obstacle course, the razor field. Here, recruits had to crawl in the mud under razor wire as their instructors fired live rounds over them. A lot of soldiers discovered whether they had the guts to deal with bullets singing a centimeter over their heads. Along either side of the course, there was something new 330mm chain guns mounted on tripods. Weapons emplacements are targeting us, Commander Crystal announced. Matt wasn't about to wait and see if those chain guns had a minimum depth setting. He had no intention of crawling across the field and letting the chain gun's rapid rate of fire chip away at his shields. The chain guns clicked and started to turn. He sprinted to the nearest tripod-mounted gun. He opened fire with his assault fire, shot the lines that powered the servos, then spun the chain gun around to face the others. He crouched behind the blast shield and unloaded on the adjacent gun. Chain guns were notoriously hard to aim, they were best known for their ability to fill the air with gunfire. Crystal adjusted his targeting reticle to sync up with the chain gun. With her help, he hit the adjacent weapon emplacements. 
Matt guided a stream of fire into the gun's ammo packs. Moments later, in a cloud of fire and smoke, the guns fell silent, then toppled. Matt ducked, primed a grenade, and hurled it at the closest of the remaining automated weapons. The grenade sailed through the air, then detonated just above the autogun. Chain gun destroyed, Crystal reported. Two more grenades and the automated guns were out of commission. He noted that his shields had dropped by a quarter. He watched the status bar refill. He hadn't even known he had taken hits. That was sloppy. You seem to have the situation under control, Crystal said. I'm going to spend a few cycles and check something out. Permission granted, he said. I didn't ask, Commander, she replied. The cool liquid presence in his mind withdrew. Matt felt empty somehow. He ran through the razor fields, snapping through steel wire as if it were a rotten string. Crystal's coolness once again flooded his thoughts. I just accessed SATCOM, she said. I'm using one of their satellites so I can get a better look at what's happening down here. There's a Skyhawk jump jet from Fairchild Field inbound. He stopped. The automatic cannons were one thing, could the armor withstand against air power like that? The Skyhawk had a quartet of 50mm cannons that made the chain guns look like pea shooters. They also had Scorpion missiles, designed to take out tanks. Answer he couldn't do a thing against it. Matt ran. He had to find cover. He sprinted to the next section of the course the Pillars of Loki. It was a forest of 10-meter tall poles spaced at random intervals. Typically, the poles had booby traps strung on, under, and between them, stun grades, sharpened sticks, anything the instructors could dream up. The idea was to teach recruits to move slowly and keep their eyes open. Matt had no time to search for the traps. He climbed up the first pole and balanced on top. He leaped to the next pole, teetered, regained his balance, then jumped to the next. His reflexes had to be perfect, he was landing a half ton of men and armor on a wooden pole 10 centimeters in diameter. Motion tracking is picking up an incoming target at extreme range, Crystal warned. Velocity profile matches the Skyhawk, Commander. He turned, almost lost his balance and had to shift back and forth to keep from falling. There was a dot on the horizon and the faint rumble of thunder. In the blink of an eye, the dot had wings and Matt's thermal sensors picked up a plume of jet wash. In seconds, the Skyhawk closed, then opened fire with its 50 mm cannons. He jumped. The wooden pole splintered into pulp. They were mowed down like so many blades of grass. Matt rolled, ducked, and flattened himself on the earth. He caught a smattering of rounds and his shield bar dropped to half. Those rounds would have penetrated his old suit instantly. Crystal said, I calculate we have 11 seconds before the Skyhawk can execute a maximum G turn and make another pass. Matt got up and ran through the shattered remains of the poles. Napalm and sonic grenades popped around him, but he moved so fast he left the worst of the damage in his wake. They won't use their cannons next time, he said. They didn't take us out, they'll try the missiles. Perhaps, Crystal suggested, we should leave the course. Find better cover. No, he said. We're going to win, by their rules. The last leg of the course was a sprint across an open field. In the distance, Matt saw the bell on a tripod. He glanced over his shoulder. The Skyhawk was back and starting its run straight toward him. Even with his augmented speed, even with the Mjolnir armor, he'd never make it to the bell in time. He'd never make it alive. He turned to face the incoming jet. I'll need your help, Crystal, he said. Anything, she whispered. Matt heard the nervousness in the AI's voice. Calculate the inbound velocity of a Scorpion missile. Factor in my reaction time and the jet's inbound speed and distance at launch, and tell me the instant I need to move to sidestep and deflect it with my left arm. Crystal paused a heartbeat. Calculation is done. You did say, deflect. Scorpion missiles have Modion tracking sensors and proximity detonators. I can't outrun it. And it won't miss. That leaves us very few options. The Skyhawk dove. Get ready, Crystal said. I hope you know what you're doing. Me, too. Smoke appeared from the jet's left wingtip and fire and exhaust erupted as a missile streaked toward him. Matt saw the missiles track back and forth, zeroing in on his coordinates. A shrill tone in his helmet warbled, the missile had a guidance lock on him. He chinned a control and the sound died out. The missile was fast. Faster than he was ten times over. Now Crystal said. They moved together. He shifted his muscles and the Mjolnir, augmented by his link to Crystal, moved faster than he'd ever moved before. His leg tensed and pushed him aside, his left arm came up and crossed his chest. The head of the missile was the only thing he saw. 
The air grew still and thickened. He continued to move his hand, palm open in a slapping motion, as fast as he could will his flesh to accelerate. The tip of the scorpion missile passed a centimeter from his head. He reached out, fingertips brushed the metal casing, and slapped it aside. The Skyhawk jet screamed over his head. The scorpion missile detonated. Pressure slammed through his body. Matt flew six meters, spinning end over end, and landed flat on his back. He blinked and saw nothing but blackness. Was he dead? Had he lost? The shield status bar in his head sub display pulsed weakly. It was completely drained, then it blinked red and slowly started to refill. Blood was splattered across the inside of his helmet and he tasted copper. He stood, his muscles screaming in protest. Run Crystal said, before they come back for a look. Matt got up and ran. As he passed the spot where he had stood to face down the missile, he saw a tumor deep crater. He could feel his Achilles tendon tear, but he didn't slow. He crossed the half-kilometer stretch in 17 seconds flat and skidded to halt. Matt grabbed the bell's cord and rang it three times. The pure tone was the most glorious sound he had ever heard. Over the comm channel, Dr. Halsey's voice broke test concluded. Call off your men, Colonel Ackerson we've won again. Well done, Commander. Magnificent stay there, I'm sending out a recovery team. Yes, ma'am, he replied, panting. Doctor what did you mean by, we've won again? John was here an hour before you testing out the same armor and similar AI, she replied, this time through his helmet speakers. Now stay put commander. And that's an order. Yes, ma'am. Matt scanned the sky for the Skyhawk, nothing. It had gone. He knelt and let the blood drip from his nose and mouth. He looked down at the bell, and laughed. He knew that stainless steel dented shape. It was the same one he had rung that first day of boot camp. The day Chief Mendez had taught him about teamwork. Thank you, Crystal, he finally said. I couldn't have done it without you. You're welcome, Commander, she replied. Then, her voice full of mischief, she added a no, you couldn't have done it without me. Today he had learned about a new kind of teamwork with Crystal. Dr. Halsey had given him a great gift. She had given him a weapon with which to destroy the Covenant. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 28 Change of Plans Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 28 Change of Plans Location Epsilon Eridani Systems Edge, UNSC Pillar of Autumn August 30, 2552, 0519 hours Something was wrong. Matt felt it in his stomach first a slight lateral acceleration that became a spin strong enough that he had to brace his legs. The Pillar of Autumn was turning. Every other Spartan in the storage bay felt it as well. They paused as they unloaded equipment from crates and readied the cryo tubes for their journey. The lateral motion slowed and stopped. The Pillar of Autumn's engines rumbled like thunder through the hull of the ship. Kelly approached him. Sir? I thought we were accelerating to enter slip space. So did I. Have Fred and Joshua continue to prep the tubes. Have Linda get a team and secure our gear. I'll find out what's going on. I, sir. It felt strange to have anyone besides Chief Mendez and the Spartan Threes calling sir. Over time, he got used to the chief calling him sir, but not the Spartan threes. With normal military personnel, it felt surprisingly normal. Matt mentally took a deep breath as he turned to walk to the intercom panel. Today was his first time as a team leader. After the briefing a few days ago, John pulled him aside and had given him complete command of this mission, just like he said he would. Matt marched toward the intercom panel. He hated being on spaceships. The lack of control was disturbing. He and the other Spartans were just extra cargo in a space battle. He hesitated as he reached for the intercom. If Captain Keyes was involved in some tricky maneuver or engaging an enemy, the last thing he needed was an interruption. He pressed the button. Cortana, we've changed course. Is there a problem? It felt odd not to ask Crystal what the problem was. Ever since yesterday when he had been acquainted with Crystal, he felt her presence to be strangely calming and he needed that right now. However, Cortana was the shipboard AI and Crystal was just the backup AI. And unfortunately for Matt, the captain had Crystal's chip. Instead of her voice, however, Captain Keys spoke over the channel Captain Keys to Spartan 038. He replied, Here, 
Sir, there's been a change in plans, Keyes said. There was a long pause. This will be easier to explain Facita face. I'm on my way down to brief you. Keys out. Matt turned and the other Spartans snapped to their tasks. Those without specific orders checked and rechecked their weapons and assembled their combat gear. They had all heard the captain, however. The sound receivers in their armor could pick up a whisper at a hundred meters. And the Spartans didn't have to be told this was trouble. Matt clicked on the monitor near the intercom. The four cameras showed the pillar of autumn had indeed turned about. Reach's sun blazed in the center of the screen. They were heading back. Was something wrong with the ship? No. Captain Keyes wouldn't be coming to brief him if that was the case. There was definitely a snag. The elevator doors opened and Captain Keyes stepped off the lift. Captain on deck Matt shouted. The Spartans stood at attention. At ease, Captain Keyes said. The expression on the captain's face suggested that ease was the last thing on his mind. He smoothed his thumb over the antique pipe Matt had seen him carry. There is something very wrong, Keyes said. He glanced at the other Spartans. Let's talk in private, he told Matt in a low voice. He walked to the monitor over the intercom. Sir, Matt said. Unless you wish to leave the deck, the Spartans will hear everything we say. Keyes looked at the Spartans and frowned. I see. Very well, your squad might as well hear this now, too. I don't know how they found Reach, they bypassed a dozen inner colony worlds to get here. It doesn't matter. They are here, and we have to do something. Sir? They. The Covenant. He turned to the intercom. Cortana, display the last priority alpha transmission. A communique flickered on the screen, and Matt read, United Nations Space Command Alpha Priority Transmission 04592Z83. Encryption code read, Public Key File Slash Bravatango Betafif Slash. From Admiral Roland Fremont, Commanding Fleet Officer, Fleetcom Sector 1 Commander Slash, UNSC Service Number 00745167788HS. To all UNSC warships in Epsilon Eridani System. Subject Immediate Recall. Classification Classified. BGX Directive. Slash Start File Slash. Covenant presence detected on reach systems edge coordinates 030 relative. All UNSC warships are hereby ordered to cease all activities and regroup at Rally Point Zulu at best speed. All ships are to enact the coal protocol immediately. Slash end file slash. Cortana has picked up ship signatures on the Pillar of Autumn sensors, Captain Keyes said. She cannot be sure how many because of electrical interference, but there are more than a hundred alien ships inbound toward reach. We have to go. We have our orders. The Section 3 mission has to be scrubbed. Sir? Scrubbed. Matt had never had a mission canceled. Reach is our strategic headquarters and our biggest shipbuilding facility, Commander. If the shipyards fall, then Dr. Halsey's prediction of humanity having only months to survive will shrink to weeks. Matt normally would never have contradicted a superior officer, but this time duty compelled him. Sir, our two missions are not mutually exclusive. Captain Keyes lit his pipe in defiance of three separate regulations of igniting a combustible on a UNSC ship. He puffed once and thoughtfully examined the smoke. What do you have in mind, Commander? A hundred alien vessels, sir. Between the combined force of the fleet and Reach's orbital gun platforms, it is almost guaranteed there will be a disabled ship my squad can board and capture. Captain Keyes mulled this over. There will also be hundreds of ships exchanging fire with one another. Missiles, nukes. Covenant plasma torpedoes. Just get us close enough, Matt said. Punch a hole in their shields long enough for us to get on their hull. We'll do the rest. Captain Keyes chewed on his pipe. He tucked it into the cup of his hand. There are operational complications with your plan. Cortana has been running the Pillar of Autumn's shakedown. We have our own AI, but by the time we get it initialized and running this ship, the battle may be over. I see, sir. Captain Keyes gazed a moment at the commander, then sighed. If there is a disabled Covenant ship and if we are close enough to it and if we're not blown to a million bits by the time we get there, then I'll transfer Cortana to you. I've flown ships without an AI before. Captain Keyes managed a weak smile, but it quickly disappeared. Yes, sir. We'll be at Rally Point Zulu in 20 minutes, commander. Have your team ready by then, for anything. Sir. He saluted. Captain Keyes returned the salute and entered the elevator, puffing on his pipe and shaking his head. Matt turned to his teammates. They halted what they were doing. You all heard. This is it. Fred and James, I want you to refit one of our pelicans. 
Get every scrap of C12 and shape a charge on her nose. John, go with them. I want it done on the double. If Captain Keys downs a covenant shield, we may have to blast our way into the ship's hull. The trio replied, I, sir. Linda, assemble a team and get into every crate ONI packed for us, distribute that gear ASAP. Make sure everyone gets a thruster pack, plenty of ammo, grenades, and jackhammer launchers if we have them. If we do get on board, we may encounter those armored covenant types again, this time I want the firepower to take them out. Yes, sir. The Spartans scrambled to make ready for the mission. Good work so far, Commander, John told him over a private comm channel as he rushed to assist Fred and James. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Chief. Now get moving. You have your orders. Yes, sir. Matt approached Kelly. On a private comm channel, he told her, Crate 13 on the manifest has three Havoc nuclear mines. Get them. I'll give John the arming cards once he's done assisting Fred and James. Ready them for transport. Affirmative. She paused. Matt couldn't see her face past the reflective shield of her helmet, but he knew her well enough to know that the tiny slump of her shoulders meant that she was worried. Sir? She said. I know this mission will be tough, but do you ever get the feeling that this is like one of Chief Mendez's missions? Like there's a trick, some twist that we've overlooked. Yes, he replied. And I'm waiting for it. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 29 Splitting Up Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 29 Splitting Up Location Epsilon Eridani System, UNSC Pillar of Autumn August 30, 2552, 0558 hours, the mission had just encountered another snag. It never entered Matt's mind that he would fail to achieve his objectives. He had to succeed. Failure meant death for not only himself but for all the Spartans, every human. He stood at the view screen in the cargo bay and reread the priority Alpha transmission Captain Keys had sent down. Alpha Priority Channel to Fleet Admiralty from Reach Space Dock Quartermaster AI-8575, aka Doppler, slash, slash triple encryption timestamped public key red rover red rover slash, slash start file slash, immediate action required, item covenant data invasion packets detected penetrating firewall of reach DOC net, counter intrusion software enacted, resolution 99.9% .9 certainty of neutralization, Item initialization of triple screening protocol discovered the Corvette circumference slash bay gamma 9 slash isolated from reach DOC net. Item covenant ships detected on inbound slipstream vector intersecting bay gamma 9. Conclusion unsecured navigation data on the circumference detected by covenant forces. Conclusion violation of the coal protocol. Immediate action required. Slash end file slash. He replayed the distress call from reach's ground side fleet com HQ. They've breached the perimeter. Fall back, fall back if anyone can hear this. The Covenant is ground side. Massing near the armory, there. Matt copied these files and sent them over his squad's comm channel. They had a right to know everything, too. There was only one reason the Covenant would launch a ground invasion to take out the planetary defense generators. If they succeeded, Reach would fall. And there was only one reason why the Covenant wanted the ship's circumference to plunder its NAV database, and find every human world, including Earth. Captain Keys appeared on the view screen. He held his pipe in one hand, squeezing it so tight his knuckles were white. Commander, I believe the Covenant will use a pinpoint slip space jump to a position just off the space dock. They may try to get their troops on the station before the Super Mac guns can take out their ships. This will be a difficult mission, Commander. I'm open to suggestions. We can take care of it, Matt replied. Captain Key's eyes widened and he leaned forward in his command chair. How exactly, Commander? With all due respect, sir, Spartans are trained to handle difficult missions. I'll split my squad. For we'll board the space dock and make sure that NAV data does not fall into the Covenant's hands. The remainder of the Spartans will go ground side and repel the invasion forces. Captain Keys considered this. No, Commander, it's too risky. We've got to make sure the Covenant doesn't get that NAV data. We'll use a nuclear mine, set it close to the docking ring, and detonate it. 
Sir, the EMP will burn out the superconductive coils of the orbital guns. And if you use the Pillar of Autumn's conventional weapons, the NAV database may still survive. If the Covenant search the wreckage, they may obtain the data. True, Key said and tapped his pipe thoughtfully on his chin. Very well, Commander. We'll go with your suggestion. I'll plot a course over the docking station. Ready your Spartans and prep two dropships. We'll launch you, he consulted with Cortana, in five minutes. I, Captain, will be ready. Good luck, Captain Key said and snapped off the view screen. Luck. Matt had never really considered himself lucky. However, he'd need luck more than ever this time. He turned to face the Spartans, his Spartans. They stood at attention. Kelly stepped forward. Commander Sir, permission to lead the space op, Sir. Denied, he said. I'll be leading that one. He appreciated her gesture. The space operation would be ten times more dangerous than the ground op. The Covenant would outnumber them ten to one, or more, but the Spartans were used to taking the fight against numerically superior enemies. They had always won on the ground. The extraction of the circumference database, however, would be in vacuum and zero gravity, and they might have to fight their way past a Covenant warship to reach the objective. Not exactly ideal conditions. Linda, James, and John he said. You're with me. Fred, your red team leader. You'll have tactical command of the ground operation. Sir Fred shouted. Yes, sir. Now make ready, he said. We don't have much time left. Matt regretted his unfortunate choice of words. The Spartans stood a moment. John called out, attention they snapped to and gave Matt a crisp salute. He stood straighter and returned their salute. Even though this was his first mission as team leader, he was intensely proud of them all. The Spartans scattered and gathered their gear, racing for the dropship bay. Matt watched them go. This was the mission the Spartans had been tempered for in mission after mission. It would be their finest moment, but he knew that it might also be their last moment. Chief Mendez had said that a leader would be required to spend the lives of those under his command. Matt knew he would lose comrades today, but would their death serve a necessary purpose, or would they be wasted? Either way, they were ready. Good call on picking Fred to lead the ground mission. John told him over a private comm channel. He'll do a good job. You made the right choice. Did he make the choice though? Matt wasn't sure. Matt believed Fred could do a good job, he wouldn't have picked him otherwise. Matt just didn't have it in him to tell himself that. Thanks, Chief, he said. You're doing fine so far. Don't overthink it. Matt tapped the thrusters and rotated the Pelican dropship 180 degrees. He pushed the engines to full power to break their forward momentum. The Pillar of Autumn had dropped them while she had been cruising at Onet Herd full speed. They'd need every millimeter of the 10,000 kilometers between them and the docking station to slow down. Matt had taken the Spartans' modified Pelican, rigged with explosives. The station would be locked down, every airlock sealed. They'd have to blast their way in. He glanced aft. Linda checked one of the three sniper rifle variants she had brought. James and John inspected their thruster packs. He had picked Linda because no other single Spartan, besides himself, was as efficient at long-range combat. And that's what Matt wanted long-range combat. If it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat in Zero-G with hordes of Covenant troopers, even if he never considered himself lucky, his luck wouldn't hold out too long. He had picked James because James had never quit. Even when his hand had been burned off, he had shrugged off the shock, at least for a while and help them dispatch the Covenant behemoths on Sigma Octanus IV. Matt would need that kind of determination on this mission. He had picked John because, well, he was the Master Chief. He was always lucky. Matt would need that kind of luck on this mission. Matt took a long look out the front of the Pelican. Their sister dropship initiated a burn and hurtled toward Reach. Kelly, Fred, Joshua, all of them. Part of him longed to join them in the ground action. The radar panel blinked a proximity warning, the Pelican was 1,000 kilometers from the docking ring. Matt tapped the thrusters to align the dropship. He squelched the proximity alert. The alert immediately resounded. Strange. He reached for the squelch again, then stopped as he saw the space around the Pelican change. Motes of green light appeared, pinpoints at first, which swelled like bruises on velvet black space. The green smears lengthened, compressed, and distorted the stars. A slipstream entry point. Matt cut the Pelican's engines, slowing them for impact. A Covenant frigate materialized a kilometer from the dropship's nose. Its prow filled their view screen. Author's note Did you love that chapter? 
I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 30 Station Gamma. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 30 Station Gamma. Location Epsilon Eridani System, UNSC Pelican Dropship, Near Reach Station Gamma. August 30, 2552, 0616 hours. Brace for maneuvering Matt Bart. The Spartans dove for safety harnesses and strapped in. All secure Linda shouted. Matt killed the Pelican's forward thrusters and triggered a short, sudden reverse burn. The Spartans were brutally slammed forward into their harnesses as the Pelican's acceleration bled away. Matt quickly shut down the engines. The tiny Pelican faced the Covenant frigate. At a kilometer's distance, the alien ship's launch bay and pulse laser turrets looked close enough to touch on the view screen, enough firepower to vaporize the Spartans in the blink of an eye. Matt's first instinct was to fire their e anvil I missiles and autocannons, but he checked his hand as he reached for the triggers. That would only attract their attention, which was the last thing he wanted. For the moment, the alien vessel ignored them, probably because Matt had shut down the Pelican's engines. But the ship also seemed dead in space no lights, no single ships launched, and no plasma weapons charging. The dropship continued toward the docking station, their momentum putting distance between them and the frigate. Space around the Covenant ship boiled and pulled apart, and two more alien ships appeared. They, too, ignored the dropship. Was it too small to bother with? Matt didn't care. His luck, it seemed, was holding. He checked the radar, 30 kilometers to the docking ring. He ignited the engines to slow them down. He had to or they would crash into the station. 20 kilometers. Rumbling shook the dropship. They slowed, but it wasn't going to be enough. 10 kilometers. Hang on, he told the trio. The sudden impact whiplashed Matt back and forth in his seat. The straps holding him snapped. He blinked, saw only blackness. His vision cleared and he noted that his shield bar was dead. It slowly began to fill again. Every display and monitor in the cockpit had shattered. Matt shook off the disorientation and pulled himself aft. The interior of the dropship was a mess. Everything tied down had come loose. Ammunition boxes had broken open in the crash landing and loose carriages filled the air. Coolant leaked, spraying blobs of black fluid. In zero gravity, everything looked like the inside of a shaken snow globe. James, Linda, and John floated off the deck of the Pelican. They slowly moved. Any injuries? Matt asked. No, Linda replied. No, John answered. I think so, James said. I mean, no. I'm good, sir. Was that a landing or did those Covenant ships take a shot at us? If they had, we wouldn't be here to talk about it. Get whatever gear you can and get out double time, Matt said. He turned to Linda and asked, how many of your sniper rifles are usable? One, she said. Sorry, sir. Don't worry about it. Just get ready to move. Matt grabbed an assault rifle and a jackhammer launcher. He found a satchel. Inside was a kilogram of C-12, detonators, and a Lotus anti-tank mine. Those would come in handy. He salvaged five intact clips of ammunition but couldn't locate his thruster pack. He'd have to do without one. Thankfully, John still had his thruster pack. He saw John grab the same setup, minus the lotus mine. No more time, Matt said. We're sitting ducks here. Out the side hatch now. Linda went first. She paused, and, once she was satisfied the Covenant weren't lying in ambush, motioned them forward. John, Matt, and James exited clung to the side of the Pelican in zero gravity and took flanking positions at the fore and aft ends of the dropship. Space Dock Gamma was a three-kilometer diameter ring. Dull gray metal arced in either direction. On the surface were communications dishes and a few conduits, no real cover. The docking bay doors were sealed tight. The station wasn't spinning. The dockmaster AI must have shut the place up tight when it detected the unsecured NAV database. Matt frowned when he spotted the tail end of their pelican, crumpled and embedded into the station's hull. Its engines were ruined. The dropship jetted out at an angle its prow and the charges of C-12 that were supposed to have blasted them into a Covenant ship, now pointed into the air. Matt started to drift off the station. He clipped himself to the hull of the dropship. Blue 3, he said, police those explosives. He gestured to the prow. The motion sent him gyrating. Yes, sir. 
James puffed his thruster pack once and drifted up to the nose of the pelican. The Spartans had trained to fight in zero gravity. It wasn't easy. The slightest motion sent you spinning out of control. A flash overhead reflected off the hull. Matt looked up. The Covenant ships were alive now. Lances of blue laser fire flashed and motes of red light collected on their lateral lines. Their engines glowed and they moved close to the station. A streak crossed Matt's field of vision in the blink of an eye. The center Covenant frigate shield strobed silver. The ship shattered into a cloud of glistening fragments. The orbital guns had turned and fired on the new threat. This was a suicide maneuver. How did the Covenant think they could withstand that kind of firepower? Blue 2, Matt said. Scan those ships with your scope. Linda floated closer to Matt. She pointed her sniper rifle up and sighted the ships. We've got inbound targets, she said and fired. Matt hit his magnification. A dozen pods burst from the two remaining Covenant ships. Trails of exhaust pointed right at the Spartans' position. There were tiny specks accompanying the pods. Matt increased his display's magnification to the maximum. They looked like men in thruster packs. No, they were definitely not men. These things had elongated heads, and even at this distance, Matt could see past their faceplates and noted their pronounced shark-like teeth and jaws. They wore armor, it shimmered as they collided with debris, which meant energy shields. These must be the elite warrior class Dr. Halsey had conjectured. The Covenant's best. They were about to find out. Linda shot one of the EVA aliens. Shields shimmered around its body and the round bounced off. She didn't stop. She pumped four more rounds into the creature, hitting a pinpoint target in its neck. Its shields flickered and a round got through. Black blood gushed from the wound and the creature writhed in space. The other aliens spotted them. They jetted toward their location, firing plasma rifle and needlers. Take cover, Matt said. He unclipped himself and clung to the side of the dropship. Linda and John followed, bolts of fire spattering on the hull next to them, spattering molten metal. Crystalline needles bounced off their shields, blue three, Matt said. I said fall back. James almost had the explosives rigged to the nose free. A shower of needles hit him. One stuck the tank of his thruster harness, penetrated. It remained embedded for a split second, then exploded. Exhaust billowed from the pack. The uncontrolled jet spun James in the microgravity. He slammed into the station, bounced, then rocketed away into space, tumbling end over end, unable to control his trajectory. Blue 3 come in, Matt barked over the comm channel. Can, control, James' voice was punctuated with static. They've, everywhere, there was more static and the comm channel went dead. Matt watched his teammate tumble away into the darkness. All his training, his superhuman strength, reflexes, and determination, completely useless against the laws of physics. He didn't even know if James was dead. For the moment, he had to assume that he was, put him out of his mind. He had a mission to complete. If he survived, then he'd get every UNSC ship in the area to mount a search and rescue op. Linda and John shrugged out of their thruster harnesses. The suppressing fire from the aliens halted. Covenant landing pods descended toward the station, touching down at roughly 300 meter intervals. A pod landed 20 meters away. Its sides uncurled like the petals of a flower. Jackals in black and blue vacuum suits drifted out. Their boots adhered to the station's hull. Let's pave a path out of here, you two. Roger that, Linda said. Affirmative, John said. Linda targeted spots their energy shields didn't cover, boots, the top of one's head, a fingertip. Three jackals went down in quick succession, their spacesuits ruptured by her marksmanship. The rest scrambled for cover inside the pod. Matt braced his back against the dropship and fired his assault rifle in controlled bursts. The microgravity played havoc with his aim. John did the same. One jackal leaped from his cover, straight towards them. Matt switched to full auto and blasted his shield with enough rounds to send the alien flying backward off the station. He spent the clip, reloaded, and got out a grenade. He pulled the pin and lobbed it. He threw it in a flat trajectory. The grenade ricocheted off the far side of the pod and bounced inside. It detonated, a flash and spray of freeze edry blue vented upward. The explosion had caught the enemy on their unshielded sides. Blue 2, secure that landing pod. We'll cover you. He leveled his rifle. Yes, sir. Linda grabbed a pipe that ran along the station and pulled herself hand over hand. When she was inside the pod, she flashed him a green light on his heads-up display. Matt and John crawled toward the prow of the pelican. 
As they crested the ship they saw that the station was swarming with Covenant troops a hundred jackals and at least six elites. They pointed toward the pelican and slowly started to advance on their position. Come and get it, Matt muttered. He pulled two grenades from his satchel and wedged them into the C-12 on the nose of the ship. Matt pushed off and propelled himself back to his teammate. John followed suit. She grabbed him and pulled Matt into the interior of the open pod then did the same for John. Bits of a dozen dead jackals pasted the inside. You've got a new target, Matt told her. A pair of frag grenades. Sight on them and wait for my order to fire. She propped her rifle on the edge of the open pod and aimed. Jackals crawled over the pelican. One of the elite warriors appeared as well, maneuvering in a harness, flying over the ship. The elite gestured imperiously, directing the jackals to search the ship. Fire, Matt said. Linda fired once. The grenades detonated. The chain reaction set off the 20 kilograms of C-12. A subsonic fist slammed into Matt and threw him to the far side of the landing pod. Even 20 meters away, the sides of the craft warped and the top edges sheared away. He looked over the edge. There was a crater where the pelican had been. If anything had survived that blast, it was now in orbit. We have a way in, Matt remarked. Linda and John nodded. In the distance, where the station curved out of view, more Covenant pods landed, and Matt saw the silhouettes of hundreds of jackals and elite fighters crawling and jetting there, way closer. Let's go, you two. The trio pulled themselves toward the hole. The detonation had blown through five decks, leaving a tunnel of ragged-edged metal and sputtering gas hoses. Matt called up the station's blueprints on his display. That one, he said and pointed two decks down. Be level. That's where Bay 9 and the circumference should be. 300 meters to port. They climbed into the interior and into B Deck's corridor. The station's emergency lights were on, filling the passage with dull red illumination. Matt paused and signaled them to halt. He pulled out the Lotus anti-tank mine from his satchel and set it on the deck. He set the sensitivity to maximum and triggered its proximity detectors. Anything that tried to follow them would get a surprise. Matt, Linda, and John gripped the handrails along the corridor and pulled themselves up the curved hall. Flashes of automatic weapons fire flashed in the low light, just ahead of their position. Blue 2, Blue 1, Matt said, ahead, 10 meters, there's a pressure door open. They quickly took positions on either side of the door. Matt sent his optical probe around the corner. The docking bay had a dozen ship berths on two levels. Matt spotted a few battered pelicans, a station service bot, and in berth 11, a sleek private craft held in place by massive service clamps. Where the ship's name should have been painted on the prow there was only a simple circle. That had to be the target. Two berths aft, four marines in vac suits were pinned down by plasma and needler fire. Matt turned his optical probe and saw what was pinning them down. Thirty jackals were in the forward portion of the bay, slowly advancing, under cover of their energy shields. The marines tossed frag grenades. The jackals scrambled for cover and turned their shields. Three silent explosions flashed in the vacuum. Not one of the jackals fell. Another explosion ripped through the deck, behind them. It shook Matt's bones in his armor. The lotus mine had detonated. They didn't have much time before the Covenant force outside caught up with them. Matt readied his assault rifle. Take those jackals out, Blue 2. Blue 1 and I will make a break for the circumference. Linda gripped the edge of the pressure door with her left hand, propped her rifle across it, and curled her right hand around the trigger. There are a lot of them, she said. This may take a few seconds. A flicker of contact appeared on Matt's motion tracker, then vanished. He turned and brought his assault rifle to bear. Nothing. Hang on, you two. I'm going to check our six. Linda's acknowledgement light winked on. Want me to go with you, sir? John asked. Negative, I'll take care of it. Stay here and watch her back, blue one. John's acknowledgement light winked on. Matt eased back down the passage ten meters. No sensor contact. There was just dim red light and shadows, but one of the shadows moved. It only took an instant for the image to fully register a black film peeled away from the darkness. It was a meter taller than Matt and wore blue armor similar to that on Covenant warships. Its helmet was elongated and it had rows of sharp teeth, it looked like it was smiling at him. The elite warrior leveled a plasma pistol. At this range, there was no way the creature would miss, the plasma weapon would cut through Matt's slowly recharging shields almost immediately. And if Matt used his assault rifle, it wouldn't cut through the alien's energy shield. In a simple exchange of fire, the alien would win. Unacceptable. He needed to change the odds. 
Matt pushed off the wall and launched himself at the creature. He slammed into the elite before it had a chance to fire. They tumbled backward and crashed into the bulkhead. Matt saw the alien's shield flicker and fade. He hammered on the edge of the alien's gun. The creature howled soundlessly in the vacuum and dropped the plasma weapon. The elite kicked him in the midsection. His shield took the brunt of the attack, but the blow sent him spinning end over end. He slapped his hand against the ceiling and stalled his spin, then dove under the elite's follow-up attack. Matt tried to grab the alien, but their weakened shields slid and crackled over one another. Too slippery. They bounced down the curved length of the passage. Matt's boot caught on a railing, twisted, a lance of pain shot up his leg, but he halted their combined momentum. The elite pushed away and caught a railing on the opposite side of the passage. Then it turned and sprang back toward him. Matt ignored the pain in his leg. He pushed himself at the alien. They collided. Matt struck with both fists, but the force slid off the elite's shields. The elite grabbed him and threw him. They both spun into the wall. Matt was pinned, perfect he had something to brace against in the zero gravity. He swung his fist, used every muscle in his body, and connected with the alien's midsection. Its shield shimmered and crackled but some of the momentum transferred. The alien doubled over and reeled backward, and its hands found the plasma weapon that it had dropped. The elite recovered quickly and aimed at Matt. Matt jumped, grabbed its wrist. He locked his armor's glove articulation, it became a vice clamp. They wrestled for control. The gun pointed at the alien, then Matt. The alien was as strong as Matt. They spun and bounced off the floor, ceiling, and walls. They were too evenly matched. Matt managed to force a stalemate the pistol now pointed straight up between their bodies. If it went off it would hit them both, one shot at point-blank range might collapse their shields. They'd both fry. Matt whipped his forearm and elbow over the creature's wrist and slammed it in the head. For a split second, it was stunned and its strength ebbed. Matt turned the gun into its face, squeezed the firing mechanism. The plasma discharge exploded into the creature. Fire sprayed across its shields, they shimmered, flickered, and dimmed. The energy splash washed over Matt, his shields drained to a quarter. The internal suit temperature spiked to critical levels, but the elite's shields were dead. He didn't wait for the plasma gun to recharge. Matt grabbed the creature with his left hand, his right fist struck an uppercut to the head, a hook to the throat and chest. Three rapid-fire strikes with his forearm to its helmet, that cracked and hissed atmosphere. Matt pushed away and fired the pistol again. The bolt of fire caught the elite in the face. It writhed and clawed at nothing. The elite shuddered, suspended in midair, it twitched and finally stopped moving. Matt shot it again to make sure it was dead. Motion sensors picked up multiple targets approaching down the corridor, 40 meters and closing. Matt turned and double-timed it back to Linda and John. The two were where he left them, Linda shooting her targets with absolute concentration and precision and John watching her back. There are more on the way, Matt told them. Reinforcements have already arrived in the bay, Linda reported. Twenty, at least. They're learning, overlapping their shields, can't get a good shot in. Static crackled over Matt's comm channel commander, this is Captain Keys. Did you get the NAV database? The captain sounded out of breath. Negative, sir. We're close. We're bound in the stem to retrieve you. ETA is five minutes. Destroy the circumferences database and get out ASAP. If you cannot accomplish your mission, I'll have to take out the station with the Pillar of Autumn's weapons. We are running out of time. Understood, sir. The channel snapped off. Captain Keys was wrong. They weren't running out of time. Time had already run out. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 31 Did We Really Win? Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 31 Did We Really Win? Location Epsilon Eridani System, Reach Station Gamma, August 30, 2552, 0637 hours, multiple signals on motion tracker, Matt said. They're all around us. The passageway behind the trio of Spartans swarmed with blips. So did Docking Bay 9, ahead of them. Matt saw, however, not all the blips were hostiles. For Marine Frienderfo Tag strobed on his heads-up display SGT. Johnson, Private. O'Brien, Private, Bicenti, and PVT, Jenkins, 
Matt opened up a calm channel to them. Listen up, Marines. Your lines of fire are sloppy. Tighten them up. Concentrate on one jackal at a time, or you'll just waste your ammo on their shields. Commander? Sergeant Johnson said, startled. Sir, yes sir, Blue 2, the commander said. Blue 1 and I are going in. We're going to open up the circumference like a tin can. He nodded toward the pelican in the adjacent bay. Give us a few grenades over the top. Understood, she replied. You're covered, sir. She primed two frag grenades, swung around the pressure doors, and threw them behind the jackals. Let's go, Blue 1. When we get there, take the controls, Matt said. Roger that, John said. The duo pushed off the wall, propelled themselves in the Zirigi across the bay. The grenades detonated and caught the jackals on their backsides. Blue blood spattered on the insides of their shields and across the deck. Matt and John crashed into the pelican's hull. They pulled themselves to the side hatch, opened it, and crawled in. John got into the cockpit, released the docking clamps, and tapped the maneuvering thrusters once to break free. The pelican lifted off the deck. Matt said over the comm channel, Marines and Blue 2 take cover behind us. John maneuvered the pelican into the center of the docking bay. A dozen jackals poured in through the passage that Blue 2 had just left. John fired with the pelican's autocannon, cut down their shields and peppered the aliens with hundreds of rounds. They exploded into chunks, alien blood twisted crazily in zero gravity. Commander, Linda said, I'm picking up thousands of signals on the motion tracker, inbound from all directions. The entire station is crawling. Matt opened the pelican's back hatch. Get in, he said. Blue 2 and the marines piled inside. The marines did a double take at the trio of Spartans in their Mjolnir armor. The master chief turned the pelican to face the circumference. He sighted the autocannon on the ship's forward viewports and opened fire. Thousands of rounds streamed from the chain gun and cracked through the thick, transparent windows. He followed up with an anvil I.I. missile. It blasted through the prow and peeled the craft open. Take the controls, he told Blue 2. Blue 1, I'm going out. Cover me. Copy that, sir. I got your back, John said. Matt slipped out the side hatch and jumped to the circumference. The inside of the ship's cockpit was scrap metal. He accessed the computer panel in the floor deck and located the NAV database core. It was a cube of memory crystal the size of his thumb. Such a tiny thing to cause so much trouble. He shot it three times with his assault rifle. It shattered. Mission completed, he said. One small victory in all this mess. The Covenant wouldn't find Earth, today. Matt exited the circumference. Jackals appeared on the level above them in the docking bay. His motion tracker blinked with solid contacts. Matt jumped back into the pelican, strapped himself in the pilot's chair, and turned the ship to face the outer doors. Blue 2, signal the dockmaster AI to open the outer bay doors. Signal sent, she said. No response, sir. She looked around. There's a manual release by the outer door. She moved toward the aft hatch. I'll get this one, sir. It's my turn. Cover me. Roger, Blue 2. Keep your head down. I'll draw their fire. She launched herself out the back hatch. Matt tapped the pelican's thrusters and the ship rose higher in the bay, up to the second level. The upper decks were the mechanic bays. The area was littered with ships that were partially disassembled in various stages of repair. It was also where a hundred jackals and a handful of elite warriors were waiting for him. They opened fire. Plasma bolts scored the hull of the pelican. Matt fired the chain gun and let loose a salvo of missiles. Alien shields blazed and failed. Blue and green blood splashed and flash froze in the icy vacuum. He hit the top thrusters and dropped down to the lower level, slammed the ship back into a berth for cover. Blue 2 crouched by the manual release. The outer doors eased open, revealing the night and stars beyond. You're clear for exit, Commander. We're home free. A new contact on the Pelican's targeting display appeared, right behind Linda. He had to warn her. A bolt of plasma struck her in the back. Another blot of fire blazed her from the upper decks and splashed across her front. She crumpled, her shields flickered and went out. Two more bolts hit her chest. A third blast smashed into her helmet. No, Matt said. He felt each of those plasma bolts as if they had hit him, too. He moved the pelican to cover her. Plasma struck the hull, melting its outer skin. Get her inside, Blue One, Matt ordered. Marines, cover him. John jumped out, grabbed Linda and her smoldering armor, and pulled her inside the pelican. 
Matt sealed the hatch, ignited the engines and pushed them to full thrust, rocketing into space. Can you fly this ship? Matt asked the Marine Sergeant. Yes, sir, Johnson replied. Take over. Matt went to where John was kneeling by Linda's side. Sections of her armor had melted and adhered to her. Underneath, in patches, bits of carbonized bone showed. He accessed her vital signs on his headsup display. They were dangerously low. No, Red, not you. I can't lose you, Matt said. Did you do it? She whispered. Get the database. Yes, we got it. Good, she said. We won. She clasped his hand and closed her eyes. Her vital signs flatlined. Matt squeezed her hand and let go. Yes, he said bitterly. We won. Commander, come in. Captain Key's voice sounded over the comm channel. The Pillar of Autumn will be in rendezvous position in one minute. We're ready, Captain, Matt answered. He set Linda's hand over her chest and swiped the two-finger Spartan smile gesture over her faceplate. We're ready, he said as he looked John straight in the eye through his helmet. John nodded. Is she the sergeant started? Get us to the Autumn. Now Matt said. The instant Matt docked the pelican to the Pillar of Autumn, he felt the cruiser accelerate. Matt took Linda's body double time to a cryo chamber and immediately froze her. She was clinically dead, there was no doubt of that. Still, if they could get her to a fleet hospital, they might be able to resuscitate her. It was a long shot, but she was a Spartan. The med techs wanted to check John and Matt out as well, but they declined. John decided to stay in the cryo chamber with Linda. Matt took the elevator to the bridge to report to Captain Keyes. As he rode inside the lift he felt the ship accelerate port, then starboard. Evasive maneuvers. The elevator doors parted and Matt stepped onto the bridge. He snapped a crisp salute to Captain Keyes. Reporting for debriefing, sir. Captain Keyes turned and looked surprised to see him, or maybe he was shocked to see the condition of his armor. It was charred, battered, and covered with alien blood. The captain returned Matt's salute. The NAV database was destroyed. He asked. Sir. I would not have left if my mission was incomplete. Of course, Commander. Very good, Captain Keyes replied. Sir, may I ask that you scan for active FOF tags in the region? Matt glanced at the main view screen, saw scattered fights between Covenant and UNSC warships in the distance. I lost a man on the station. He may be floating out there, somewhere. Lieutenant Hall, the captain asked. Scanning, she said. After a moment she looked back and shook her head. I see. Matt replied. There could be worse deaths, but not for one of his Spartans. Floating helplessly. Slowly suffocating and freezing, losing to an enemy that could not be fought. Sir, Matt said, when will the Pillar of Autumn rendezvous with my planetside team? Captain Keyes turned from Matt and stared out into space. We won't be picking them up, he said quietly. They were overrun by Covenant forces. They never made orbit. We've lost contact with them. Matt took a step closer. Then I would like permission to take a dropship and retrieve them, sir. Request denied, Commander. We still have a mission to perform. And we cannot remain in this system much longer. Lieutenant Dominique, aft camera on the main screen. Covenant vessels swarmed through the Reach system in five ship crescent formations. The remaining UNSC ships fled before them, those that could still move. Those ships too damaged to outrun the Covenant were blasted with plasma and laser fire. The Covenant had won this battle. They were mopping up before they glassed the planet, Matt had seen this happen in a dozen campaigns. This time was different, however. This time the Covenant was glassing a planet, with his people still on it. He tried to think of a way to stop them, to save his teammates. He couldn't. The captain turned and strode to Matt, stood by his side. Dr. Halsey's mission, he said, is more important than ever now. It may be the only chance left for Earth. We have to focus on that goal. Three dozen Covenant craft moved toward Gamma Station and the now inert orbital defense platforms. They bombarded the installations, the mightiest weapons in the UNSC arsenal, with plasma. The guns melted and boiled away. Matt clenched his hands into fists. The captain was correct there was nothing to do now except complete the mission they had set out to do. Captain Keys barked, Ensign Lovell, give me our best acceleration. I want to enter slipstream space as soon as possible. Cortana said, excuse me, Captain. Six Covenant frigates are inbound on an intercept course. Continue evasive maneuvers, Cortana. Prepare the slipspace generators and get me an appropriate randomized exit vector. Aye, sir. Navigation symbols flashed along the length of her holographic body. 
Matt continued to watch as the Covenant ships closed in on them. As he so he opened a private comm channel to John and quietly asked, Tell me truthfully, Chief, did we really win? No, sir. I don't believe we did. How do you get over it? Losing your teammates in combat, I mean. The comm channel was silent for several long seconds, then the chief quietly said, You don't get over it, sir. You learn to deal with it. John paused again. Sir, may I ask what happened to James and what's the status of Red Team? No sign of James's FOF tag, Matt answered. As for Red Team, the captain said they were overrun by Covenant forces. And before you ask, no, we're not going to pick them up. Why not? John asked angrily. The captain denied my request to take a dropship and go retrieve them, Matt snapped. Not my orders, John. I'm not in command of this ship, Keys is. Believe me, Chief, if it were my decision, I would go back for them. Matt heard John take a deep breath and exhale slowly. I understand, sir, he said. Matt closed the comm channel to give himself some time to reflect on the events that transpired what felt like eons ago but were closer to ten minutes. Were he and John the only Spartans left? Better to die than live without their teammates. But they still had a mission victory against the Covenant, and vengeance for their fallen comrades. Generating randomized exit vector per the Cole Protocol, Cortana said. Matt glanced at her translucent body. She looked vaguely like a younger Dr. Halsey. Tiny dots, ones, and zeros slid over her torso, arms, and legs. Her thoughts were literally worn on her sleeve, the symbols also appeared on Ensign Lovell's NAV station. He cocked his head as the symbols and numbers scrolled across the NAV console. The representations of slipspace vectors and velocity curves twisted across the screen, tantalizingly familiar. He'd seen them somewhere before, but he could not make the connection. Something on your mind, Commander? Cortana asked. Even though Matt wasn't her carrier, he replied, those symbols. I thought I had seen them somewhere before. It's nothing. Cortana got a far-off look in her eyes. The mark cycling on her hologram shifted and rearranged. Matt saw the Covenant fleet gathered around Planet Reach. They swarmed and circled like sharks. The first of their plasma bombardments launched toward the surface. Clouds in the fire's path boiled away. Jump to slip space, Ensign Lovell, the captain said. Get us the hell out of here. Matt remembered Chief Mendez's words, that they had to live and fight another day. He and John were alive, and there was still plenty of fight left in both him and John. And they would win this war, no matter what it took. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 32 Rude Awakening Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 32 Rude Awakening Location UNSC Pillar of Autumn Location Unknown September 19, 2552 0127 hours, ship's time he was floating in the never-never land somewhere between cryo and full consciousness when the dream began. It was a familiar dream, a terrible dream, and one which had nothing to do with war. He was on Earth, the colony world he'd been born on, which haven't been destroyed the Covenant yet. He heard screaming all around. He turned and saw three very familiar people, all of them covered in blood. His dad, his mom, and sister, Rachel. The screaming slowly stopped then changed to a chant. This is all your fault, they chanted. The chant started out quietly then slowly grew to an almost unbearing level. Matt wanted to scream, but when he opened his mouth to do so, no sound came out. Matt closed his eyes and tried to block out the sound, but that didn't help whatsoever. The dream started to fade, and light appeared in front of the Spartans' eyes. Vapor vented, swirled, and began to dissipate. A voice came, as if from a great distance. It was male and matter-of-fact. Sorry for the quick thaw, Commander, but things are a bit hectic right now. The disorientation should pass quickly. A second voice welcomed him back and it took the Spartan a moment to remember where he'd been prior to entering the cryotube. There had been a battle, a terrible battle, in which most if not all of his Spartan brothers and sisters had been killed. Men and women with whom he had been raised and trained since the age of six, and who constituted as his real family. Men and women who he possibly sent to their deaths. With the horrible memory, plus subtle changes to the gas mix that filled his lungs, came strength. He flexed his stiff limbs. 
The Spartan heard the tech say something about freezer burn and pushed himself up and out of the cryotube's chilly embrace. Matt heard a sound next to him. He looked to his left and saw possibly the only Spartan besides himself that was left, John 117, the Master Chief. The tech in front of the Spartans turned to him and said, Commander, please look around the room. I need to get a calibration for your battle suit's diagnostics. As the techs were doing their diagnostics, he heard a familiar voice on the common announcement was made. After the announcement, Matt opened a private comm channel to John and said, You ready for this, Chief? Yes, Commander. I'm ready, John answered, confidently. The neural interface which linked the Matt to his Mjolnir armor was working perfectly, and immediately fed data to his helmet's heads-up display on the inside surface of his visor. It felt good to move around, and Matt quietly flexed his fingers. His skin itched and stung, a side effect of the cryo gases, but he quickly banished the pain from his awareness. He had long ago learned how to disassociate himself from physical discomfort. The Spartan duo had both heard Cortana's announcement. The Covenant were on their way. Good. Matt scanned the room for weapons, but there was no arms locker present. The lack of weapons wasn't of great concern to him. He'd taken weapons away from Covenant soldiers before. The intercom crackled again bridge to Cryo 2, this is Captain Keys. Send the commander and the master chief to the bridge immediately. One of the techs started to object, pointing out that more tests were required, when Keys cut in. He said, on the double, crewman, and the rating gave the only reply he could. I, I, sir. The tech chief turned and faced them. We'll find weapons later. The Spartans nodded. Matt was about to move for the door when an explosion echoed through the cryo bay. Matt bristled. Covenant forces were in close proximity, and a fellow soldier had just died. He longed to climb to the observation bay and engage the enemy, but orders were orders. He and John needed to get to the bridge. The cryotech keyed open a hatchway. Come on he yelled, we've got to get the hell out of here. The Spartans followed the crewmen through the hatch and down the corridor. A sudden explosion blew the next door to smithereens, hurled what remained of the technician's body down the passageway, and caused both Spartans' shields to flare. He's gone, John said with a slight of sadness in his voice. We can mourn him later, Matt said as he looked at the technician's body. Come on, we need to get to the bridge. Agreed, John said. Matt mentally reviewed the schematics of the Halcyon-class line of ships and they doubled back. The duo vaulted over a pair of power conduits and landed in the dimly lit maintenance hallway beyond. An emergency beacon strobed and alarms wailed. The rumble of a second explosion echoed down the corridor. They pushed ahead, past a dead crewman, and into the next section of hallway. Matt saw a hatch, its security panel pulsing green, and hurried forward. There was a third explosion, but his armor deflected the force of the blast. The Spartans forced open the partially melted door, saw an opening to their left, and heard someone scream. A naval crewman fired his sidearm at a target Matt couldn't see, and the deck shuddered as a missile struck the autumn's hull. The Spartans ducked under a half-raised door just in time to see the crewman take an energy bolt through the chest as the rest of the human counterboarders returned fire. Covenant forces backed through a hatch and were forced to retreat into an adjoining compartment. Chaos reigned as the ship's crew did the best they could to push the boarders back toward the airlocks or to trap them in compartments where they could be contained and dispatched. Later, unarmed, and well aware of the fact that Captain Keys needed him and John on the bridge, Matt had little choice but to follow the signs, and avoid the firefights that raged all around. The two made their way down a darkened access corridor, the Covenant boarders must have shorted out the illumination circuits in this compartment, and nearly ran headlong into a Covenant elite. The alien's personal shield sparked and he roared in surprise and anger. The Spartans crouched and prepared to meet the alien soldier's charge, then ducked, as a marine fire team unleashed a barrage of assault rifle fire at the elite. Purple gore splashed the bulkhead, and the alien dropped in a crumpled heap. The marines moved forward to secure the area, and the two nodded in thanks to the squad leader. The Spartans turned, sprinted down the passageway, and made it to the bridge without further incident. Matt looked out through the main viewport, saw the strange-looking construct that floated out beyond the cruiser's hull, and was momentarily curious about what it was. No doubt the captain would fill them in. The duo strode toward the captain's station, near the center of the bridge. A variety of naval personnel sat hunched at their consoles as they struggled to control their beleaguered vessel. Some battled the latest wave of Seraph fighters, others worked on damage control, 
and one grim-faced lieutenant made use of the ship's environmental systems to suck the atmosphere out of those compartments which had been occupied by Covenant forces. Some of the enemies carried their own atmosphere, but some of them didn't, and that made them vulnerable. There were crew members in some of those spaces, perhaps some she knew personally, but there was no way to save them. If she didn't kill them, then the enemy would. Matt understood the situation well. Better a quick death in the vacuum of space than at the hands of the Covenant. Matt spotted Keys near the main tactical display. Keys studied the screens intently, particularly a large display of the strange ring. The Spartans came to attention. Captain Keys, they said in unison. Captain Keys turned to face them. Good to see you, Commander, Master Chief. Things aren't going well. Cortana did her best, but we never really had a chance. The AI arched a holographic eyebrow. A dozen Covenant battleships against a single Halcyon-class cruiser. With those odds we still had three, she paused, as if distracted, then amended, make that four kills. Cortana looked at the duo. Sleep well. Yes, as well as I could, Matt answered. Yes, John replied. No thanks to your driving. Cortana smiled at John. So, you did miss me. Before either of them could reply, another blast rocked the entire ship. Matt and John both grabbed a nearby support pillar and braced themselves, as several crewers crashed to the deck nearby. Keys grabbed onto a console for support. Report. Cortana shimmered blue. It must have been one of their boarding parties. My guess is an antimatter charge. The fire control officer turned in his seat. Ma'am fire control for the main cannon is offline. Cortana looked at Keys. The loss of the ship's primary weapon, the magnetic accelerator cannon, was a crippling blow to their holding action. Captain, the cannon was my last defensive option. All right, Key said gruffly, I'm initiating coal protocol, Article 2. We're abandoning the autumn. That means you too, Cortana. And Crystal as well. While you do what? Go down with the ship. Cortana shot back. In a manner of speaking, Keys replied, The object we found, I'm going to try and land the autumn on it. Cortana shook her head. With all due respect, this war has enough dead heroes. The captain's eyes locked with hers. I appreciate your concern, Cortana, but it's not up to me. The protocol is clear. The destruction or capture of shipboard AI is absolutely unacceptable. That means you are abandoning ship. Lock in a selection of emergency landing zones and upload them to my neural lace. The AI paused, then nodded. I, I, sir. Which is where you two come in, Keys continued as he turned to face the Spartans. Get Cortana and Crystal off this ship. Keep them safe from the enemy. If they capture either of them, they'll learn everything. Force deployment, weapons research. He paused, then added Earth. The Spartans nodded. We understand, Matt said. Keys glanced at Cortana. Are you ready? There was a pause as the AI took one last look around. In many ways, the ship was her physical body and she was reluctant to leave it. Yank me. Keys turned to a console, touched a series of controls, and turned back again. The hollow shivered and Cortana's image swirled into the pedestal below and disappeared from view. Keys waited until the hollow had disappeared, removed a data chip from the pedestal, and offered it to John, along with his sidearm. Good luck, Master Chief. John accepted the sidearm first then the chip, reached back and slotted the device into his neural interface. As he was doing that, the captain reached into his uniform and pulled out another data chip. Matt instantly recognized it as Crystal's chip. Keys turned to him said, I kept this safe for you. Good luck, Commander. Matt accepted the chip and reached back to slot the device into the neural interface, located at the base of his skull. There was a positive click, followed by a flood of sensation as Crystal joined him within the confines of the armor's neural network. At first, it felt as if someone had poured a cup of ice water into his mind, followed by a momentary jab of pain, and a familiar presence. He'd worked with Crystal before, just prior to the disaster at Reach. Hmm. Your architecture isn't that different from the Autumns. Did you miss me? A familiar female voice said. Don't get any funny ideas. And when were you in the Autumn systems? Matt demanded. I thought you were just the backup AI. I am the backup AI. To answer your former question, the captain connected me to the Autumn once to help me to familiarize myself with the ship's systems so I could take over just in case something happened to Cortana, Crystal replied. That answer satisfy you? That made sense. Yes, very much, he said. The A-human interface was intrusive in a way, yet comforting too, since Matt knew what Crystal could do. 
He would depend on her during the hours and days ahead, just as she would depend on him. It was like being part of a team again. Let's go, Commander. We need to find you a weapon, John said over a private comm channel. Lead the way, Chief. I'll follow your lead, Matt said. John looked at him and tilted his head slightly. What do you mean, sir? I'm relinquishing command of blue team to you. I told you I wasn't cut out to lead, and I was right, Matt said as he shifted his feet. John put his hand on his shoulder and told him, no, you did fine. You couldn't have known that the mission would have several snags and losing comrades happens. Matt felt his chest tighten when he remembered what happened back on Reach. He remembered one particular red-haired Spartan, Linda, the woman he loved, but never got the chance to say three particular words to. It doesn't make the loss feel any better, he said. It just makes it feel worse. I know how you feel. I've been in the same situation countless times before. We'll talk about this later, but for now, we need to get out of here, Blue One. If that's all right with you, let's go. Matt nodded. That's fine with me. Let's go, he said as confidently as he could. The Spartans saluted the captain and left the bridge. The sounds of fighting were even louder now, indicating that, in spite of the crew's best efforts, Covenant forces had still managed to fight their way out of the areas adjacent to the airlocks and made it all the way up to the area around the command deck. Bodies lay strewn around the corridor, roughly 50 meters from the bridge. The human defenders had pushed them back, but Matt could tell that the last assault had been close. Too close. Matt paused to kneel next to a dead ensign, took a moment to close her eyelids, and appropriated the fallen trooper's ammo and tossed it to John. The pistol the captain had given the chief was standard Navy issue. It fired 12.7 mm semi-armor piercing high explosive ammo from 12 round clips. Not what Matt would choose to tackle an elite with, but good enough for grunt work. Conscious of the need to get the two AIs off the ship, the duo made their way down the corridor. Matt heard the strange high-pitched squeaks and barks before he actually saw the Covenant grunts themselves. Consistent with his status as a veteran, the first alien to come around the corner wore red-trimmed armor, a methane rig, and a Marine's web pistol belt. The alien wore the captured gear poncho villa, style and dragged it across the deck. Two of his comrades brought up the rear. The chief paused long enough to let more of them appear, then opened fire. All three of the grunts went down from headshots. Phosphorescent blue ichor spattered the deck. Good shooting, Matt said as ran over and grabbed a plasma pistol from one of the dead grunts. It wasn't much, but it was a start. John also grabbed a plasma pistol and replied, thanks. Let's keep moving. We need to get Crystal and Cortana off the Pillar of Autumn. Right. Let's go. The Spartans stepped over the bodies and moved on. A lifeboat. That was their real goal, and they would do whatever it took to find one. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 33 Lima Foxtrot Alpha 43. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 33 Lima Foxtrot Alpha 43. Location UNSC Pillar of Autumn, Location Unknown, September 19, 2552, 0147 hours, ship's time. As the duo moved through the hallways of the Halcyon cruiser it seemed as if the autumn was infested with chrome-armored demons spouting plasma fire. Both Spartans had acquired an MA-5B assault rifle along with close to 400 rounds of 7.62mm armor-piercing ammunition. Matt had also found an M60 pistol as they made their way through the hallways of the Pillar of Autumn. In this situation, with plenty of ordnance lying around, Matt preferred to reload when the ammo indicator on his weapon dropped to around 10. Failure to do so could result in disaster if he ran into serious opposition. With that in mind, he hit the release, allowed a nearly empty magazine to fall, and shoved a new clip into its place. The weapon's digital ammo counter reset, as did its cousin in his HUD. We're closer, Cortana said. Duck through the hatch ahead and go up one level, Crystal added. The Spartans ran into a shimmery, black-clad elite, and opened fire. There were grunts in the area as well, but they both knew that the elite posed the real danger. They expertly sprayed a trio of bursts at the alien. The elite roared defiance and fired in return, but the sheer volume of the specially hardened 7.62 mm projectiles caused the elite's shielding to flare, overload, and fail. 
the bulky alien fell to his knees, bent forward, and collapsed. Frightened by what had happened to their leader, the grunts made barking noises, turned, and began to scurry away. Individually, the grunts were cowards, but the Spartans had seen what a pack of the creatures could do. Matt and John opened fire again. Alien bodies tumbled and fell. The duo continued on through a hatch, heard more firing, and turned in that direction. Cortana called out Covenant on the landing above us. Blue one, take point up the stairs, John ordered. I'll watch our six. Copy that, Matt replied. The Spartans ran toward a flight of metal stairs and charged straight for the landing. Boots rang on metal as Matt slammed a fresh magazine into the weapon's receiver and passed a wounded Marine. The Spartan remembered the soldier from his last action on one of Reach's orbiting defense stations. The Marine held a dressing to a plasma burn and managed to smile. Glad you could make it, Commander. You too, Master Chief, we saved some party favors just for you guys. The Spartans nodded. Matt took the lead, paused on the landing, and took aim at a jackal. The vaguely bird-like aliens carried energy shields, handheld units, rather than the full-body protection the elites favored. The jackal shifted to take aim at the wounded marine, and Matt saw his opening. He fired a burst at the jackal's unprotected flank and the alien hit the deck plates, dead. He continued the climb up the flight of stairs and came nearly eye to eye with another elite. The alien roared, charged forward, and attempted to use his plasma rifle like a club. Matt evaded the blow, he'd fought elites hand to hand before and knew they were dangerously strong, and backed away. He leveled the assault weapon at the elite's belly and squeezed the trigger. The Covenant soldier seemed to absorb the bullets like a sponge, continued to advance, and was just about to swing when a final round cut through his spinal cord. The alien soldier slammed into the deck, twitched once, and died. Matt reached for another magazine. Another elite roared, as did another. There was no time to reload, so Matt turned to take them on. He discarded the assault rifle and drew his sidearm. There were a pair of dead marines at the alien's feet, roughly 25 meters away. Well within range, he thought and opened fire. The lead elite snarled as the powerful handgun rounds tore into the shielding around his head. Sensing the Spartan's threat, the aliens shifted all of their fire in his direction only to watch as it dissipated against his shields and armor. Now, free to direct their fire wherever they chose, the marines launched a hastily organized counterattack. A fragmentation grenade blew one elite into bloody ribbons, shredded the jackals who had the poor judgment to stand next to him, and sent pieces of shrapnel flying across the stairwell to slam into the bulkhead. The other elite was consumed by a hail of bullets. He seemed to wilt, fold, and fly apart. That's what I'm talking about a marine crowed. He fired a coup de grace into the alien's head. Satisfied that the area was reasonably secure, the Spartans moved on. They passed through a hatch helped a pair of marines take out a group of grunts, and marched down a corridor drenched with blood, both human and alien. The deck shook as the autumn took a new hit from a ship-to-ship -ship missile. There was a muffled clang, and a light flared beyond a viewport. The lifeboats are launching, Crystal announced. We should hurry, Cortana said. We are hurrying, Matt snapped. We'll get there as soon as we can, John said. Both AIs started to reply, reconsidered, and processed the equivalent of an apologetic shrug. Sometimes, fallible though they were, humans were right. The deck jumped as the Pillar of Autumn absorbed yet another blow and the battle continued to rage within. The commander and the master chief were close now, they could almost taste it and prepared to sprint for a lifeboat. Matt led the way and that was when Crystal said, behind you and Matt felt a plasma bolt hit him squarely between the shoulder blades. He rolled with the blow and sprang to his feet. He whirled to face his attacker and saw that a grunt had dropped out of an overhead maintenance way. The diminutive alien stood with his feet planted on the deck, a plasma pistol overcharging in his claws. Matt took three steps forward, used the assault rifle to knock the creature off its feet, and followed it with a three-round burst. The grunt's pistol discharged its stored energy into the ceiling. Drips of molten metal sizzled on Matt's shields. The armor-piercing rounds punctured the alien's breathing apparatus, released a stream of methane, and caused the body to spin like a top. A trio of additional grunts landed on Matt's shoulders and grabbed hold. It was almost laughable until the Spartan realized that one of them was trying to remove his helmet. A second alien carried an ignited plasma grenade, the little bastards meant to drop the explosive into his armor. He flexed his shoulders and shook himself like a dog. Grunts flew in every direction as the Spartan duo used short-controlled bursts to put them down. Sorry, blue one. No clear shot, 
John said after the grunts were dead. It's okay, sir, Matt replied. Let's move. They turned toward the lifeboats. Now Cortana urged, run. The Spartans ran, just as the door started to close. A nearby Marine fell while running for the escape craft. Get him inside, I'll cover you, John said. Matt paused long enough to scoop the soldier up and hurl him into the boat. Matt turned around and covered John as he entered the lifeboat. He entered a split second after John. Once inside, they joined a small group of crew members already on board the escape craft. Now would be a very good time to leave, Crystal commented coolly, as something else exploded and the cruiser shuddered in response. Matt stood facing the hatch while John faced the front. Matt waited for the hatch to close all the way. He saw the red light appear and knew it was sealed. Punch it. The pilot triggered the launch sequence and the lifeboat blasted free of the ship, balanced on a column of fire. The boat skimmed along the surface of the autumn at dizzying speed. Plasma blasts from a Covenant warship slammed into the autumn's hull. In seconds, the lifeboat dropped away from the cruiser and dove toward the ring. Matt killed his external comm system and spoke directly to Crystal. So, any idea what this thing is? No, Crystal admitted. Cortana managed to slice some data out of the Covenant Battle Network and she shared it with me. They call it Halo, and it has some kind of religious significance to them, but, your guess is as good as mine. She paused, and the Spartan sensed the AI's amusement. Well, almost as good. Halo, he repeated. Looks like we're going to be calling it home for a while. Matt realized that John had gone quiet. He probably turned off his external comm system too. Matt knew Cortana was probably telling him the same thing that Crystal had told Matt himself. Matt opened Blue Team's comm channel. What do you think about this halo, sir? He asked John. I don't know Blue One, but I think we're about to find out, John replied. The lifeboat was too small to mount a Shofujikawa faster than light drive so there was nowhere to go but the ring. There were no shouts of jubilation, no high fives, only silence as the boat fell through the blackness of space. They were alive, but that was subject to change, and that left nothing to celebrate. One Marine said, this duty station really sucks. No one saw any reason to contradict him. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 34 Halo. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 34 Halo. Location Lifeboat Lima Foxtrot Alpha 43, in emergency descent to the surface of Halo. Deployment 00 hours 0 2 minutes 51 seconds, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. Matt watched the ring open up in front of him as the pilot guided the lifeboat in past a thick silvery edge and down under the construct's inner surface, before putting the tiny ship into a shallow dive calculated to place it on the strange landscape below. As he looked forward, he saw mountains, hills, and a plane that curved up and eventually out of focus as the ring swooped upward to complete itself somewhere over his head. The sight was beautiful, strange, and disorienting all at the same time. Then the sightseeing was over as the ground came up to meet them. Matt couldn't tell whether the lifeboat took enemy fire, suffered an engine failure, or nicked an obstacle on final approach. It really didn't matter, the result was the same. The pilot had time to yell, we're coming in too fast a moment later, the hull bounced off something solid, and the Spartans were knocked off their feet. Pain stabbed through his temples as his helmet slammed into the bulkhead on his way to the deck plates, followed by clinging blackness. Commander. Commander. Can you hear me? Crystal's voice echoed in his head. Matt opened his eyes and found himself facing the overhead light panels. They flickered and sparked. Yes, I can hear you, he replied. There's no need to shout. Oh, really? The AI replied in an arch tone. Maybe you'd like to file a complaint with the Covenant. The crash triggered a lot of radio traffic and it's my guess that the welcome wagon is on the way. Matt struggled to his feet and was just about to answer in kind when he saw the bodies. The impact of the crash had ripped the boat open and mangled the unprotected people within. No one else had survived besides him and John. Cortana, what's the chief's status? Matt asked as he dragged John out of the lifeboat. Scanning, the master chief is unconscious, Cortana answered. Hopefully he'll wake up soon. We need to move. He will, Matt said. There was no time to dwell the dead marines and the pilot, 
not if he and the chief wanted to stay alive and keep Cortana and Crystal from falling into enemy hands. Matt hurried to gather as much ammo, grenades, and supplies as he could carry. He had just finished checking the pins on a quartet of frag grenades when Cortana piped up Chief. Chief. Can you hear me? Matt saw the chief sit up. Matt went over and gave him a hand to help him up. The chief took it. After John was in his feet, Matt walked over to a nearby MA-5B assault rifle, picked it up and tossed it to John. The chief caught it and started to gather some ammo. You okay, sir? Matt asked. I'm fine, blue one. How about you? I'm fine, sir. Don't worry about me, Matt said as he finished gathering his gear. Suddenly, Cortana piped up an alarm warning. I've detected multiple Covenant dropships on approach. I recommend moving into those hills. If we're lucky, the Covenant will believe that everyone aboard the lifeboat died in the crash. Acknowledged, John said. Master Chief, your orders, sir? Matt asked. Follow Cortana's plan. It makes the most sense, John answered. Take point across the bridge. Aye, sir, Matt said. Cortana's plan did make sense. Matt surveyed the area for threats, then hurried across the canyon floor and the bridge that crossed it. The chief followed close behind. The span was devoid of safety railings and was constructed from a strange, burnished metal. Beneath the bridge, a towering waterfall thundered down a massive drop-off. The rest of the world arched high overhead. Large outcroppings of weather-smoothed gray rock rose ahead, and a scattering of what looked like conifers reminded him of the forests he'd trained in on reach. There were differences, however, like the way the ring tapered up from the horizon, the manner in which its shadow fell upon the land, and the crisp, clean air that came in through his filters. It was beautiful, breathtakingly so, but potentially dangerous as well. Alert, Covenant dropship inbound. Crystal's voice was calm but insistent. The prophecy soon proved correct as a large shadow floated over the far end of the bridge and the ship's engine screamed a warning. There was very little doubt that the Spartans had been spotted, so they made plans to deal with it. They reached the end of the bridge, saw a likely-looking boulder off to their left, and hurried to take advantage of it. They skirted the cliff edge, ignoring the long drop. Careful to watch their footing, the Spartans circled the rock and found a crevice where the boulder touched the cliff. Now, with their backs to the wall, the Spartans had a chance to defend themselves. Matt checked his motion tracker and realized that a pair of Covenant Banshees were practically on top of him. The alien aircraft boasted plasma cannon and fuel rod guns. Though not especially fast, they were still dangerous, especially against ground troops. Combined with air support, the grunts and elites that dropped from the fork-shaped alien troop carrier were a serious threat. Blue One, focus fire on the Banshees. I'll handle the ground troops, the chief said. Copy that, Matt replied. Matt steadied his aim and sighted on the nearest banshee. Careful not to fire early, the Spartan waited for the banshee to come within range, then squeezed the trigger. The first assault ship came straight at him, which made it relatively easy to stay on target. Bullet impact sparked on the banshee's hull as his ammo counter dwindled. The ship shuddered as at least some of the armor-piercing rounds penetrated the fuselage, pulled up out of its dive, and started to trail smoke. Matt was in no position to appreciate the results of his efforts, However, as the second banshee swooped out of the sun and pounded the area around him with plasma fire, his shield display dropped, then pulsed red. An alarm whined in his helmet speakers. Matt returned fire. Without pause, he thumbed the magazine release and slammed a fresh clip into the receiver. Matt crouched, searched the sky for targets, and spotted banshee number one in the nick of time. He braced himself for another assault. The Spartan allowed the enemy aircraft to approach, took a slight lead, and squeezed the trigger again. The Covenant ship ran into the stream of bullets, exploded into flames, and slammed into the cliff wall. The second ship was still up there, flying in lazy circles, but Matt knew better than to stand around and watch it. A half dozen red dots had appeared on his motion sensors. Each blip represented a potential assailant and most were located to their rear. Matt waited for his shields to return to their full charge, then turned, jumped up onto the boulder along with John, and took a quick look around. The Covenant dropship had deposited a clutch of grunts on the far side of the canyon where they were busy examining the wreckage of their lifeboat. But that wasn't all. To their left, on their side of the bridge, another group of grunts was working its way through the trees, moving in his direction. They were still a ways off, however, which gave him a few seconds to prepare. Though not armed with the standard SRS-99 CS-2AM sniper rifle, his weapon of choice, 
Matt was packing the M60 pistol that he had picked up back on the autumn. It was equipped with a 2x scope and, in the hands of an expert, it could reach out and touch someone. Matt saw the chief draw his sidearm as well. Blue one, take out the grunts across the canyon, John ordered. Start with the one closest to us. I'll watch your right flank. Yes, sir, Matt replied. Matt turned to the group gathered around the wreckage and placed the targeting circle over the nearest grunt. In spite of the fact that they were of no immediate threat, the aliens on the other side of the canyon were in an ideal position to flank them, which meant they would deal with them first. Twelve shots rang out, and seven grunts fell. Satisfied that his right flank was reasonably secure, Matt slammed a fresh clip into the pistol and shifted his attention to the enemy troops that were emerging from the trees. This group of grunts was closer now, much closer, and they opened fire. Matt chose to target the most distant alien first, thereby ensuring that he would still get a crack at the others, even if they turned and tried to escape. The pistol shots came in quick succession. The grunts barked, hooted, and gurgled as the well-aimed bullets hurled their lifeless carcasses down the reverse slope. When there were no more targets to fire at, Matt took a moment to reload the handgun, clicked on the safety, and returned the weapon to its holster. He jumped off the boulder and crouched under an outcropping of rock. Matt eyed the banshee above. It was still there, circling well out of range, waiting to pounce should he emerge from cover. That meant him and John could sit there and wait for more ground forces to arrive, or they could abandon their hiding place and attempt to slip away. Matt had never been one for standing around, so he readied his assault rifle and slid forward over the rock. John took point as they across open ground, it was a short dash past the scattering of dead grunts. The duo crouched beneath the cover offered by a copse of trees. Get ready to move, John said. On three, follow me. Matt winked his acknowledgement light. John counted to three then that dashed from boulder to boulder. The duo leapfrogged uphill, still very much aware of the banshee at their back, but Matt was reasonably certain he'd given the aircraft the slip. There were no blips on Matt's threat detector until they topped the rise and paused to examine the terrain ahead. A telltale red dot popped onto his HUD. The two eased their way forward, waiting for the moment of contact. Then they saw movement as hunched bodies dashed from one scrap of cover to the next. There were four of them, including a blue armored elite. The elite charged recklessly forward, firing as he came. They'd engaged such elites before, there was some significance to the aliens' armor colors, and they always fought with reckless abandon. Take out the elites, blue one. I'll take care of the grunts, John said. Copy that, sir. Consider it done, Matt replied as he readied his assault rifle. A thin smile touched Matt's lips. He maneuvered around the elite's shots, spun, and then returned fire. The elite's advance stalled, and the grunts began to fall back toward a stand of trees. His threat indicator sounded a warning and a red arrow pointed to the right. Matt drew and primed an M9 HEDP grenade. Matt turned just in time to see another elite, this one in the more senior, scarlet-colored armor, charge him. The grenade was already in hand, and the distance to the target was sufficient, so the soldier let the M9 fly. The grenade detonated with a loud whump and tossed the enemy soldier into the air, while stripping a nearby tree of half its branches. The elite was close now and roared a battle cry. The alien hosed Matt with plasma fire. His shields dropped precipitously. Matt backed away, fired his assault rifle in short controlled bursts, and finally managed to knock the remaining elite off his feet. With their leader down, the grunts broke ranks and began to scamper away. The Master Chief and Matt joined him as they cut the grunts' retreat short in a hail of bullets. Matt eased up on the trigger, felt the silence settle in around him, and knew he had made a mistake. The veteran had damned near blindsided him. How? Matt realized with a start that he was still fighting like part of a unit. Though he was trained to act independently, he had spent most of his military career as part of a team. The elite had managed to flank him because ever since he came back to combat, he was simply accustomed to one of his fellow Spartans watching out for him. They were cut off from the chain of command, alone, and most likely surrounded by the enemy. Matt looked at John. He nodded at him, his face grim behind the mirrored visor. This mission would require a major revision in John's tactics. Sir, do you hear that? Matt asked. I did, the chief confirmed. I think it's coming from this direction. Follow me. They pushed their way up through a meadow thick with knee-high, spiky grass. Matt could hear the distant chatter of automatic weapons fire and knew some marines were somewhere up ahead. The duo sprinted toward the sound of battle. Perhaps they wouldn't be on their own for long. Author's note did you love that chapter? 
I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 35 Survivors Found Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 35 Survivors Found Location Surface of Halo D031426 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock Up ahead Matt saw a light so bright that it seemed to compete with the sun. It originated somewhere beyond the rocks and trees ahead, surged up between the horns of a large ushaped construct, and raced into the sky where the planet threshold served as a pastel backdrop. Was the pulse some sort of beacon, part of what held the ring world together? There was no way for him to know. Cortana had already warned the Spartans that a group of marines had crash-landed in the area, so he wasn't surprised to hear the rattle of automatic weapons fire or the characteristic whine as Covenant Energy weapons answered in kind. The Spartans eased their way through the scrub and onto the hillside above the ushaped edifice and the blocky structures that surrounded it. They could see a group of grunts, jackals, and elites dashing back and forth as they tried to overwhelm a group of marines. We can't go in guns blazing, the chief said. Switch to your pistol. Affirmative, Matt said as he grabbed his pistol. Matt raised his sidearm, activated the 2x magnification, and took careful aim. A series of well-placed shots knocked a trio of grunts off their feet. Before the Covenant forces could locate where the incoming fire had originated, the Spartans opened fire on a blue-armored elite. It took a full magazine to put the warrior down, but it beat the hell out of going toe -to -to with the alien when there wasn't any need to. The quick, unexpected sniping attack gave the Marines the opportunity they needed. There was a quick flurry of fire as the Spartans made their way down the slope. Matt paused to strip some plasma grenades off a dead grunt. The Spartans were welcomed by a friendly private. Good to see you, Commander, Master Chief. Welcome to the party. Matt's reply was a curt nod. Where's your CO, Private? Back there, the Marine said. He turned and called over his shoulder. Hey, Sarge. Matt recognized the tough-looking sergeant who trotted to join them. He'd last seen Sergeant Johnson during a search and destroy run aboard one of Reach's orbital docking facilities. What's your status here, Sergeant? It's a mess, Johnson growled. We're scattered all over this valley. He paused, and added in a quiet voice, we called for evac, but until you showed up, I thought we were done for. Don't worry, Cortana said over John's external speakers, we'll stay here till evac arrives. I've been in touch with AI Wellesley. The Helljumpers are in the process of taking over some Covenant real estate, and one of the Pelicans has been dispatched to pick you up. Glad to hear it, Johnson replied. Some of my people need medical attention. Here comes another Covenant dropship, the private put in. It's time to roll out the welcome mat. Okay, by Senti, Johnson barked. Reform the squad. Let's get to work. Matt looked up and saw that the Marine was correct. Another Covenant landing craft hovered for a moment, then dropped close to the ground. The oddly shaped vehicle dipped slightly, and the mandible structures that formed the bulk of the dropship's fuselage hinged open. A clutch of grunts and an elite dropped to the ground. Matt saw the chief 50 meters to the right and raised his pistol once again. In seconds, a team of marines poured fire into the Covenant LZ and flushed them out. As the aliens scattered and dove for cover, the Spartans put them down one by one. There was a brief respite, and Matt paused to survey the situation. Crystal pulled up the marine positions, tagged them as Fireteam C, and highlighted their locations on his HUD. Several of them had climbed the large structure that dominated the area, and the rest patrolled the perimeter. Matt had just readied his assault rifle when a marine voice called out contact enemy dropship sighted they're trying to flank us. Seconds later, Matt's motion sensor painted a contact, a large one, nearby. He stayed close to a large boulder and used it for cover, then cautiously checked for targets. Stay where you are, blue one, chief said. Get ready to flank them. Wait for my signal. Matt winked his acknowledgement light. The dropship disgorged another contingent of troops, including a trio of jackals. Their distinctive, glowing shields flared as Sergeant Johnson's men and the chief opened fire. Bullets ricocheted as the bird-like aliens crouched behind their protective devices, like medieval footmen forming a shield wall. Behind them, more grunts and a blue elite spread out in an enveloping formation. It was a good tactic, particularly if there were more dropships inbound. Eventually, the Covenant would wear down the Marine defenses and overrun the position. Now the chief said, 
Matt crouched, then sprinted forward into the jackal's line. His assault rifle barked and bullets tore into the exposed aliens. They had barely hit the ground as the Spartan spun, primed a captured plasma grenade, and threw it at the elite, almost 30 meters away. The alien only had time to roar in surprise before the glowing plasma orb struck him in the center of his helmet. The weapon fused to the alien's helmet and began to pulse a sickly blue-white. A moment later, as the alien attempted to tear off his helmet, the grenade detonated. After that, it was a relatively simple matter for the Master Chief to move through the ruins and hunt down the remainder of the Covenant Reaction Force. A welcome voice sounded from his radio receiver. This is Echo 419. Does anyone read me? Repeat any UNSC personnel, respond. Cortana was quick to reply on the same frequency. Roger, Echo 419, we read you. This is Fireteam Charlie. Is that you, Fohammer? Roger, Fireteam Charlie, Fohammer drawled, it's good to hear from you. There was a distant rumbling, and the Spartans turned to identify the source of the noise. In the distance, they saw movement, lifeboats, trailing smoke and fire as their friction-heated hulls tore through the atmosphere. They're coming in fast, Crystal warned. If they make it down, the Covenant will be right on top of them. The chief nodded. Then we should find them first. Fohammer, we need you to disengage your warthog. The master chief, the commander, Crystal, and I are going to see if we can save some soldiers. Roger. The pelican rounded the spire of the alien structure, circled the area once, then hovered above the crest of a nearby hill. Slung beneath the pelican was a four-wheeled vehicle, an M12 LRV warthog. The light reconnaissance vehicle hung beneath the dropship for a moment, then dropped to the ground as Fohammer released it from her craft. The warthog bounced once on its heavy suspension, slid five meters down the hill, then was still. Okay, Fireteam Charlie, one warthog deployed, Fohammer said. Saddle up and give M hell. Roger, Fohammer, stand by to load survivors and evac them to safety, Cortana said. That's affirmative. Fohammer out. As the Marines sprinted for the Pelican, the Spartans made their way to the Warthog. The all-terrain vehicle was mounted with a standard M41 light anti-aircraft gun or LAAG. The weapon fired 500 rounds of 12.7 by 99mm armor-piercing rounds per minute and was effective on both ground and airborne targets. The vehicle was capable of carrying up to three soldiers, and one Marine had already taken his place behind the gun. His rank and ID scrolled across the Spartan's display PFC. Fitzgerald, M. Hey, Commander, Chief Fitzgerald said. Sergeant Johnson said you guys could use a gunner. The chief nodded. That's right, Private. There are two boatloads of Marines on the far side of that ridge, and we're going after them. Fitzgerald pulled the gun's charging lever back toward his chest and released it with a metallic snap. A shell slipped into the first of the weapon's three barrels. I'm your man, Chief, let's roll. Take the driver's seat, blue one. I'll watch your back with Fitzgerald, the chief said. Aye, sir, Matt said as he approached the driver's seat. Matt pulled himself up behind, started the engine, and strapped himself into the seat. While he was doing that, the chief got in the passenger's seat. The engines roared and the wheels kicked up geysers of dirt. The warthog accelerated to the top of the rise, caught some air, and landed with a spine-jarring thump. I put a NAV indicator on your HUD, Crystal said, just follow the arrow. Figures, Matt said, a hint of amusement in his level voice. AIs always were backseat drivers. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 36 Searching for Survivors Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 36 Searching for Survivors Location Surface of Halo D043044 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock The tunnel was huge, plenty large enough to handle a scorpion tank, which meant that the mat had little difficulty steering the warthog through the initial opening. He'd almost missed the entry, at the bottom of a large dry wash. Cortana's sensors had identified the entrance to the tunnel system. It's not a natural formation, she'd warned them. That meant someone built it. Logically, it meant that the tunnel led somewhere, and it might shave precious time off his search for the crashed lifeboats. Once inside, things became a little more difficult as Matt was forced to maneuver the LRV up ramps, 
through a series of tight turns, and right to the very edge of a pit. A quick recon confirmed that the gap was narrow enough to jump, assuming the hog had a running start. Matt backed away. Hang on, he warned and put his foot to the floor. The LRV raced up the ramp, sailed through the air, and jounced to a hard landing on the other side. I'm picking up lots of Covenant traffic, Crystal said. It sounds like Major Silva and the Helljumpers have captured an enemy position. If we can round up the rest of the survivors and find Captain Keys, we'll have a chance to coordinate some serious resistance. Good, the Master Chief answered. It's about time something broke our way. The Warthog's headlights swung across ancient walls as the Spartan turned the wheel, and the LRV emerged into a large open area dotted with mysterious installations. It was dark, the road ended in front of a deep chasm. It wasn't long before Covenant troops emerged like maggots spilling out of a rotting corpse. Plasma fire splashed across the Warthog's windscreen. Matt Dove from the vehicle crouched near the driver's side front tire and drew his pistol. John did the same on the opposite side. Fitzgerald opened up with the LAAG and swept the area with fire. Spent shell casings rained all around them. Matt peered over the edge of the Warthog. They were dangerously exposed. The roadway they'd been using was devoid of cover, elevated roughly three meters above the rest of the massive vaulted chamber. Worse, it bisected the chamber, which left them exposed on virtually all sides. The giant enclosure was dimly lit, visibility was poor and the muzzle flash from the warthog's gun played hell with his night vision. Matt blinked his eyes to clear them, then activated his pistol's scope. The metal floor dropped away to either side, and every surface was engraved with the strange geometric patterns that festooned Halo's mysterious architecture. Set well back from their position were a number of small structures, pillars, and support pylons. The Covenant were dug in among them. A grunt popped out from cover, his plasma pistol glowing green, he'd overcharged the weapon. The little SOBs liked to dump energy into the weapon and discharge it all at once. It drained the weapon damn quick, but it also inflicted hellish damage on a target. A pulsing green-white orb of plasma sizzled past the warthog. The Master Chief returned fire, then dropped back behind the hog. Fitzgerald, he barked. Keep fire on them. We'll move up on the left and take them out. Got it. The triberald gun thundered and firehosed the Covenant position. Matt was prepared to charge ahead and into the fight when his motion sensor painted movement from the rear. The LAAG ceased fire as Fitzgerald yelled in pain and fell from the back of the warthog. The Marine's helmet cracked into the metal floor. A shard of glassy, translucent material, tapered to a wicked point, protruded from the Marine's bicep. The shard glowed a ghostly purple. God damn it Fitzgerald grunted as he tried to regain his footing. Two seconds later, the purple shard exploded, and blood sprayed from the wound. Fitzgerald howled in agony. There was no time to tend to Fitzgerald's injuries. A pair of grunts charged up the slight incline and opened fire. A barrage of the glassy projectiles arced toward them and ricocheted madly from the warthog. I'm going to get Fitzgerald to cover, blue one, the chief said. Give me some suppressing fire. Consider it done, sir, Matt replied. They were too close. Matt fired at the nearest grunt, three shots in succession. A trio of bullet pox formed a neat cluster in the alien's chest. The grunt's partner squealed in anger and brought his gun to bear, an odd, hunchback device with a ridge of the glassy projectiles protruding from it like dorsal fins. The weapon spat pink needles at him. Matt sidestepped and slammed the butt of the pistol into the grunt's head. The alien's skull caved in. He kicked the corpse back down the incline. The chief had dragged Fitzgerald to cover behind the warthog. He was pale but didn't look to be in shock yet. The chief grabbed a first aid kit and expertly treated the wound. Self-sealing biofoam filled the wound, packed it off, and numbed it. The young marine would need some stitches and some time to rebuild the torn, savaged muscle of his arm, but he'd live, if either of them made it out of here alive. You okay? The chief asked the wounded soldier. Fitzgerald nodded, wiped sweat from his forehead with a bloody hand, then struggled back to his feet. Without another word, he manned the LAAG. It took the better part of 15 minutes for the two Spartans and the gunner to sweep the area clear of Covenant forces. Matt patrolled the perimeter. To the left of the Warthog, the chamber stretched roughly 80 meters, then ended, as did the road ahead, in a massive chasm. Any ideas? He asked Crystal. There was a brief pause as the AI examined the data. The roadway ahead ends in a gap, but it's logical to assume that there's some kind of bridge mechanism. 
Find the controls that extend the bridge and we should be able to get across. Chief, permission to go find us a way out here? Matt asked. Permission granted. I'll stay with the Marine, John answered. Matt turned back and crossed the roadway and headed off to the right of the parked warthog. As he passed the vehicle, he called over his shoulder to Fitzgerald. Wait here. I'm going to find us a way across. The chief is going to come back and give you some company. Matt marched across the chamber and checked the odd structures that dotted the landscape. Some were illuminated by the dim glow from some kind of light panels, but there was no indication what powered them or what the structures contained. Matt frowned. There didn't seem to be any sign of mechanisms or controls. He was about to head back to the warthog and backtrack their course, then stopped. He stared at one of the massive pillars that stretched to the ceiling far overhead. There was nothing down here, but perhaps the mechanism he saw was above them. He moved as far to the end of the area as he could. Unlike the opposite side of the chamber, this half was bordered by a high, grooved metal wall. He followed the edge of the barrier and was gratified to locate a gap in the wall, a doorway. Inside, a ramp led up 20 meters, then turned 90 degrees to the left. Matt drew his pistol, activated his helmet lamp, and crept up the ramp. His caution was justified. As he reached the top, his motion sensor showed a contact, right on top of him. He ducked around the corner just in time to meet the charge of a crimson armored elite. The elite growled a challenge and swung a vicious blow at Matt's head. Matt ducked, and his shields took the brunt of the blow. He fired at point-blank range, not even bothering to aim. The elite reared and returned fire and plasma blasts slashed through the narrow corridor. In one fluid motion, Matt drew, primed, and dropped a frag grenade, practically at the elite's feet. The alien warbled in surprise as the Spartan spun and ducked back around the corner. He was rewarded by a flash of smoke and fire. A spray of purple-black blood splashed the metal wall. Matt rounded the corner, pistol at the ready, and stepped over the elite smoking corpse. Matt continued along the corridor, which opened onto a narrow ledge. Directly to his right, the thick metal wall stretched up and out of sight. To his left, the metal sloped away at a steep angle that led back to the main floor and gradually gave way to the yawning abyss as he continued forward. Ahead of him, there was a pulsing glow, like the strobe of a pelican's running lights. Matt stopped at the source of the light a pair of small, Glowing orbs hung suspended above a roughly rectangular frame of blue matte metal. Floating within the frame were a series of pulsing, shifting displays, semi-transparent, like Cortana's holographic appearance, though there was no visible projection device. The display's shimmering geometric patterns nagged at him as if he should recognize them somehow. Even with his enhanced memory, he couldn't place where he'd seen them before. They just seemed familiar. Matt reached a finger out to one of the symbols, a blue-green circle. The Spartan expected his finger to pass through nothing more than air. He was surprised when his finger met resistance, and the panel lights began to pulse more quickly. What did you do? Crystal asked, her voice alarmed. I'm detecting an energy spike. I don't know, Matt admitted. He wasn't sure why he touched the button on the display. He just knew it felt right. There was a high-pitched whine and, from his vantage point, he could see the gap in the roadway in the distance. At its edges, harsh white light sprang into view, forming a path across the break in the road, like a flashlight beam in smoke. The light brightened, and there was a tremendous ripping sound. I'm showing a lot of photonic activity, Cortana said. The excited photons have displaced the air around the light path. Which means, which means, she continued, that the light has become coherent. Solid. She paused, then added, how did you know what control to push? I didn't. Let's get the hell out of here. When he has made his back to the warthog, the chief asked, What did you do, blue one? No idea, chief, he said truthfully. The chief nodded. I believe you. Let's keep moving. The ride across the light bridge was harrowing. Matt had tested the phenomenon with his foot and discovered that it was as solid and unyielding as a rock. Then he'd shrugged, told Fitzgerald and the chief to hang on, and sped the warthog directly at the beam of illumination. Matt could hear Fitzgerald alternate between cursing and praying as they drove over the seemingly bottomless chasm on nothing more than a beam of light. Once on the other side, they followed the tunnel out into the valley beyond, where Matt guided the hog up through a scattering of rocks and trees, to the top of a grassy rise. A sheer cliff threatened to block progress to the right, forcing them to stay to the left, as they headed toward a gap to the south. The vehicle splashed through a shallow river. They saw the mouth of a passageway off to the right, decided that it would be best to investigate, 
and guided the all-terrain vehicle up through a rocky pass. It was only a matter of minutes before the warthog arrived on a ledge that looked out over a valley below. Matt could see a UNSC lifeboat and a scattering of Covenant troops, but no Marines. Not a good sign. A vaguely pyramidal structure rose to dominate the very center of the valley. Matt saw a pulse of light race toward the sky and knew that the structure had to be similar to whatever caused the flash he'd seen earlier. There was only a moment to take in the situation before the aliens opened fire and the gunner replied in kind. It was time to put the hog into motion. Matt drove as the M41 LAAG whirred and rattled behind him. Marine Fitzgerald shouted, you like that? Here, have some more and fired another sustained burst. Beside him, the chief let loose with his assault rifle. A pair of grunts rolled in opposite directions, as a squat, long-armed jackal was cut in half, and the heavy caliber slugs blew divots out of the ground beyond. As the LRV swung past the pyramid, Cortana said, there are some marines hiding up on the hill. Let's give them a hand. Matt aimed for a gap between two trees and saw a tall, angular elite step out from cover. The elite raised a weapon but was quickly transformed into a speed bump as the warthog knocked him down and the huge tires crushed his body. The marines appeared soon after that, holding their assault weapons in the air, and calling greetings. A sergeant nodded. It's good to see you, commander, chief. It was starting to get a little bit warm around here. Covenant forces made a run at the hill after that, but the 12.7 by 99 mm rounds made short work of them, and the slope was soon littered with their bodies. Matt heard a burst of static, followed by Fohammer's voice. Echo 419 to Cortana and Crystal, come in. We read you, 419, Cortana said. We have survivors and need immediate dust off. Roger, Cortana, on my way. I spotted additional lifeboats in your area. Acknowledged, Cortana answered. We're on our way. It took the better part of the afternoon to check the interlocking valleys, locate the rest of the survivors, and deal with the Covenant forces who attempted to interfere. But finally, having rounded up a total of 63 Marines and naval personnel, the Spartans watched Echo 419 land for the last time and jumped aboard. Fohammer looked back over her shoulder. You put in a long day, Commander, Chief. Nice job. Our ETA at Alpha Base is 30 minutes, acknowledged, the chief said. Matt allowed himself to lean back against the bulkhead and added, thanks for the ride. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 37 Silva. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 37 Silva Location Alpha Base D101232 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock The chief came back to the Spartans' quarters about 30 minutes ago after a talk with Major Silva. His shoulders were tensed and face hard, but you wouldn't notice unless you knew the chief as well as Matt did. Matt tried to get him to talk, but he said he would tell him about what happened later. Matt was just about to run routine maintenance check on his armor when a private stuck his head into the Spartans' quarters, a prefab memory plastic cubicle that had replaced the archaic concept of tents. Sorry to bother you, Commander, but Major Silva would like to see you in the command post, on the double. The Spartan wiped his hands with a rag. I'll be right there. Matt was just about to take the armor off standby when the Marine reappeared. One more thing. The Major said to leave your armor here. Matt frowned. Another private had told John the same thing when he had to go meet Major Silva. Matt didn't like to be separated from his armor, especially in a combat zone. But an order was an order, and until he determined what had happened to Keys, Silva was in command. He nodded. Thank you, private. He checked to ensure that his gear was squared away, activated the armor's security system, and buckled an M60 around his waist. The Major's office was located in Alpha Base's CP the centermost of the alien structures at the top of the butte. He made his way through the halls and down a blood-stained corridor. A pair of manacled grunt POWs were hard at work scrubbing the floor under the watchful gaze of a Navy guard. Two helljumpers stood guard outside Silva's door. Both looked extremely sharp for troopers who had been in combat the day before. They favored the Spartan with the casually hostile look that members of the ODST reserved for anyone or anything that wasn't part of their elite organization. The larger of the pair eyed the noncom's collar insignia. 
Yeah, Commander, what can we do for you? Commander Spartan 038, reporting to Major Silva. Spartan 038 was the only official designation he had in the eyes of the military. It occurred to him that, after Reach fell, there was only one person left who knew his name was Matt. Spartan 038, the smaller of the two Marines inquired. What the hell kind of name is that? Look who's talking, McKay interrupted, as she approached the commander from behind. That's a pretty strange question coming from a guy named Yudrasenica. Both of the Helljumpers laughed, and McKay waved the Spartan through the door. Never mind those two, Commander. They're jump happy. My name is McKay. Go on in. Matt said thank you, ma'am, took three steps forward, and found himself standing in front of a makeshift desk. Major Silva looked up from what he was doing and met Matt's eyes. Matt snapped to attention. Sir Commander Spartan 038, reporting as ordered, Sir, the chair had been salvaged from a UNSC lifeboat. It made a gentle hissing noise as Silva leaned backward. He held a stylus which he used to tap his lips. That was the moment when most officers would have said, at ease, and the fact that he didn't was a clear indication that something was wrong. But what? McKay circled around to Silva's left, where she leaned on the wall and watched the scene through hooded eyes. She wore her hair hell jumper style, short on the side so that the tattoos on her scalp could be seen, and flat on top. She had green eyes, a slightly flattened nose, and full lips. It managed to be both a soldier's face and a woman's face at the same time. When Silva spoke, it was as if he could read the Spartan's mind. So, you're wondering who I am, and what this is all about. That's understandable, especially given your elite status, your close relationship with Captain Keyes, and the fact that we now know he has been captured. Loyalty is a fine thing, one of the many virtues for which the military is known, and a quality I admire. Silva stood and started to pace back and forth behind his chair. However, there is a chain of command, which means that you report to me. Not to Keyes, not to Crystal, and not to yourself. The Marine stopped, turned, and looked Matt square in the eye. I thought it would be a good idea for you and me to pull a calm check. So, here's the deal. I'm short a captain, so Lieutenant McKay is serving as my executive officer. If either one of us says, crap, then I expect you to ask, what color, how much, and where do you want it? Do you read me? Matt stared for a moment and clenched his jaw. Perfectly, sir. Good. Now one more thing. I'm familiar with your record and I admire it. You are one hell of a soldier. That said, you are also a freak, one of the last remaining subjects in a terribly flawed experiment, and one which should never be repeated. McKay watched the commander's face. His hair was worn short, not as short as hers, but short. He had serious eyes, a firm mouth, and a strong jaw. His skin hadn't been exposed to the sun for a long time and it was white, too white, like something that lived in the deep recesses of a cave. From what she had heard he had been a professional soldier since the age of six, which meant he was an expert at controlling what showed on his face. But she could see the words hit like bullets striking a target. Nothing overt, just a slight narrowing of the eyes, and tightness around his mouth. She looked at Silva, but if the Major was aware of the changes, he didn't seem to care. The whole notion of selecting people at birth, screwing with their minds, and modifying their bodies is wrong. First, because the candidates have no choice, second, because the subjects of the program are transformed into human aliens, and third, because the Spartan program failed. Matt stood there silently. Are you familiar with a man named Charles Darwin? No, probably not, because he never went to war. Darwin was a naturalist who proposed a theory called natural selection. Simply put, he believed that those species best equipped to survive would do so, while other, less effective organisms would eventually die out. Matt wanted to say that he didn't really care about a man named Charles Darwin, but he remained quiet. That's what happened to the Spartans, chief they died out. Or will, once you're gone. And that's where the ODST comes in. It was the Helljumpers who took this butte, son, not a bunch of augmented freaks in fancy armor. Matt mentally rolled his eyes. When we push the Covenant back, which I sincerely believe we will, that victory will be the result of work by men and women like Lieutenant McKay. Human beings who are razor sharp, metal tough, and green to the core. Do you read me? Matt remembered Linda, James, and all the rest of the 73 boys and girls with whom he learned to fight. All dead, all labeled as freaks, now dismissed as having been part of a failed experiment. He took a deep breath. Sir, no sir. 
There was a long moment of silence as the two men stared into each other's eyes. Finally, after a good five seconds had elapsed, the major nodded. I understand. ODSTs are loyal to our dead, as well. But that doesn't change the facts. The Spartan program is over. Human beings will win this war, so you might as well get used to it. In the meantime, we need every warrior we have, especially those who have more medals than the entire general staff put together. Then, as if some sort of switch had been thrown, the ODSD officer's entire demeanor changed. He said, at ease, invited both of his guests to sit down, and proceeded to brief the master chief on his upcoming mission. The Covenant had Captain Keys, Recon had confirmed it, and Silva was determined to get him back. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 38 Rescuing Captain Keys Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 38 Rescuing Captain Keys Location Pelican Echo 419, in flight, D-171104, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. Recon flights conducted the day before had revealed that the sensors aboard Covenant vessel Truth and Reconciliation might have a blind spot downspin of the alien vessel's current position, where a small mountain rose to block the electronic view. Even more important, Wellesley had concocted an array of signals designed to trick the Covenant technicians into believing that any UNSC dropship was actually one of their own. Fifty meters above the deck, and cloaked in electronic camouflage, Matt, the Master Chief, and a pelican load of Marines waited to find out if their ruse would work. Only time would tell if the fake signals were effective. One thing was for certain though conceived for the express purpose of rescuing Captain Keys, the mission put together by Silva, Wellesley, Crystal, and Cortana bore still another, even more, important purpose. If the rescue team did manage to penetrate a Covenant vessel, and successfully remove a prisoner, the human presence on Halo would be transformed from an attempt merely to survive into a full-fledged resistance movement. The ship shuddered as it hit a series of air pockets, then swayed from side to side as the pilot who referred to herself as Fohammer wove back and forth through an obstacle course, of lowlying hills. Matt took the opportunity to assess the Marines seated around him. Maybe Silva was right, maybe the Spartan program would end with them, but that didn't matter. Not here, not now. The Marines would help him take out the sentries, cope with weapons emplacements, and reach the gravity lift located directly below the truth and reconciliation's belly, and he was glad to have their help. Even with the element of surprise, plus support from the Marines, things were likely to be pretty hot by the time they made it to the lift. That's when a second dropship would land and discharge a group of regular marines that would join the assault on the ship itself. There was some concern that the truth and reconciliation might simply lift at that point, but Crystal and Cortana had been monitoring Covenant communications, and they were convinced that critical repairs were still being made to the alien cruiser. Assuming that they were able to reach the gravity lift, meet up with their reinforcements, and fight their way aboard the ship, all they had to do was find keys eliminate an unknown number of hostels, and show up for the dust-off. A walk in the park. Fohammer's voice came over the intercom. We are five to dirt, repeat five to dirt. That was Sergeant Parker's cue to stand and I his troops. His voice came over the team frequency and grated on Matt's ears. All right, boys and girls, lock and load. The Covenant is throwing a party and you are invited. Remember, the commander and the master chief go in first, so take your cues from them. I don't know about you, but I like having a few swabbies on point. There was general laughter. Parker gave the Spartans a thumbs up, and they offered the same gesture in return. It felt good to have some backup for a change. Matt mentally reviewed the plan, which called for him to insert ahead of the Marines and clear a path with their SRS-99 CS-2 AM sniper rifle and MA-5B assault rifle. John was going to bring a sniper rifle as well but decided against it. Once the outer defenses were cleared, the Marines would move up. Then, once the element of surprise had been lost, Matt planned to switch to his MA-5B assault rifle for the Closian work. Like the rest of the troops, both Spartans were carrying a full combat load of ammo, grenades, and other gear, plus two magazines for the M-19 launchers. Thirty seconds to dirt Fohammer announced. Shoot some of the bastards for me. As the Pelican hovered a foot above the surface, Parker yelled, Go, go. 
Go and the Spartans sprang down the ramp. Matt sidestepped and swept the area. The Marines thundered down the ramp and onto the ground, right behind the two Spartans. It was dark, which meant they had nothing beyond the light reflected off the moon that hung in the sky and the glow of Covenant work lights to guide them to their objective. Seconds later, Echo 419 was airborne again. The pilot turned downspin, fed fuel to her engines, and disappeared into the night. Matt heard the aircraft pass over his head, gathered his bearings, and spotted a footpath off to the right. The Marines spread out to either side as Parker and a three-Marine fire team turned to cover the Group 6. Take point, Blue 1, find a sniping position and tell me what you see, the chief said. Yes, sir, Matt replied. Matt crept along the rocky footpath, which rose to a tunterhigh embankment. As Matt neared a cluster of rocks, Crystal warned him of enemy activity ahead. A host of red dots appeared on his motion sensor. Several meters ahead and to the left was a deep pit, some kind of excavation, judging from the covenant work lights that dotted the area with pools of illumination. He briefly wondered what the aliens were looking for. Matt clicked the rifle's safety off. What they were looking for didn't matter. In the end, he'd make sure they never lived to find it. Matt found a patch of cover next to a tree, raised the rifle, and used the scope's 2X and night optics setting to find the Covenant gun emplacements located on the far side of the depression. There were lots of grunts, jackals, and elites in the area, but it was imperative to neutralize the plasma cannons, known as shades, before the Marines moved out into the open. Matt and John's Mjolnir armor and shields could handle a limited amount of the shades' plasma fire. The Marines' ballistic armor, on the other hand, just couldn't handle that kind of firepower. Chief, I see a lot of grunts, jackals, elites, Matt reported. I see a few shade turrets, as well. Copy that, blue one. Hold your position, I'm on my way to you, the chief said. After 30 seconds of waiting, Matt saw the chief's blip on his HUD. Without taking his eye away from the scope he asked, Master Chief, what are your orders, sir? The chief scanned the area. Take out the turret gunners, then help me finish off the rest. Wait for my signal to fire. Matt winked his acknowledgement light. Once both shades had been located, Matt switched to the 10x setting, practiced the move from one target to the next, and tried it yet again. Fire when you're ready, blue one. Once he was sure that he could switch targets quickly enough, he exhaled quietly, then held his breath. His hand squeezed the trigger and the rifle kicked against his shoulder. The first shot took the nearest gunner in the chest. As the grunt tumbled from the shade's seat, Matt panned the rifle to the right and put a 14.5 mm round through the second grunt's pointy head. The rifle's booming report alerted the Covenant and they returned fire. He moved forward along the low ridge and took a new firing position behind the scaly bark of a tree. The rifle barked twice more, and a pair of jackals fell. He reloaded with practiced ease and continued sniping. Without the shades to support them, the enemy fell in ones, twos, and threes. Matt reloaded again, fired until there were no more targets of opportunity, and made the switch to his assault rifle. He jumped down into the open pit and crouched behind a large boulder, one of several that were strewn around the depression. The chief was to his left, hiding behind another large boulder. Marines move up the chief barked into the radio. In seconds, they charged into the pit. As the lead soldiers entered, a trio of grunts burst from hiding, shot one of the marines in the face, and tried to run. The soldier's body hadn't even hit the ground before Matt and another Marine hosed the aliens with bullets. The gunshots echoed through the twisting canyons, then faded. Matt frowned, there was no way the fracas would go unnoticed. The element of surprise was gone. There was no time to waste. Matt and the chief led the Marines through the depression, up a hill on the far side of the pit, and along the side of a sheer cliff face. Matt stayed close to this rock wall on his right, mindful of the sheer drop that awaited any who strayed too far to the left. He could just make out the glint of moonlight on a massive ocean, far below him. Matt's motion sensor pinged two contacts and John waved the Marines to a halt. Matt crouched behind a clump of brush at the top of the cliff path, conscious of the massive drop on the other side. A pair of jackals rounded the bend ahead, their overcharged plasma pistols pulsing green, and paid dearly for their enthusiasm. Matt sprang from his cover and slammed the butt of his rifle into the nearest jackal's shield. The energy field flared and died, and the force of the blow sent the alien tumbling off the path. The alien screamed and plummeted off the cliff. Matt pivoted and fired his rifle from the hip. The burst struck the second alien in the side. The jackal slammed to the ground as his finger tightened on his weapon's trigger as he died. 
A massive hole blossomed in the rock above Matt's head. Matt slammed a fresh magazine into his weapon and continued to advance. Here's a little something to remember me by, one of the marines growled and shot each jackal in the head. As the team continued up the path, they encountered another shade, more grunts, and a pair of jackals, all of whom seemed to melt away under the combined assault by Matt's sniper rifle, the chief's assault rifle, and the marines' assault weapons, and a few well-placed grenades. The rescue force pressed on, toward the lights beyond. Covenant resistance was determined but spotty, and before long Matt could hear the thrumming sound of the alien ship as it hovered more than a hundred meters above them. His skin crackled with static electricity. In the center of a steep dip in the rock lay a large metal disc, the gravity lift that the Covenant used to move troops, supplies, and vehicles to and from the ring world's surface. Purple light shimmered around the platform where the beam was anchored. Come on the Master Chief shouted, pointing at the lift. That's our way in. Let's move. There was a mad dash through a narrow canyon followed by a pitched battle as Matt, the Chief, and the Marines entered the area directly below the ship. The depression was ringed with shades, and all of them opened fire at once. Matt made use of his sniper rifle to kill the nearest gunner, charged up the intervening slope, and jumped into the now vacant seat. The first order of business was to silence the other guns. Matt yanked the control yoke to the left and the gun swiveled to face a second shade, across the defile. A glowing image of a hollow triangle floated in front of his face. When it lined up with the other gun, it flashed red. He thumbed the firing studs, and lances of purple-white energy lashed the enemy emplacement. The grunt gunner struggled to leap free of his shade, fell into the path of the Spartan's fire, and was speared by a powerful blast. He slumped against the base of his abandoned shade, a smoking hole burned through his chest. Matt swiveled the captured gun and took aim on the remaining shades. He hosed the targets with a hellish wave of destructive energy, then, satisfied that the emplacements were silenced, went to work on the enemy ground troops. Matt had just burned a pair of jackals to the ground when Cortana announced that a Covenant dropship was inbound, and Matt was forced to shift his fire to the alien aircraft and the troops that spilled out onto the ground. The human walked the blue shade fire across the aliens, cutting them down, and pounding what remained into mush. He was still at it when a marine yelled, look at that there's more of them and a dozen figures floated down through the gravity lift. A pair of the newcomers were huge and wore steel blue armor as well as handheld plate armor shields. Matt had faced such creatures before, not long before Reach fell. Covenant hunters were tough, dangerous foes, practically walking tanks. They were slow and appeared clumsy, but the cannons mounted on their arms were equivalent to the heavy weapons a banshee carried, and they could leap into motion with startling suddenness. Their metal shields could withstand a tremendous amount of punishment. Worse, they would never stop until the enemy lay dead at their feet, or they were dead themselves. The marines opened fire, grenades exploded, and the pair of hunters roared defiance. One of them lifted his right arm and fired his weapon, a fuel rod gun. One of the soldiers screamed and fell, his flesh melting. The marine's rocket fired into the air, slid into the grav lift beam, and detonated harmlessly. The hunters lumbered from the grav lift and strode up the edge of the pit. Behind them, a swarm of jackals and elites formed a rough phalanx and peppered the human positions with plasma fire. Sergeant Parker yelled, hit M, marines, and they poured fire onto the massive alien juggernauts. Bullets pinged from their armor and whined through the rocks. Matt swiveled around and heard a warning tone as a hunter's weapon discharged. Burning energy smashed into him. The shade shook under the force of the incoming fire as Matt clenched his jaw and forced himself to bring the targeting reticle down onto the target. His shield bled energy and began to shriek a shrill alarm. The instant the targeting display pulsed red, Matt mashed down the firing studs and unleashed a flood of incandescent blue light. The hunter didn't have time to bring its shield fully into play, and plasma blasts burned through multiple layers of armor and exited through its back. Matt heard a cry of what sounded like anguish as the second alien saw his Bond brother fall. The hunter spun and fired his fuel rod gun at Matt's captured emplacement. The shade took a direct hit, flipped over onto its side, and threw him to the ground. The ground vibrated as the enraged alien charged up the slope, right for the downed Spartan. Matt rolled to his right and came up in a low crouch. The alien was close now, within five meters. A row of razor-sharp spines sprang up along the hunter's back. With his shields depleted, Matt knew that this hunter's sheer strength was a very real threat. He dropped to one knee and unslung his assault rifle. Bullets bounced harmlessly from the alien's armor. At the last second, he dodged left and slid down the slope. 
The hunter didn't anticipate the move, and his enormous shield passed over Matt's head, missing him by mere centimeters. Matt rolled onto his belly and saw his opportunity. A patch of orange, leathery skin was visible along the hunter's curved back. He emptied the MA-5B's magazine into the unprotected target and thick orange blood gout from a cluster of bullet wounds. The hunter gave a low, keening wail, then collapsed in a puddle of his own gore. Matt rose to one knee, fed a fresh magazine into the assault rifle, and scanned the area for enemies. All clear, he called out. The chief and the remaining marines called in all clears as well. That opened the way to the lift and Crystal was quick to seize on the opportunity. She activated Matt's communication system. Crystal to Echo 419. We made it to the gravity lift and are ready for reinforcements. Copy that, Crystal. Echo 419 inbound. Clear the drop zone. What's the matter? Sergeant Parker demanded of his troops, several of whom were looking longingly at the fast-approaching pelicans running strobes. Never seen a UNSC dropship before. Keep your eyes on the rocks, damn it, that's where the bastards will come from. The Spartans waited for Echo 419 to unload the fresh marines, the chief turned to him and said, Good work, Blue One. Matt nodded and headed for the lift pad. Once the marines arrived, the chief waved them forward and joined Matt and the surviving soldiers on the lift pad. Looks like we made it, a private said, just before an invisible hand reached down to pluck him off the surface. Sergeant Parker looked up toward the belly of the ship and said, aren't we the lucky ones? Then rose as if suspended from a rope. Once we're in the ship crystal and I can home in on the captain's command neural interface, Cortana said. The CNI will lead us to him, Crystal added. He'll probably be in or near the ship's brig. I'm glad to hear it, the chief answered dryly. Matt felt the beam pull him upward. Someone else yelled, yeehaw and vanished into the belly of the ship. The Covenant didn't realize it yet, but the Marines had landed. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 39 Belly of the Beast Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 39 Belly of the Beast Location Covenant Ship Truth and Reconciliation D181909 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock The gravity lift deposited the rescue team three feet above the deck. They hung suspended for a moment, then fell. Parker gave a series of hand signals, and the Marines crept forward into the lift bay. The Covenant equivalent of gear crates, tapered rectangular boxes made from the shimmering, striated purple metal the aliens favored, were stacked around the high compartment. A pair of Covenant tanks, wraiths, were lined along the right side of the bay. Matt and John moved forward toward one of the high metal doors that were spaced along the perimeter of the compartment. Parker gave the all-clear signal and the Marines relaxed a bit. There's no Covenant here, one of them whispered, so where the hell are they? The door was proximity activated, and as the Spartans neared the portal, it slid open and revealed a surprised elite. Without pause, Matt tackled the alien and slammed its armored head into the burnished deck plates. With luck, he'd finished the elite quietly enough. Another set of doors flashed open on the other side of the bay, and Covenant troops boiled into the compartment. A second Marine turned to the corporal who'd just spoken. No Covenant, he snarled, mocking his fellow trooper. You just had to open your mouth, didn't you? Inside the Covenant ship, chaos reigned. The Spartans charged ahead, and the rescue team fought their way through a maze of interlocking corridors, which eventually emerged into a large shuttle bay. A Covenant dropship passed through a bright blue force field as all hell broke loose. Fire stuttered down from a platform above. A Marine took a flurry of needles in the chest and was torn in half by the ensuing explosion. A grunt dropped from above and landed on a corporal's shoulders. The Marine reached up, got a grip on the alien's methane rig, and jerked the device off. The grunt started to wheeze, fell to the deck, and flopped around like a fish. Someone shot him. Numerous hatches opened into the bay and additional Covenant troops poured in from every direction. Parker stood up and motioned his men forward. It's party time, he bellowed. He spun and opened fire, and was soon joined by all the rest. Within a matter of seconds what seemed like a dozen different firefights had broken out. Wounded and dead, humans and Covenant alike, littered the deck. Matt was careful to keep his back to a marine, a pillar, or the nearest bulkhead. His Mjolnir armor, 
and the recharging shield it carried provided him with an advantage that none of the marines possessed, so he focused most of his attention on the elites, leaving the jackals and grunts for others to handle. Cortana with the help of Crystal, meanwhile, was hard at work tapping into the ship's electronic nervous system in an attempt to find the best way out of the trap. We need a way out of this bay now, the Master Chief told them, or there won't be anyone left to complete the mission. Matt ducked behind a crate, emptied his magazine into a charging grunt who wielded a plasma grenade, then paused to reload. A hunter gave a blood-curdling roar as it charged into the fray. Matt turned and saw Sergeant Parker fire at the massive alien. A trio of bullets spat from his assault rifle, the last three rounds in the weapon. He discarded the empty gun and backpedaled in an attempt to buy himself some time. His hand dipped for his sidearm. The hunter sprang forward and the edge of the beast's massive shield shredded through the marine's ballistic armor. He crashed to the deck. Matt cursed under his breath, slapped a fresh clip into place, racked around into the chamber, and took aim on the hunter. The alien was coming on fast, too fast, and the Spartan knew he wasn't going to get a kill shot in time. The hunter stepped past Sergeant Parker's prone form. The alien roared again as Matt along with the help of John sprayed it with gunfire, knowing the gesture was futile but unwilling to let the enemy at his teammate's exposed flank. Without warning, the hunter reared up, howled, and crashed to the ground. Matt was puzzled and briefly checked his weapon. Could he have gotten in a lucky shot? Matt heard a cough and saw Sergeant Parker struggling to his feet, a smoking M60 pistol in his hand. Blood flowed from the gashes in his side, and he was unsteady on his feet, but he found the strength to spit on the hunter's fallen corpse. Matt took a covering position near the wounded sergeant. He gave him a brisk nod. Not bad for a marine. Thanks. The sergeant grabbed a fallen assault rifle, slammed a fresh magazine into place, and grinned. Anytime, swab bees. Matt's motion sensor showed more contacts inbound, but they were keeping their distance. Their failed assault on the bay must have left them disorganized. Good, he thought. We need all the time we can get. Cortana, Crystal, John said. How much longer before you two get a door open? Got it Cortana proclaimed exultantly. One of the heavy doors hissed open. Everyone should move through the door now. I can't guarantee that it won't lock when it closes. Follow me the chief barked, then led Matt and the surviving marines out of the shuttle bay and into the comparative safety of a corridor beyond. The next 15 minutes were like a slow motion nightmare as the rescuers fought their way through a maze of corridors, up a series of narrow ramps, and onto the launch bay's upper level. With the AI's guidance, they plunged back into the ship's oppressive passageways. As they proceeded through the bowels of the large warship, Crystal finally gave them good news the captain's signal is strong. He must be close, Matt frowned. This was taking too long. Every passing second made it that much less likely that any of the rescue party would be able to get off the truth and reconciliation alive, let alone with Captain Keys. The Marines were good fighters, but they were slowing him down. The chief turned to Sergeant Parker and said, Hold your men here. I'll be back soon, with the captain. Parker started to protest, then nodded. Just don't tell Silva, he said. The Spartans ran from door to door until one of them opened to reveal a rectangular room lined with cells. It appeared that the translucent force field served in place of bars. He dashed inside and called the captain's name, but received no answer. A quick check confirmed that, with the exception of one dead Marine, the detention center was empty. Frustrated, yet reassured by the two AI's insistence that the CNI signal remained strong, the Spartans exited the room, entered the hall, and literally went door to door, searching for the correct hatch. Once they located it, Matt almost wished he hadn't. The portal slid open, a grunt yelled something Matt couldn't understand, and a plasma beam lashed past the human's helmet. The Spartans opened fire, heard a Marine yell from within one of the cells, Good to see you, Commander. Chief and Matt knew they were in the right place. A plasma beam appeared out of nowhere, hit Matt in the chest, and triggered the armor's audible alarm. He ducked behind a support column, just in time to see an energy beam slice through the spot he had just vacated. He scanned the room, looking for his assailant. Nothing. Matt's motion sensor showed faint trace movements, but he couldn't spot their source. His eyes narrowed, and he noticed a slight shimmer in the air, directly in front of him. He fired a sustained burst through the middle of it, and was rewarded with a loud howl. The elite seemed to materialize out of thin air, made a grab for his own entrails, and managed to catch them before he died. Matt strode to the access controls and, with Crystal's help, killed the force fields. Captain Key stepped out of his cell, 
paused to scoop a needler off the floor, and met Matt's eyes. Coming here was reckless, he said, his voice harsh. Matt was about to explain their orders when Key's expression warmed, and the autumn CEO smiled. Thanks. Matt nodded. Anytime, sir. Can you two find your way out? Keys inquired doubtfully. The corridors of this ship are like a maze. It shouldn't be too difficult, the master chief replied. All we have to do is follow the bodies. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 40 Prison Break Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 40 Prison Break Location Covenant Ship Truth and Reconciliation D192218 Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock It was time to get off the truth and reconciliation. As Covenant troops ran hither and yon, the recently freed Marines armed themselves with alien weapons, then linked up with the rest of the rescue team. Keys, Crystal, and Cortana convened a quick council of war. While the Covenant had us locked up in here, I heard them talking about the Ring World, Keys said, and its destructive capabilities. One moment, sir, Cortana interrupted, I'm accessing the Covenant Batlenet. She paused as her vastly powerful intrusion protocols sifted through the Covenant systems. Information systems seemed to be the one field where human technologies held their own against those of the Covenant. Seconds later, she finished her sift of the alien data stream. If I'm interpreting the data correctly, they believe Halo is some kind of weapon, one that possesses vast, unimaginable power. Keys nodded thoughtfully. The aliens who interrogated me kept saying that whoever controls Halo controls the fate of the universe. Now I see, Crystal put in thoughtfully. I intercepted a number of messages about a Covenant search team scouting for a control room. I thought they were looking for the bridge of a ship I damaged during the battle above the ring, but they must be looking for Halo's control room. That's bad news, Keys responded gravely. If Halo is a weapon, and the Covenant gains control of it, they'll use it against us. Who knows what power that would give them? Commander, Crystal, Chief, Cortana, I have a new mission for all of you. We need to beat the Covenant to Halo's control room. No offense, sir, Matt replied, but it might be best to finish this mission before we tackle another one. Keys offered a tired grin. Good point, Commander. Marines, let's move. We should head back to the shuttle bay and call for evac, Cortana said, unless you'd like to walk home. No thanks, Keys said. I'm Navy, we prefer to ride. The journey out of the detention area and back to the launch bay was hairy but not quite as bad as the trip in. It wasn't long before they all realized that they really could follow the trail of dead bodies back to the launch bay. Sadly, some of the dead wore marine green, which served to remind them out of how many humans the Covenant had murdered since the war had begun more than 25 years before. Somehow, in some way, the Covenant would be made to pay. The tactical situation was made even riskier by the captain's condition. He didn't complain, but both Spartans could tell that Keys was sore and weak from the Covenant interrogation. It was a struggle for him to keep up with the others. As he was taking point, Matt signaled for the team to halt. Keys, out of breath, favored him with a sour look, but seemed grateful for the breather. Two minutes later, Matt was about to signal the group to move forward when a trio of grunts scuttled into view. Needler rounds bounced from the bulkhead and angled right for him. Matt's shields took the brunt of it, and he returned fire, as did the rest of the group. Keys blew one grunt apart with a barrage of the explosive glassy needles. The rest were finished off by a combination of plasma rifle fire and the two Spartans' assault rifle. Let's get moving, Matt advised. He took point and moved down the corridor, bent low and ready for trouble. He'd barely gotten 20 meters down the passageway when more Covenant moved in, two jackals and an elite. The enemy was getting closer, and more determined, the longer they remained. He finished off the jackals with his last frag grenade, then pinned the elite down with assault rifle fire. Keys directed the Marines to fire on the alien's flank, and he went down. We need to go, sir, the chief warned Keys. With respect, we're moving too slowly. Keys nodded, and as a group they sprinted down the twisting passages, stealth abandoned. Finally, after numerous twists and turns, they reached the shuttle bay. Matt thought it was empty at first until he noticed what appeared to be two light wands, floating in midair. Fresh from his encounter with the stealth elite who had been stationed in the brig, 
the mat knew better than to take chances. He drew his pistol, linked in the scope, and took careful aim. He squeezed the trigger several times and put half a clip into the area just to the right of the energy blade. A Covenant warrior faded into view and toppled off the platform. A Marine yelled, watch it and cover the captain as the second blade sliced the air into geometric shapes and started to advance as if on its own. The Spartan put three quick bursts into the second alien, hit his stealth generator, and the elite was revealed. Fire poured in from all sides and the warrior went down. There was a blast of static as Cortana activated the chief's communication relays. Cortana to Echo 419. We have the captain and need extraction on the double. The reply was nearly instantaneous. Negative, Cortana I have a flock of banshees on my tail, and I can't seem to shake them. You'll be better off finding your own ride. Acknowledged, Fohammer. Cortana out. The radio clicked as Cortana switched from the chief's radio to its external speakers. Air support is cut off, Captain, Crystal said. We'll need to hold here until Fohammer can move in. A marine heard the interchange and, already traumatized by the time spent as a Covenant prisoner, began to lose it. We're trapped we're all gonna die. Stow the belly aching, soldier, Keys growled. Cortana and Crystal, if you too, the commander, and the chief can get us into one of those Covenant dropships, I can fly us out of here. Yes, Captain, Cortana replied. There's a Covenant ship docked below. Matt saw the NAV indicator appear on his HUD, followed the arrow through a hatch, down a series of corridors, and out into the troopship bay. Unfortunately, the bay was well defended, and another firefight broke out. The situation was getting worse. Matt slammed his last full clip into the MA-5B and said, Last mag. Copy that, John replied. Matt fired short, controlled bursts. Grunts and jackals scattered and returned fire. The ammo counter dropped rapidly. A pair of grunts fell under Matt's hail of fire. Within seconds, the ammo counter read 00, zero empty. Matt tossed the rifle away and drew his pistol, and continued firing at the alien forces that had begun to regroup at the far side of the bay. If we're going, he called out, we need to go now. The dropship was shaped like a giant U. It rode a grab field and bobbed slightly as some of the outside air swirled around it. As they approached it, Key said, everybody mount up let's get on board and led the marines through an open hatch. The Spartans waited until everyone else had boarded and backed into the aircraft, just in time. Matt was down to a single round in his sidearm. Cortana said, give me a minute to interface with the ship's controls. Key shook his head. No need. I'll take this bird up myself. Captain one of the marines called. Hunters. Matt peered out through the nearest viewport and saw that the private was correct. Another pair of the massive aliens had arrived on the loading platform and were making for the ship. Their spines stood straight up, their fuel rod guns were swinging into position, and they were about to fire. Hang on key said as he disengaged the ship's gravity locks, brought the ship up over the edge of the platform, and pushed one of two joysticks forward. The twin hulls straddled a column, struck both hunters with what appeared to be glancing blows, and withdrew. Even a glancing blow from a ship that weighs thousands of kilos proved to be a serious thing indeed. The dropship's hull crushed the hunter's chest armor and forced it through their body cavities, killing both of them instantly. One corpse somehow managed to attach itself to one of the twin bows. It fell as the dropship cleared the truth and reconciliation's hull. Matt leaned back against the metal wall. The Covenant Craft's troop bay was cramped, uncomfortable, and dimly lit, but it beat the hell out of wandering through one of their cruisers. Nice flying, Captain, Crystal commented. Thank you, Crystal, Keys replied. I'm Navy. We know how to fly. Matt braced himself as Keys put the alien aircraft into a tight turn and accelerated out into the surrounding darkness. He forced his shoulders to relax and closed his eyes. The captain had been rescued, and the Covenant had been put on notice the humans were determined to be more than an annoyance, they were going to be a major pain in the ass. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 41 Beach Landing. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 41 Beach Landing. Location Surface of Halo. D-381525, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. The Spartan duo stood next to the open hatch, 
and waited for Fohammer's signal touchdown hit it. Marines, the Spartans were among the first to step off the ramp, their boots leaving deep impressions in the soft sand. Matt paused for a quick look around, then started downspin to the point where the aliens waited. No sooner had the last member of the landing party disembarked than the pelicans were airborne once more, and flying upspin. Plasma fire stuttered down from the top of a rise as the marines advanced up the sandy slope, careful to fire staggered bursts, so the entire group didn't wind up reloading at the same time. The Spartans ran forward, added their fire to the rest, and sent an elite sprawling to the ground. The Covenant forces were outnumbered for once and the human attackers wasted little time cutting them down. The whole fight lasted only 10 minutes. Time to get moving. Matt reviewed the mission objectives as he surveyed the LZ find and secure a Covenant-held facility, some kind of map room, which the enemy had already captured. The Covenant called the site the Silent Cartographer, which could presumably pinpoint the location of Halo's control room. Keys had been very adamant about the urgency of the mission. If the Covenant figure out how to turn Halo into a weapon, we're cooked. Maybe with Cortana and Crystal's help, they had a good chance of figuring out where the hell the ring's control systems were housed. All they had to do is take it away from an entrenched enemy. Matt heard a burst of static followed by Fohammer's cheerful voice as her pelican swooped back into the LZ area. Echo 419 inbound. Did someone order a warthog? A marine said. I didn't know that you made house calls, Fohammer. The pilot chuckled. You know our motto, we deliver. The Spartans waited for the dropship to deposit the LRV on the beach. The chief jumped into the shotgun seat and Matt climbed up behind the wheel. The soldier manning the gun nodded. Ready when you are, Commander. Matt put his foot on the accelerator, sand shot out from under the vehicle's tires, and the hog left parallel tracks as it raced along the edge of the beach. They rounded the headland in minutes and entered the open area beyond. There was a scattering of trees, some weathered boulders, and a swath of green ground cover. Firing the gunner called and pulled his trigger. The commander saw Covenant troops scurry for cover, steered right to give the three-barreled weapon a better angle, and was soon rewarded with a batch of dead grunts and a badly mangled jackal. Matt drove the warthog uphill, turning to avoid obstacles, careful to maintain the vehicle's traction. It wasn't long before the humans neared the top of the slope and spotted the massive structure beyond. The top curved downward, cut dramatically in and gave way to a flat area where a Covenant dropship had been docked. It appeared that the aircraft had just finished loading it backed out of a Ushup slot, swung out toward the ocean, and quickly disappeared. The noise generated by its engines covered the sound made by the Warthog and provided the defenders with something to look at. The gunner tracked the aircraft but knew better than to open fire and attract unwanted attention. The area beyond was crawling with Covenant troops. Anyone else see what I see? The gunner inquired. How are we supposed to get around that? Matt killed the hog's engine, motioned for the marine to remain where he was, and the Spartans made their way up to a point where a fallen log offered them some cover. The duo drew their pistols, took aim, and opened fire. Four grunts and an elite fell beneath the quick barrage of gunfire. The response was nearly instantaneous as the surviving troops ran for cover and a series of plasma bolts blew chunks of wood out of the protective log. Confident that he and John had whittled the opposition down to a more manageable size, Matt eased his way back to the LRV and pulled himself up into the driver's seat. The Marine waited to see what he would do next. Check your weapons, he advised, as he hit the ignition switch and the big engine roared to life. We have some cleanup to do. Roger that, the gunner said grimly. It looks like we have KP duty again. There was no telling what the Covenant troops expected the humans to do, but judging from the way they ran around screaming, the possibility of an old-fashioned frontal assault just hadn't occurred to them. Matt aimed the vehicle for the front of the complex, spotted the hallway that extended back toward the face of the cliff, and drove straight inside. It was a tight fit, and the warthog wallowed a bit as the big off-road tires rolled over a couple of dead grunts, but the strategy worked. The Marine in the gunner seat and the Chief opened up on the Covenant troops and Matt ran one of them down. Then, once the outer part of the structure had been cleared, Matt parked the LRV where the Marine could provide the Spartans with fire support, and ventured inside. A series of ramps led down through darkened hallways to the antechamber below. It was full of aliens. The Master Chief tossed a grenade in among them, backed up out of the way, and sprayed the ramp with bullets. The grenade went off with a satisfying wham and body parts flew high into the air before thumping to the floor. Cortana said, don't let them lock the doors, too late. The doors noiselessly flashed shut. 
Matt polished off the last of the resistance, checked to confirm that the doors were locked, and was already on his way back to the surface when the AI accessed the suit's radio. Crystal to keys. Go ahead. Crystal. Have you found the control center? Negative. Captain. The Covenant have impeded our progress. We can't proceed unless we can disable the installation security system. Understood, Keyes replied. Use any means necessary to force your way into the facility and find Halo's control center. Failure is not an option. The Spartans were back in the hog and halfway to the LZ by the time the captain signed off. Good luck, people. Keys out. If the front door is locked, then go around back. That's what Matt figured as the LRV rolled back the way it had come, through the LZ. They had just rounded a bluff when Cortana said, look up to the right. There's a path that leads toward the interior of the island. The AI had no more than finished her sentence when the gunner said, freaks at two o'clock and open fire. Matt ran the warthog up a slope, allowed the M41 LAAG to handle the heavy lifting, and positioned the vehicle so the gunner could put fire on the ravine ahead. Tell me something, Crystal, Matt said, as he lowered himself to the ground. How come you're always advising us to go up gravity lifts, run down corridors, and sneak through forests while making no mention of all the enemy troops that seem to inhabit such places? Because I don't want either of you to feel unnecessary, the AI replied easily. For example, given the fact that your sensors are telling both of us that there are at least five Covenant soldiers lying in wait farther up the ravine, it's logical to suppose that there are even more beyond them. Does that make you feel better? No, Matt admitted as he checked to ensure that both of his weapons were fully loaded. Matt charged up the ravine and took cover behind a large outcropping of rock. Plasma bolts melted the stone near his head, and he snapped a quick shot in return. The grunt snarled and dove for cover, as a pair of his partners opened up on the Spartan's position. Behind them, a cobalt-armored elite urged them forward. Matt took a deep breath. Time to go to work, he thought. He sprinted from his cover and his pistol's reports echoed through the narrow ravine. The skirmish took mere minutes. Matt's shield indicator pulsed a warning yet again, and he paused at the top of the ravine to allow it time to recharge. His gun swept the area and noted the circular structure that dominated a small depression at the top of the ravine. His shield had just begun a recharge cycle, feeding off the armor's capacious power plant, when the pair of hunter aliens burst from cover and lobbed fire at Matt's position. The first blast struck him square in the chest and sent him tumbling backward. The second shot was stopped by a thick trunk tree. A trickle of blood pooled in the corner of his left eye. Matt shook his head to clear his blurred vision and rolled to his left. A third shot kicked up a plume of soil where he had lain just seconds before. The chief tossed a frag grenade, counted to three, then sprang to his feet and sidestepped to his right, firing all the way. He'd timed it perfectly. The grenade detonated and the flash and smoke briefly confused the aliens. His rounds bounced from their thick armor plates. In unison, they spun to face them, their weapons glowing green as they charged for another salvo. Another grenade detonated in their path and slowed the hunter's advance. They fired through the smoke and the crash of their weapons thundered through the low ravine. The hunters moved forward, eager for the kill, and realized too late that he doubled back and closed in on them. The Spartans' assault rifles barked and tore into the gaps in their armor at close range. They screamed and died. Matt followed the terrain as it gradually sloped back down to the west. He dealt with a brace of sentries, then located his objective away into the massive structure that loomed above. The human saw a dark, shadowy door slip through the opening. He felt the gloom settle around him. Matt's biochemically altered eyes quickly adjusted to the darkness, and he moved deeper into the structure, pausing only to feed a fresh magazine into his assault rifle. The Spartans hit the bottom of the ramp, saw the alien cargo modules that populated the center of the dimly lit room, and they knew that damn near anything could be lurking among them. Something, instinct, or perhaps only luck, caused Matt's heart to beat a little faster as he put his back to a wall and slid sideways. Something wasn't right. Light filtered in through an ornate window which enabled Matt to see that there was an alcove to his left. He eased in that direction, felt a cold weight hit the bottom of his stomach as he heard movement, and turned toward the sound. The hunter rushed out of the darkness, intent on smashing Matt with his shield. A steady stream of 7.62 mm bullets hammered the hunter's chest plate and slowed his rate of advance. The Spartans saw their opponent start to go down, shot him in the back, and brought the assault weapons back up. The fact that the second hunter already down came as something of a surprise, albeit a pleasant one, and they looked for something else to shoot. Matt's nerves on edge, 
fully expecting yet another attack. The Spartans circled the room, but there was nothing for them to deal with except his own twitchiness and the heavy silence which settled over the room. Nice job you too, Cortana said. Head through the cargo modules, Crystal said. The security center lies beyond. The Spartans followed Crystal's directions, entered a hall, and followed it into a room that featured a small constellation of lights floating at its very center. Use the hollow panel to shut down the security system, Crystal suggested. Go interact with the console blue one. I'll cover you, the chief said. Affirmative, Matt said and eager to complete the job before anyone else could attack them, he hurried to comply. He was again struck by an odd near familiarity with the glowing controls. Crystal used the suit sensors to examine the results. Good, she exclaimed. That should open the door that leads into the main shaft. Now, all we have to do is find the silent cartographer and the map to the control room. Right, Matt replied. That, and avoid capture in unknown territory, already held by the enemy, with no air support or backup. Do you two have a plan? Cortana asked. Yes. When we get there, we're going to kill every single Covenant soldier we find, the chief answered. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 42 Silent Cartographer Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 42 Silent Cartographer Location Surface of Halo D-443819, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. The security system neutralized, the Spartans made their way back through the alien construct and headed toward the surface. Time to find this silent cartographer and complete this phase of the mission. Mayday Mayday Bravo 22 taking enemy fire repeat, we are taking fire and losing altitude. The dropship pilot's strained voice was harsh and grating, the sound of a man about to lose it. Understood, Cortana replied. We're on our way. Then, in an aside to Matt, Crystal said, I don't like the sound of that, I'm not certain they're going to make it. We can still try and save them, the chief said. Let's get moving. Matt nodded in agreement. Matt agreed, and in his eagerness to get topside, made a potentially fatal error. Having just cleared the room adjacent to what appeared to be the Ringworld Security Center, he assumed that it was still clear. Fortunately, the Elite, equipped with another of the Covenant's camouflage devices, announced his presence with a throaty roar just prior to firing his weapon. Plasma fire still splashed Matt's chest, followed by a brief moment of disorientation as he tried to figure out where the attack was coming from. His motion sensor detected movement, and he aimed his weapon as best he could. He fired a sustained burst and was rewarded with an alien scream of pain. As the Covenant warrior fell, Matt made a mad dash for the ramp that led up toward the surface, reloading as he went. Walking into the once-cleared room too quickly had been stupid, and he was determined not to make the same mistake again. The fact that Crystal was there, seeing the world via his sensors, made such errors that much more embarrassing. Somehow, for reasons he hadn't had time to sort out, the human wanted the AI's approval. Silly. Maybe so, if one thought of Crystal as little more than a fancy computer program, but she was more than that. In Matt's mind at least. Matt smiled at the irony of the thought. The human AI interface meant that, in many ways, Crystal was literally in Matt's mind, using some of his wetware for processing power and storage. The Spartans made their way up the ramp, through a hall, and out into bright sunlight. Matt paused on a platform, and dropped to the slope below as Cortana and Crystal cautioned them to keep an eye peeled for Bravo 22. Covenant troops were patrolling the beach below, a mix of jackals and grunts. Matt drew his sidearm, switched to the 2x magnification, and decided to work from right to left. He nailed the first jackal, missed the next, and killed a pair of grunts who were waddling around on top of the mesa opposite his position. As they moved farther down the slope, Matt could see Bravo 22's wreckage, half buried in the side of the mesa. There were no signs of life. Either the crew and passengers had been killed on impact, or some had survived and been executed by the enemy. The possibility made Matt particularly angry. He turned to the right, cut the surviving jackal on the move, and put him down. Matt switched to his MA-5B and made his way down the grassy slope to the sand beyond. It was a short walk to the smoking wreckage and the scattering of bodies. Plasma burns on some of the bodies served to confirm the Spartan suspicions. Though not the most pleasant of tasks, 
Matt knew he had to obtain ammo and other supplies wherever he could, and took advantage of the situation in order to stock up. Don't forget to grab a launcher, Cortana put in. There's no telling what might be waiting for us when we go back to looking for the control room. Matt took the AI's advice and decided to ride rather than walk. The warthog that had been tucked under the dropship's belly had come loose during the final moments of flight, hit the ground, and flipped over on its side. Matt approached the vehicle, reached upward, got a good purchase, and pulled. Metal creaked as the hog swayed, tilted in the Spartan's direction, and started to fall. He stepped back, waited for the inevitable bounce, and climbed up behind the wheel. After a quick check to ensure that the LRV was still operable, he was off. Matt skidded the warthog into a slewing turn, then headed back to the mission LZ, the beachhead the Marines had been left to hold. The Marines had fought off two assaults during his absence, but they still owned the real estate they had originally taken, and remained undeterred. Welcome back, a corporal said as she took her place behind the three-barreled gun. It was getting boring without you. She had a grimy face, the words cut here tattooed around the circumference of her neck, and a short, stocky body. Matt eyed the hastily dug weapons pits and foxholes, the large pile of covenant corpses, and the plasma-scorched sand. Yeah, I can see that. The chief jumped into the passenger seat while Matt got behind the wheel. Matt started the engine tore off across the water. Spray flew up along the left side of the LRV and Matt wished he could feel the moisture on his face. Matt saw the yellow-green fuel rod appear in his peripheral vision, and made the decision to turn toward the enemy both to make the hog look smaller and to give the corporal an opportunity to fire, but he ran out of time. Matt had just started to spin the wheel when the energy pull slammed into the side of the warthog and flipped the vehicle over. All three of the humans were thrown free. Matt scrambled to his feet and looked upslope in time to see a hunter drop down from the structure above, absorb the shock with its massive knees, and move forward. The corporal was back on her feet by then and who had never seen a hunter before, much less gone head to head with one, yelled, Come on chief let's take this bastard out. Matt yelled, no fall back and bent over to retrieve the rocket launcher. Even as he barked the order, he knew there simply wasn't time. The chief might have been able to dodge out of the way in time, but the marine didn't have a prayer. The distance between the alien and the marine and the chief had closed by then and she couldn't disengage. The corporal threw a fragmentation grenade, saw it explode in front of the oncoming monster, and stared in disbelief as the alien kept on coming. The marine raised her weapon and started firing at the hunter. The alien charged right through the flying shrapnel, bellowed some sort of war cry, and lowered a gigantic shoulder. The corporal was still firing when the gigantic shield hit her, shattered half the bones in her body, and threw what was left onto the ground. The chief remained conscious, which meant he was able to lie there and watch as the hunter lifted his boot high into the air, and brought it down on her face. Matt had the launcher upon his shoulder by then and the chief grabbed an assault rifle near him and fired at the hunter to get its attention, but the hunter didn't turn around. Matt hit the firing stud, and a rocket whooshed for the hunter. With surprising agility, the massive alien hunched and sidestepped, and the rocket skimmed past him. It detonated behind the hunter and showered them both with debris. The hunter charged. Matt stepped back, knew there wouldn't be time to reload, and that the next rocket would have to fly straight and true. The surf swirled around his knees as he backed out into the ocean, fought to maintain his footing in the soft sand, and saw the alien fill his sight. Was the target too close? There wasn't time to check. He pulled the trigger, and a second rocket streaked ahead on a column of smoke and fire. The hunter had reached full speed and couldn't dodge in time. The creature's massive feet dug into the soft ground as it tried to alter course to avoid the rocket, to no avail. The 102 mm shaped charge exploded against the very center of the hunter's chest armor, blew through his torso, and severed his spine. There was a mighty splash as the alien creature fell face first into the water. A pool of vibrant orange blood stained the surf around the fallen hunter. Matt took a moment to reload the launcher then slogged back up onto the beach. A distant howl of anguish issued from the other alien's throat. Serves you right, he thought. You only lost one brother. I lost nearly all of mine. Matt felt a pang of sorrow for the dead Marine. He should have anticipated the long-range attack, should have briefed the Leatherneck about the possibility of hunters, should have reacted more quickly. All of which meant that it was his fault that the Marine was dead. That wasn't your fault, Crystal said gently. Now be careful, there's another hunter up on the platform. The words were like a bucket of cold water in the face. Mental combat, that's how his teacher, Chief Mendez, had referred to it, 
always stressing the importance of a cool head. John got to his feet. Let's keep moving, Blue One, he said. We still have work to do. Slowly, methodically, the Spartans worked their way up the slope, killing Covenant soldiers with machine precision. The small groups of grunts were irrelevant. The real challenge waited above. Matt paused, switched to his assault weapon, and waited for the feeling of satisfaction. It never arrived. The Marine was still dead, would always be dead, and nothing would change that. Was it fair that he remained alive? No, it wasn't. All he could do was accomplish what they would want him to do. Forge ahead, find the map, and make their deaths count for something. With that thought in mind, Matt re-entered the complex on foot along with the chief, made their way through halls still slick with alien blood from their last visit, turned down the ramp, proceeded to the lower level, and passed through the door they had worked so hard to open. The Spartans moved into the bowels of the structure. From outside, the spires stood several stories high, which was misleading. The interior of the structure plunged deep below the surface. They wound down a curving ramp. The air was still and slightly stale, and thick pillars of the first large chamber he moved through made the room feel like a crypt. The Spartans slipped through heavily shadowed rooms, padded down spiral ramps, passing through galleries filled with strange forms. The walls and floors were made of the same burnished, heavily engraved metal that they'd encountered elsewhere on the ring. Matt clicked on his light and noticed new patterns in the metal, like the swirls in marble, as if the material were some kind of metal stone hybrid. The tomb-like silence was shattered by the squalling of several grunts and jackals. There was opposition, plenty of it, as the human was forced to deal with dozens of grunts, jackals, and elites. It's as if they knew we were on the way, Cortana observed. I think someone is tracking our progress and has a pretty good idea of where we're headed. No kidding, the master chief replied dryly as he shot a grunt and stepped over the body. I hope we reach the cartographer before we run out of ammo, Matt said. We're close, Crystal said, but be careful. There's bound to be more covenant ahead. The Spartans took Crystal's counsel to heart. Matt hoped that they would find a way to bypass whatever the covenant had in store, but that wasn't to be. As the Spartans entered a large room, Matt saw that two hunters had been assigned to patrol the far side of it. Matt slung his rifle and readied the rocket launcher. It was the right weapon for hunters, no question about that, so long as he didn't allow either one of the monsters to get too close. A rocket fired under those conditions would kill him if it detonated nearby. One of the spined aliens spotted the intruders and bellowed a challenge. The hunter was already in motion when the rocket flashed across the room, struck him in the right shoulder, and blasted him to hell. A second hunter howled and fired his fuel rod cannon. Matt swore as the wash from a slightly off-target plasma bolt set off the audible alarm, and the indicator in the upper right-hand corner of his HUD morphed to red. Matt turned, hoping to put the second hunter in his sight, but the massive alien slid behind a wall. Unable to fire, Matt backed off. The hunter lunged forward, and the deadly arms healed raked across his own already weakened shields. The chief jumped out the way before he could be hit by the shield. Matt grunted in pain as the edge of the shield slammed through his armor's shoulder joint. He felt a sickly tearing as the meat of his arm parted beneath the scalpel-sharp limb. Matt spun, and the spine wrenched free. The master chief felt a rising sense of frustration as he switched to the assault weapon, backed up a ramp, and used his greater mobility to circle behind the alien. Then he had it, a brief glimpse of unprotected flesh, and the opportunity he needed. He put a quick burst into the warrior's back, spun away, and barely escaped a blast from the plasma pistols of the jackals that had dropped into view and opened fire. Matt hurled three grenades over a divider. One of them scored a direct hit, sprayed the walls with chunks of alien flesh, and finally brought the frantic firefight to an end. Working carefully, so as not to walk into an ambush, the Spartans left the large room, found their way onto a downward slanting ramp. The chief backed into a corner and, satisfied that the area was reasonably secure, disengaged the shoulder plates of the Mjolnir armor. Get the wound cleaned, Matt said. I'll cover you. Copy that. The wound was ragged, and blood flowed freely. John could ignore the pain, but the blood loss would take its toll and jeopardize the mission. He made sure the motion sensor was still active, then slung his weapon onto his back. John dug into his equipment pack and drew out his medkit. The Spartan had been wounded before and had on several occasions performed first aid on injured comrades and himself. He quickly cleaned the wound, sprayed a stinging puff of biofoam into the wound, then applied a quick adhesive dressing. In minutes, John had suited up, popped a wake-up stim, and the Spartans moved on. 
Foe hammer to ground team you've got two Covenant dropships coming fast. The Spartans stood at the edge of a massive chasm and monitored their allies' radio chatter. In the distance, Matt could barely see the twinkling of the luminescent panels that Halo's creators had left behind to illuminate these subterranean warrens. Below them, the abyss yawned and appeared to be bottomless. Matt recognized the next voice as belonging to Gunnery Sergeant Waller, the Marine in charge of their LZ. Okay, people, Waller drawled, we got company coming. Engage enemy forces on sight. It'll be easier to hold them off from inside the structure, Cortana put in. Can you get inside? Negative Waller replied. They're closing in too fast. We'll keep M busy as long as we can. Give M hell, Marine, Crystal said grimly, and broke the connection. We'll all be in a tight spot if we don't get out of here before enemy reinforcements arrive. Roger that, the Master Chief replied, as the Spartans pushed their way down a ramp, through a pair of hatches, and into the gloomy spaces beyond. Matt marched over some transparent decking, crossed a footbridge, and killed a pair of grunts he found there, followed another ramp to the floor below, tossed a grenade into a group of enemies that patrolled the area, and hurried through a likely-looking opening. There was a roar of outrage as an elite fired up at them from the platform below while some grunts barked and gibbered. The chief used a grenade to grease the entire group and hurried down to see what they had been guarding. Matt recognized the map room the moment he saw the opening and had just stepped inside when another elite opened upon him from across the way. A sustained burst from his assault weapon was sufficient to drop the alien's personal shields, and he put the alien down with a stroke of his rifle butt. There Cortana said, that hollow panel should activate the map. Any idea how to activate it? Matt asked. No, Cortana replied, her tone arch. You're the one with the magic touch. Matt took a couple of steps forward and reached a hand toward the display. He seemed to know instinctively how to activate the panel, it almost seemed hardwired, like his fight-or-flight response. Matt banished the random thought and returned to the mission. He slid his armored hand across the panel and a glowing wireframe map appeared and seemed to float in front of him. Analyzing, Crystal said. Halo's control center is, she highlighted a section of the map in his HUD, there. Interesting. It looks like some sort of shrine. Crystal opened a channel. Crystal to Captain Keys. There was silence for a moment, followed by Fohammer's voice. The captain has dropped out of contact, Crystal. His ship may be out of range or may be having equipment problems. Keep trying, Crystal replied. Let us know when you re-establish contact. And then tell him that the commander, the master chief, Cortana, and I have determined the location of the control center. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 43 Control Center. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 43 Control Center. Location Surface of Halo. D-502657, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. Matt paused just inside the hatch to ensure that they weren't being followed. He checked to make certain that his weapons were loaded, and wondered where the hell they were. Based on instructions from Cortana, Fohammer had dropped her pelican through a hole in Halo's surface, flown the dropship through one of the enormous capillary-like maintenance tunnels that crisscrossed just below the Ringworld's skin, and dropped the unlikely foursome off on a cavernous landing platform. From there the Spartans felt their way through a maze of passageways and rooms, many of which had been defended. Now, as the Spartan duo walked the length of another corridor, Matt wondered what lay beyond the hatch ahead. The answer was quite unexpected. The door opened to admit cold air and a sudden flurry of snowflakes. It appeared as if he was about to step out onto the deck of a footbridge. A barrier blocked some of the view, but the non-com could see traction beams that served in place of suspension cables, and the gray cliff face beyond. The weather patterns here seem natural, not artificial, Cortana observed thoughtfully. I wonder if the ring's environmental systems are malfunctioning, or if the designers wanted this particular installation to have inclement weather. Maybe this isn't even inclement weather to them, the chief said. Matt, who wasn't sure it made a hell of a lot of difference, not to him anyway, stuck his nose around the edge of the hatch to see what might be waiting for them. The answer was a shade, with a grunt seated at the controls. A quick glance to the right confirmed the presence of a second energy weapon, this one unmanned. Chief, I see two shade turrets. One is manned by a grunt and the other is unmanned, Matt reported. 
Take out the grunt, the chief ordered. I, sir. Then, just as Matt was about to make his move, a pelican appeared off to the left, roared over the bridge, and settled into the valley below. There was a squawk of static, followed by a grim-sounding male voice. This is Fire Team Zulu requesting immediate assistance from any UNSC forces. Does anyone copy? Over. Cortana recognized the call sign as belonging to one of the units operating out of Alpha Base and made her reply. Cortana to Fire Team Zulu. I read you. Hold position. We're on the way. Roger that, the voice replied. Make it quick. So much for the element of surprise, Matt thought. He stepped out of the hatch, shot the grunt in the head, and hurried to take the alien's place on the shade. Matt could hear the commotion the sudden attack had caused and knew he had only seconds to bring the barrel around. Matt swiveled the weapon into position, saw the sight glow red, and pulled the trigger. A grunt and a jackal were snatched off their feet as the ravening energy bolts consumed not only them but a chunk of the bridge as well. All the rest of the enemy forces seemed to melt back into the woodwork. Then, with no clear targets left in sight, Matt took a moment to inspect the bridge. It appeared to have been built for use by pedestrians rather than vehicles, had two levels, and was held aloft by the traction beams he had observed earlier. Snow swirled down from above, hissed when it hit the glowing cables, then ceased to exist. There was movement farther down the bridge deck, which he rewarded with a steady stream of glowing energy. Matt used the plasma like water from a hose, squirting the deadly fire into every nook and cranny he could find, thereby clearing the way. Then, satisfied that they had nailed all the obvious targets, the Spartans jumped to the deck. The bridge was large enough that it featured a variety of islands, turnouts, and pass-throughs, all of which could be used for cover. That cut two ways, of course, meaning that the Covenant had plenty of places to hide. Moving from one bit of protection to the next, the two fought their way across the span, dropping down to the lower level to deal with Covenant forces there, then resurfacing at the far end where they spotted an elite armed with an energy blade. The elite ducked behind a wall. Matt saw Northwest reason to close with such a dangerous opponent if it could be avoided and tossed a plasma grenade over the wall. He heard the startled reaction as the explosive device latched onto the elite's armor and refused to let go. The alien emerged from hiding and vanished in a flash of light. Thankful to put the bridge behind them, the chief activated the hatch. They made their way through the maze-like room beyond and entered a lift. It dropped for a long time before coming to a relatively smooth stop and allowing them to exit. A short passageway took him to a hatch and the battle that raged beyond. As the door opened Matt looked up, saw the bridge directly above, and had a good idea where he was. Then, looking down, he saw a snow-covered valley, punctuated by groups of boulders, and the occasional stand of trees. Judging from the fact that most of the Covenant fire was directed toward the corner of the valley off to their left, the Spartans assumed that at least part of Fire Team Zulu was trapped there. They were under fire from at least two shades and a ghost, but putting up a good fight nonetheless. Matt knew that the heavy weapons offered the greatest danger to the Marines. He sprinted from the protection of the tunnel, paused to shoot the nearest gunner with his pistol, then headed toward the dead grunt's shade. Matt could feel the heat radiating off the weapon's barrel as he jerked the corpse out of the seat and took his place behind the controls. There were plenty of targets, a rather busy ghost primary among them, so he decided to tackle that first. A couple of bursts were sufficient to get the pilot's attention and bring him into range. Both the human and the elite opened fire at the same moment, their reciprocal fire drawing straight lines back and forth, but the shade won out. The attack vehicle shuddered, skittered sideways, and blew up. But there was no opportunity to celebrate as a wraith mortar tank turned its attention to the corner of the valley, lobbed comet-like energy mortars high into the air, and started to walk them toward the marines. Matt sent a stream of energy bolts toward the tank, but the range was too great, and the fire couldn't penetrate the monster's armor. Convinced that he would have to find some other way to deal with the tank, Matt decided to bail out and was 20 meters away when one of the mortars scored a direct hit on the shade he had just occupied. The marines saw them coming and took heart from his sudden appearance on the scene. A corporal tossed them a weak grin, and hooped, the cavalry has arrived, we can sure use your help, that shade has us pinned, another marine chimed in. The soldier pointed and the Spartan saw that the Covenant had dropped a shade onto the top of a huge rock overlooking the valley. The elevation allowed the weapon to command half the depression and even as Matt looked, the gunner continued to pound the area where fire team Zulu had taken refuge. The marine's warthog had flipped, spilling supplies out onto the ground. Matt paused to grab a rocket launcher but knew the range was extreme, 
and that it would pay to get closer. So Matt slung the launcher across his back, checked the load on his assault weapon, and moved into the trees. A party of grunts made a run at the Marines, and were pushed back even as the Spartan spotted a likely-looking tree trunk. He moved up, killed the jackal that lurked behind the tree cover, then brought the launcher up to his shoulder. The shade winked blue light as Matt peered through the sight, increased the magnification, and saw the gun leap toward him. Then, careful to hold the tube steady, he fired. There was an explosion on top of the rock, and the shade toppled off the side of a cliff. The Marines cheered, but the Spartans had already shifted priorities. Matt ran for the driver's seat, Hog while John ran for the passenger seat. A mortar exploded behind Matt and blew the tree cover he'd just vacated into splinters. A Marine screamed as a meter-long shard of wood penetrated his abdomen and nailed him to the ground. Matt grabbed hold of the warthog's bumper, then used his armor's strength enhancements to flip it back onto its tires. One Marine jumped aboard and manned the LAAG, and the chief jumped into the passenger seat. Snow sprayed out from behind both of the rear tires as Matt put his foot down, felt the hog break loose, and steered into the skid. The sudden movement gave their position away to the wraith. It belched, and a comet arced their way and slid sideways across the center of the valley as if to block the humans from reaching the other end. Matt saw the fireball, raced to pass under it, and heard the LAAG open up as the range to the wraith began to close. But there was an infantry screen to penetrate before they could dance with the tank, and both the LAAG gunner and the chief in the passenger seat were forced to deal with a screen comprised of elites, jackals, and grunts as Matt slammed on the brakes, backed out of a crossfire, and turned to provide them with a better angle. The M41 roared as it sent hundreds of rounds downrange, plucked grunts like flowers, and hurled them back into the bloodied snow. The Marine in the gunner seat yelled, You want me? You want some of this? Come and get it as he opened fire with M41 on an elite. The Twonda Half Maturtle warrior staggered under the impact and fell over backward. He wasn't dead, however, not yet, not until the front of the warthog sucked him under and spit chunks out the back. Then they were through the screen, and more important, inside the dead area where the wraith couldn't fire mortars without risking dropping them on itself. That was the key, the factor that made the attack possible. Matt braked on a patch of ice, and felt the hog start to slide. Hit him he ordered. The gunner, who couldn't possibly miss at that range, opened fire. There was an ear-splitting roar as large caliber rounds pounded the side of the tank. Some glanced off, others shattered, but none of them managed to penetrate the wraith's thick armor. Watch out John exclaimed. The bastard is trying to ram. Matt, who had just managed to bring the warthog to a stop, saw that the chief was correct. The tank surged forward, and was just about to crush the LRV, when the Matt slammed the lighter vehicle into reverse. All four wheels spun as the hog backed away, guns blazing, suddenly on the defensive. Then, having opened what he hoped was a sufficient gap, he braked. Matt slammed the shifter forward and swung the wheel to the right. The vehicles were so close as they passed each other that the wraith scraped the hog's flank, hard enough to tip the left side wheels off the snowy ground. They hit with a thump, the LAAG came off to get, and the gunner brought it to bear again. Hammer it from behind, Matt yelled. It might be weaker there. The gunner obeyed and was rewarded with a sharp explosion. A thousand pieces of metal flew up into the air, turned lazy circles, and drifted downward. Black smoke boiled up out of the wreckage. What remained of the tank slammed into a boulder, and the battle was over. The valley belonged to Fire Team Zulu. The combined intelligences the two AIs revealed there were other valleys, all connected by one means or another, and the Spartans would have to negotiate every one of them in order to reach their objective. A drop-off prevented the Spartans from taking the warthog any farther. Matt bailed out and made his way through the snow along with the chief. A cold wind whistled past Matt's visor and snowflakes dusted the surface of his armor. Damn, one of the marines remarked, I forgot my mittens. Stow the BS, a sergeant growled. Watch those trees, this ain't no picnic. Strangely, Matt felt very calm. Right then, right there, he was home. Finally, after battling their way through wintry valleys, twisting passageways, and maze-like rooms, the Spartans opened still another hatch and peered outside. Matt saw snow, the base of a large construct, and a ghost which patrolled the area beyond. The entrance to the control center is located at the top of the pyramid, Cortana said. Let's get up there. We should commandeer one of those ghosts, we're going to need the firepower. The Spartans believed her, but as they stepped through the hatch, and more ghosts appeared and began shooting at him, 
none of the pilots seemed ready to surrender their machines. Matt destroyed one of them with a long, controlled burst from his assault rifle, then scurried up through a jumble of boulders and perched on one of the pyramid's long, sloping skirts. From his new position, Matt saw a hunter patrolling the area above and wished he had a rocket launcher. He might as well have wished for a scorpion tank. The pyramid's support structures offered some cover, which allowed the master chief to climb unobserved and toss a fragmentation grenade at the monster above. It went off with a loud crack, peppered the alien's armor with shrapnel, and generally pissed him off. Alerted now, the hunter fired his fuel rod cannon, just as the chief hurled a plasma grenade and hoped his aim was better this time. The energy pulse missed, the grenade didn't, and there was a flash of light as the Covenant warrior went down. It was tempting to run for the top, but if there was one lesson the Spartans had learned over the last few days it was that hunters traveled in pairs. Rather than leave such a potent enemy guarding their six, the mat climbed up to the first level, ducked around the wall that separated one side of the pyramid from the next, and took a peek. Sure enough, there was hunter number two, gazing downslope, unaware of the fact that his bond brother was dead. The human put a burst into the alien's unprotected back. The spined warrior fell and slid, face first, to the bottom of the structure. The Spartans worked their way farther up, zigzagging back and forth across the front of the massive pyramid while an extremely determined banshee pilot tried to bag them from above, and all manner of grunts, jackals, and elites emerged to try and block their progress. Matt took a deep breath and continued his climb. At the top of the pyramid, Matt paused and allowed his long-suffering shield system to recharge. He stepped over the fallen body of a grunt and loaded his last clip into the assault rifle. A huge door fronted the top level. There was no way to tell what waited on the other side, but it wasn't likely to be friendly, a series of motion sensor traces ghosted at the edge of the device's range. What's the plan? Cortana inquired. Simple, the chief said. Follow my lead, blue one. Matt winked his acknowledgement light. The chief took a deep breath, hit the switch, spun on his heel, and ran. Matt followed closely behind. It was about 20 meters back to the shade, and the chief covered the distance in seconds. Once at the controls he swiveled the barrel around just in time to see the doors part and a horde of Covenant soldiers pour out. The shade was up to the job. Just as quickly as they appeared, the aliens died. The chief dismounted once again and they continued on. The Spartans entered a large, hangar-like space, took the time required to deal with stragglers, and activated the next set of doors. Scanning, Cortana said. Covenant forces in the area have been eliminated. Nicely done. Let's move on to Halo's control center. They made their way through the doors and out onto an immense platform. A gleaming reflective bridge, apparently without supports, extended over a vast emptiness and ended in a circular walkway. In the center of this walkway was a moving holographic model of Threshold a gas giant, the small gray moon basis in orbit around it, and suspended between the two, the tiny shining ring of Halo itself. Outside of the walkway, stretching almost to the edges of the enormous space, was another model of Halo, this one hundreds of meters across, displaying as it rotated a detailed map of the terrain on its inner surface. The span lacked any kind of railing as if to remind those who passed over it of the dangers attendant to the power they were about to encounter. Or so it seemed to the mat. This is it. Halo's control center, Crystal said as the Spartans approached a large panel. It was covered with glyphs, all of which glowed as if lit from within, and went together to form what looked like a piece of abstract art. That terminal, Cortana said. Try there. The chief reached out to touch one of the symbols, then stopped. The chief felt Cortana's presence dwindle in his mind as she transmitted herself into the alien computer station. A moment later, she appeared over the control panel. Data scrolled across her body, energy seemed to radiate out of her holographic skin, and her features were alight with pleasure. Cortana's skin shifted from blue to purple, to red, then cycled back as she gazed around the room and sighed. Are you all right? The master chief inquired. He hadn't expected this. Never been better Cortana affirmed. You can't imagine the wealth of information, so much, so fast. It's glorious. So, Matt asked, what sort of weapon is it? Cortana looked surprised. What are you talking about? Let's stay focused, the chief said. Halo. How do we use it against the covenant? The image of Cortana frowned. Suddenly her voice was filled with disdain. This ring isn't a cudgel, you barbarians, it's something else. Something much more important. The Covenant were right, this ring. She paused, 
and her eyes moved back and forth as she scanned the tidal wave of data she now accessed. A puzzled look flashed across her face. Forerunner, she muttered. Give me a moment to access. A moment later, she began to speak, and her words rushed out in a flood as if the constant stream of new information was sweeping her along. Yes, the Forerunners built this place, what they called a fortress world, in order to. Matt had never heard the AI talk like that before, didn't like being referred to as a barbarian, and was about to cut her down to size when she spoke again. Plainly alarmed, her voice had a hesitant quality. No, that can't be. Oh, those covenant fools, they must have known, there must have been signs. The chief frowned. Slow down. You're losing us. Cortana's eyes widened in horror. The covenant found something, buried in this ring, something horrible. Now they're afraid. Something buried? Matt asked. Cortana looked off into the distance as if she could actually see keys. Captain, we've got to stop the captain. The weapons cache he's looking for, it's not really, we can't let him get inside. We don't understand, Matt said. There's no time, Cortana said urgently. Her eyes were neon pink and they focused on the Spartans like twin lasers. I have to remain here. Get out, find keys, stop him. Before it's too late. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 44 Not the Covenant. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 44 Not the Covenant. Location Pelican Echo 419, Approaching Covenant Arms Cache, D583631, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock, Echo 419's engines roared as the Pelican descended through the darkness and rain into the swamp. The surrounding foliage whipped back and forth in response to the sudden turbulence, the water beneath the transport's metal belly was pressed flat, and the stench of rotting vegetation flooded the aircraft's cargo compartment as the ramp splashed into the evil-looking brew below. Fohammer was at the controls and it was her voice that came over the radio. The last transmission from the captain's ship was from this area. When you locate Captain Keys, radio in and I'll come to pick you up. The Spartans stepped down off the ramp and immediately found themselves calf deep in oily looking water. Be sure to bring us some towels, Matt said. The pilot laughed, fed more fuel to the engines, and the ship pushed itself up out of the swamp. The Spartans checked their threat indicators, found nothing of concern, and allowed the swamp to close in around them. Make friends with your environment. That's what Chief Mendez had told them many years ago, and the advice had served them well. By listening to the constant patter of the rain, feeling the warm humid air via his vents, and seeing the shapes natural to the swamp, the Spartans would know what belonged and what didn't. The knowledge that could mean the difference between life and death. Satisfied that they were attuned to the environment around them and hopeful of gaining a better vantage point, they climbed a slight rise. The payoff was immediate. The pelican had gone in less than 60 meters from the spot where Echo 419 had dropped them off, but the surrounding foliage was so thick Fohammer had been unable to see the crash. Sight from the air. Hmm. Judging from the damage, it looks like a possible mechanical failure either that or the Covenant brought it down, Crystal observed. Perhaps you're right, Matt said. Let's go check it out, John said. The Spartans moved in to inspect the wreckage. Judging from appearances, and the fact that there weren't many bodies lying around, the ship had crashed during takeoff, rather than on landing. The impression was confirmed when he discovered that while they were dressed in fatigues, all of the casualties wore naval insignia. That suggested that the dropship had landed successfully, discharged all of its marine passengers, and was in the process of lifting off when a mechanical failure or enemy fire had brought the aircraft down. Satisfied that they had a basic understanding of what had taken place, the Spartans were about to leave when Matt spotted a few shotguns lying next to one of the bodies. Deciding it might come in handy, Matt grabbed one, slipped the sling over his right shoulder. He tossed the other to the chief. There might covenant in the area, Crystal cautioned. Stay alert. They followed a trail of bootprints away from the pelican and toward the glow of portable work lights, the same kind of lights they'd seen in the area around the truth and reconciliation. The aliens were certainly industrious, especially when it came to stealing everything that wasn't nailed down. As if to confirm Crystal's theory regarding Covenant activity in the area, it wasn't long before the Spartan came across a second wreck, a Covenant dropship this time, 
bows down in the swamp muck. Aside from swarms of moth-like insects and the distant chirp of swamp birds, there were no signs of life. Cargo containers were scattered all around the crash site, which raised an interesting question. When the transport nosed in, were the aliens trying to deliver something, weapons perhaps, or taking material away? There was no way to be certain. Whatever the case, there was a strong likelihood that keys had been attracted to the lights, just as they had, followed them to the crash site, and continued from there. With that in mind, the Spartan swung past a tree that stood on thick, spider-like roots, followed a trail up over a rise, and spotted a lone jackal. Take it out, the chief ordered. Without hesitation, Matt snapped the assault rifle to his shoulder and brought the alien down with a burst. Matt crouched, waiting for the inevitable counterattack, which never came. Curious. Given the lights, the crash site, and the scattering of cargo modules, he would have expected to run into more opposition. A lot more. So where were they? It didn't make sense. Just one more mystery to add to their growing supply. The rain pattered against the surface of his armor, and swamp water sloshed around his boots as the Spartans pushed their way through some foliage and suddenly came under fire. For one brief moment, it seemed as if Matt's latest question had been answered, that Covenant forces were still in the area, but the opposition soon proved to be little more than a couple of hapless jackals, who, upon hearing the sound of gunfire, had come to investigate. As usual, they came in low, crouching behind their shields, so it was almost impossible to score a hit from directly in front of them. Matt shifted position, found a better angle, and fired. One jackal went down, but the other rolled, and that made it nearly impossible to hit him. The Spartan held his fire, waited for the alien to come to a stop, and cut him down. They worked their way up the side of a steep slope, and then Matt spotted a shade sighted on top of the ridge. It commanded both slopes, or would have, had someone been at the controls. They paused at the top of the ridge and considered their options. One of you could jump on the shade, hose the ravine below, and thereby let everyone that we've arrived or we slip down the slope, and try to infiltrate the area more quietly, Crystal said. The Spartans settled on the second option, started down the slope in front of them, and were soon wrapped in mist and moist vegetation. Not too surprisingly, some red dots appeared on the Spartans' threat indicator. Rather than go around the enemy, and expose their six, the Spartans decided to seek them out. Matt slung the MA-5B and drew out the shotgun, better suited for close-up work. He pumped the slide, flicked off the safety. The chief did the same. After that, they moved on. Broad variegated leaves caressed their shoulders, vines tugged at the barrel of the shotgun, and the thick half-rotten humus of the jungle floor gave way under the Spartans' boots as they made their way forward. The grunt perhaps heard a slight rustling, debated whether to fire, and was still in the process of thinking it over when the butt of Matt's shotgun descended on his head. There was a solid thump as the alien went down, followed by two more, as more methane breathers rushed to investigate. Satisfied with their progress so far, the Spartans paused to listen. There was the gentle patter of rain on wide, welcoming leaves, and the constant sound of their own breathing, but nothing more. To your right, that structure. That's probably the direction the captain went, Crystal said. Confident that the immediate perimeter was clear, the Spartans turned their attention to the forerunner complex that loomed off to their right. Unlike the graceful spires of other installations, this one appeared squat and vaguely arachnid. They crept down onto the flat area immediately in front of it. Matt decided that the entrance reminded him of a capital A, except that the top was flat, and was bracketed by a pair of powerful floodlights. Was this what Keyes had been looking for? Something caught his eye, a pair of 8-gauge shotgun shells, and a carelessly discarded protein bar wrapper tossed near the entrance. They must be getting closer. Once through the door, they came across a half-dozen Covenant bodies lying in a pool of commingled blood. Struck once again by the absence of serious opposition, the mat knelt just beyond the perimeter established by the blood and peered at the bodies. What happened here? Crystal questioned. I don't know, but I have a feeling we're going to find out soon enough, Matt replied. I agree, John said. Had the Marines killed them? No, judging from the nature of their wounds it appeared as if the aliens had been hosed with plasma fire. Friendly fire perhaps. Humans armed with covenant weapons. Maybe, but neither explanation really seemed to fit. Perplexed, Matt stood, took a long, slow look around, and the Spartans pushed deeper into the complex. In contrast with the swamp outside, where the constant drip, drip, drip of the rain served to provide a constant flow of sound, it was almost completely silent within the embrace of the thick walls. 
The sudden sound of machinery startled Matt, and he spun and brought the shotgun to bear. Summoned by some unknown mechanism, a lift surfaced right in front of him. With nowhere else to go, the Spartan stepped aboard. As the platform carried them downward a group of overlapping red dots appeared on their motion sensors, and the Spartans knew they were about to have company. There was a screech of tortured metal as the lift came to a stop, but rather than rush them as they expected them to, the dots remained stationary. They had heard the lift many times before, Matt reasoned, and figured it was loaded with a group of their friends. That suggested Covenant, stupid Covenant. His favorite kind, in fact, apart from the dead kind. Careful to avoid the sort of noise that might give them away, Matt completed a full circuit of the dimly lit room and discovered that the dots were actually grunts and jackals, all of whom were clustered around a hatch. The chief suppressed a grin, slung the shotgun, and unlimbered the assault rifle. Their punishment for not guarding the lift consisted of a grenade, followed by fortinine rounds of automatic fire, and a series of shorter bursts to finish them off. The hatch opened onto a large four- or five-astree-high room. The Spartans found themselves on a platform along with a couple of unsuspecting jackals. They immediately killed them, heard a reaction from the floor below, and moved to the right. A quick peek revealed a group of seven or eight Covenant, milling around as if waiting for instructions. The non-com dropped an M9 HEDP calling card into their midst. Both Spartans took a step back to avoid getting hit by the resulting fragments, and heard a loud whim as the grenade detonated. There were screams, followed by wild firing. The Spartans waited for the volume of fire to drop off and moved forward again. A series of short controlled bursts was sufficient to silence the last Covenant soldiers. The Spartans jumped down off the platform to check the surrounding area. Still looking for clues as to where Keys might have gone, the Spartans conducted a quick sweep of the room. It wasn't long before Matt picked up some plasma grenades, circled a cargo container, and came across the bodies. Two Marines, both killed by plasma fire, their weapons missing. Matt cursed under his breath. The fact that both dog tags had been taken suggested that Keyes and his team had run into the Covenant just as he had, taken casualties, and pushed on. Certain they were on the right trail, the Spartans crossed the trough-like depression that split the room in two, and was forced to step over and around a scattering of Covenant corpses as they approached the hatch. Once through the opening negotiated their way through a series of rooms, all empty, but painted with Covenant blood. Finally, just as Matt was beginning to wonder if they should turn back, the Spartans entered a room and found themselves face-to-face -face with a fear-crazed Marine. His eyes jerked from side to side as if seeking something hidden within the shadows, and his mouth was twisted into a horrible grimace. There was no sign of the soldier's assault weapon, but he had a pistol, which he fired at a shadow in the corner. Stay back, stay back, you're not turning me into one of those things. Matt raised a hand, palm out. Put the weapon down, Marine, we're on the same side but the Marine wasn't having any of that and pressed his back against the solidity of the wall. Get away from me, don't touch me, you freak I'll die first. The pistol discharged. Matt felt the impact as the 12.7mm slug rocked him back onto his heels, and the pair decided that enough was enough. Before the Marine had time to react, the Chief snatched the M60 out of his hand. I'll take that, he growled. The Marine leaped to his feet, but the chief planted his feet and gently but firmly shoved the soldier back to the floor. Now, the chief said, where is Captain Keyes, and the rest of your unit? The private turned fierce, his features contorted, spittle flying from his lips. Find your own hiding place, he screamed. The monsters are everywhere, God. I can still hear them, just leave me alone. What monsters? Matt asked gently. The Covenant. No, not the Covenant. Them. That was all the Spartans could get from the crazed Marine. The surface is back that way, the Master Chief said, pointing toward the door. I suggest that you reload this weapon, quit wasting ammo, and head topside. Once you get their hunker down and wait for help, there'll be a dust off later on. Do you read me? The private accepted the weapon but continued to blather. A moment later he curled into a fetal ball, whimpered, then fell silent. The men would never make it out alone. One thing was clear from the lone Marine's ramblings. Assuming that Keyes and his troops were still alive, they were in a heap of trouble. That left the Spartans with little choice, they had to put the greatest number of lives first. The young soldier had clearly been through the ringer, but he'd have to wait for help until the Spartans completed their mission. Slowly, reluctantly, Matt turned to investigate the rest of the room. The remains of a badly shattered ramp led up over a small fire toward the walkway on the level above. Matt felt heat wash around him as he stepped over a dead elite, 
took comfort from the fact that the body had been riddled with bullets and made his way up onto a circular gallery. From there, the Spartans proceeded through a series of doorways and mysteriously empty rooms until they arrived at the top of a ramp where a dead marine and a large pool of blood caused them to pause. Matt had long ago learned to trust his instincts, and they nagged at him now. Something felt wrong. It was quiet, with only a hollow booming sound to disturb the otherwise perfect silence. They were close to something, he could feel it, but what? Something isn't right here, Crystal observed. That marine's vital signs were all over the place. I agree, Matt said as he felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand rigid straight. It's quiet in here, too quiet. Stay frosty, John said. We don't know what's in this place. Copy that, Matt replied. The Spartans descended the ramp. They arrived on the level spot at the bottom and saw the hatch to their left. Weapons at the ready, they cautiously approached the metal barrier. The door sensed their presence, slid open, and dumped a dead marine into the chief's arms. The chief felt his pulse quicken as he bent slightly to catch the body before it crashed into the ground. He held the MA-5B one-handed and covered the room beyond as best he could, searching for a target. Nothing. Matt stepped forward, then spun on his heel and pointed the gun back the way they'd come. Damn it, it felt like eyes bored into the back of his head. Someone was watching them. Matt motioned for the chief to enter the room while he covered their six. After the chief entered the room, Matt backed into the room, and the door slid shut. The chief lowered the body to the ground, then stepped away. The toe of his boot hit some empty shell casings which rolled away. That's when he realized that there were thousands of empties, so many that they very nearly carpeted the floor. Matt noticed a marine helmet and bent to pick it up. A name had been stenciled across the side. Jenkins. A vidchem was attached, the kind worn by the typical combat team so they could critique the mission when they returned to base, feed data to the ghouls and intelligence and on occasions like this one, provide investigators with information regarding the circumstances surrounding their deaths. Chief, get that memory chip and watch it. I'll watch your back, Matt said as he tossed him the helmet. Understood, John said. The chief removed the camera's memory chip, slotted the device into one of the receptacles on his own helmet, and watched the playback via a window on his HUD. As Matt was keeping an eye on his motion indicator, he heard the chief rip the memory chip out of his helmet. Chief what happened? Crystal asked worriedly. Your vitals have spiked. What did you see on that memory chip, Chief? Matt asked. We need to get out here, the Chief replied. Now. As Matt stood there, gripped by a growing sense of dread at what the Chief said, he saw a flash of white from the corner of his eye. He turned to face it, and that was when he saw one, then five, twenty, fifty of the fleshy creatures dribble into the room, pirouette on their tentacles, and dance his way. His motion sensor painted a sudden explosion of movement, speeding closer by the second. The Spartans fired at the ugly-looking creatures. Those which were closest popped like air-filled balloons, but there were more, many more, and they rolled toward him over the floor and walls. The Spartans opened up in earnest, the obscene-looking predators threw themselves forward, and the battle was joined. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 45 Monsters. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 45 Monsters. Location inside Forerunner Structure. D591149, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. The Spartans fired into what seemed like a tidal wave of tentacled horrors, backed away, and resolved to keep moving. They were vulnerable, in particular from behind, but the armor would help, especially since the monsters liked to jump on people. What happened next wasn't clear, but could make Marines scream, and put them out of action in a relatively short period of time. Ammo would be a concern, he knew that. So rather than fire wildly, the two Spartans forced themselves to aim, trying to pop as many of the things as he could. They came at the Spartans in twos, threes, and fours, flew into fleshy bits as the bullets ripped them apart and seemed to melt away. The problem was that there were hundreds of the little bastards, maybe thousands, which made it difficult to keep up as they flooded in their direction. There were strategies, though, things the Spartans could do to help even the odds, and they made all the difference. The first was to run, firing as they went, stretching their ragged formation thin, forcing them to skitter from one end of the room to the other.
They were numerous and determined, but not particularly bright. The second was to watch for breakouts, concentrations of the creatures where a well-thrown grenade could destroy hundreds of them all at once. And the third was to switch back and forth between the assault weapon and the shotgun, thereby maintaining a constant rate of fire, only pausing to reload when there was a momentary lull in the fighting. These strategies suddenly became even more critical as something new leaped out of the darkness. A mass of tattered flesh and swinging limbs lashed at Matt's head. During the first moments of the attack Matt wondered if a corpse had somehow fallen on him from above, but soon learned the truth, as more of the horribly misshapen creatures appeared and hurled themselves forward. Not just ran, but vaulted high into the air, as if hoping to crush him under their weight. The creatures were roughly humanoid, hunchbacked figures that looked partially rotted. Their limbs seemed to be stretched to the breaking point. Clusters of tentacles protruded from ragged holes in their skin. They were susceptible to bullets, however, something for which the Spartans were thankful, although it often took 15 or 20 rounds to put one down for good. Strangely, even the live ones looked like they were dead, which on reflection the Spartans were starting to believe they were. That would explain why some of the ugly sons of bitches had a marked resemblance to Covenant elites, or to what an elite would look like if you killed him, buried the body, and dug it up two weeks later. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, two of the reanimated elites barged in through the hatch and were promptly put down. That provided the Spartans with an opportunity to escape. Crystal, is there any way out of here? Matt asked frantically. Scanning, found one there's an elevator platform nearby. Marking it out your HUDs, Crystal replied. A second later a NAV marker appeared on the Spartans' HUDs. There were more of the two-legged freaks right on their tail, though, along with a jumble of the tumbling, leaping swarms of spherical creatures, and it was necessary to scrub the entire lot of them with autofire before they could disengage and slip through a door. The Spartans found themselves on the upper gallery of a large, well-lit room. It was packed with the bipedal, misshapen creatures, but none seemed to be aware of him. They intended to keep it that way, and slid silently along the right-hand wall to a hatch. A short journey brought the Spartans to a similar space where what looked like a full-fledged battle was underway between Covenant troops and the new hostiles. The Spartans briefly considered engaging the targets, there was certainly no shortage of them. They held their fire instead and lingered behind a fallen cargo module. After a hellish battle, the combatants had annihilated one another, which left them free to cross the bridge that led to the far end back along the walkway, and exit via the side door. Another of the hunchbacked creatures dropped from above and slammed into Matt. The Spartan staggered back, dipped, and hurled the monster back over his shoulder. It crunched into the wall and left a trail of mottled gray-green, viscous fluid as it slid to the floor. The Spartans turned to continue on when their motion sensors flickered red, illuminating a contact right behind them. Matt spun and was startled to see the crumpled, badly damaged creature struggle to its feet. Its left arm dangled uselessly and brittle bone protruded from its pale, gangrenous flesh. The thing's right arm was still functional, however. A twisting column of tentacles burst from the creature's right wrist and Matt could hear the bones inside break as they forced its right hand roughly aside. The tentacle flashed out, cracked like a whip and hurled the mat to the floor. His shields were almost completely drained from the single blow. Matt rolled into a crouch and opened fire. The 7.62 mm armor-piercing rounds nearly cut the monster in half. He kicked the fallen hostile, put two in its chest. This time, the damn thing should stay dead, he thought. The Spartans moved farther along the hallway. Two Marines lay where they had fallen, proving that at least some of the second squad had managed to get this far, which opened the possibility that more had escaped as well. The Master Chief checked, discovered that they still wore their dog tags, and took them. They crept through the wide galleries and narrow corridors, past humming machinery, and entered a dark, gloomy vault. Their motion trackers flashed crimson warnings, there were enemies everywhere. Another of the misshapen bipedal hostiles shambled by, and he recognized the shape of the creature's head, the long, angular head of an elite-faced mat. What held his fire was where the head was located. The alien skull was canted at a sickening angle as if the bones of its neck had been softened or liquefied. It hung limply down the creature's back, lifeless, like a limb that needed amputation. It was as if something had rewritten the elite, reshaped it from the inside out. Matt felt an unaccustomed emotion, a trill of fear. An image of helplessness, of screaming at a looming threat, powerless, flashed through his mind, a snapshot of his cryo-addled dreams aboard the Pillar of Autumn. No way is that going to happen to me, he thought. No way. The beast shuffled by and moved out of sight. 
Matt took a deep breath, exhaled, then burst from his position and charged for the center of the room. Matt battered aside the shambling beasts and crushed a handful of the small spherical creatures beneath his boots. His shotgun boomed and thick, green blood splashed the floor. They reached their objective a large lift platform, identical to the one he'd ridden down into this hellhole. Matt reached for the activation panel and hoped that he'd find the up button. One of the hostiles leaped high in the air and landed next to them. The chief dropped to one knee, shoved the barrel of the shotgun into the creature's belly, and fired. The beast flipped end over end and fell back into a lot of the smaller, round hostels. He dove for the activation panel and stabbed at the controls. The elevator platform dropped like a rock, so far down and so fast that his ears popped. The basement, if that's what it was, had all the charm of a crypt. A passageway took him into another large space where he had to fight his way across the floor to a door in the tunnel-like corridor beyond. That's when the Spartans came for to face with something he hadn't seen before and would have preferred never to see again one of the combative, bipedal beasts, this one a horribly mutated human. Though the creature was distorted by whatever had ravaged his body, Matt recognized him nonetheless. It was Private Manuel Mendoza, the soldier that Sergeant Johnson loved to yell at, and one of the Marines who had been with Keyes when he disappeared into this nightmare. Though twisted by what had been done to him, the private's face still retained a trace of humanity, and it was that which caused the Matt to remove his finger from the shotgun's trigger and try to make contact. Mendoza, come on, let's get the hell out of here, Matt said. I know they did something to you but the medics can fix it. The reanimated Marine, now possessed of superhuman strength, struck Matt with such force that it nearly knocked him off his feet, and triggered the suit's alarm. Mendoza, or rather, the thing that had once been Mendoza, waved a whip-like tentacle and lashed out again. The Spartan staggered backward, pulled the trigger, and was subsequently forced to pull it again as the eight-gauge buckshot tore what had been Mendoza apart. The results were both spectacular and disgusting. As the corpse-like horror came apart, the chief saw that one of the small, spherical creatures had taken up residence inside the soldier's chest cavity and seemed to have extended its tentacles into other parts of what had been Mendoza's body. A third shotgun blast served to destroy it as well. Was that how these things worked? The little round paw things infected their hosts and mutated the victim into some kind of combat form. He considered the possibility that this was some kind of new covenant by a weapon and discarded it. The first of these combat forms he'd seen had once been elites. Whatever these damned things were, they were lethal to humans and covenant alike. Matt quickly fed shells into his shotgun, then moved on. The Spartans moved as fast as they could, at a dead run. They charged into another room, scrambled up onto the gallery above, blew an elite form right out of his boots, and ducked through a waiting door. The area on the other side was more of a challenge. The Spartans had the second floor to themselves, but an army of the freaks owned the floor below, and that's where they needed to go. Height conferred advantages. Some well-placed grenades, followed by a jump from the walkway, and 60 seconds of close quarters action were sufficient to see him through. Still, it was a tremendous relief to pass through a completely uncontested space and into a compartment where they found a new development to cope with. In addition to their battering attacks, the creatures had acquired both human and covenant weapons from their victims, and these combat forms were even more dangerous as a result. The combat forms weren't the smartest foes they'd ever encountered, but they weren't mindless automatons, either, they could operate machines and fire weapons. Bullets pinged from the metal walls, plasma fire stuttered through the air, and a grenade detonated as the Spartans cleared the area, and discovered a place where some marines had staged a last stand on top of a cargo container. The duo paused to recover their dog tags, scavenged some ammo, and kept going. Matt fired the last of his shotgun rounds into the collapsed hulk of a combat form. It twitched and lay still. After winding through the confusion of subterranean chambers and passageways for what seemed like hours, they'd finally found a lift to the surface. The chief carefully tapped the activation panel, worried for a moment that this lift would also drop them deeper into the facility, and felt the lift lurch into a rapid ascent. As the lift climbed, Fohammer's worried voice crackled from their comm system. This is Echo 419. Chief, Commander, Crystal, is that you? I lost your signal when you guys disappeared inside the structure. What's going on down there? I'm tracking movement all over the place. You wouldn't believe us if we told you, Crystal replied, her voice grim, and believe me you don't want to know. Be advised Captain Keys is missing and is most likely Kia. Over. Roger that, the pilot replied. 
I'm sorry to hear it, over. The lift jerked to a halt, the Spartans stepped off and found themselves surrounded by Marines. Not the shambling combat forms they'd spent the last eternity fighting, but normal, unchanged human beings. Good to see you, Chief, Commander, a corporal said. The Chief cut the soldier off. There's no time for that, Marine, report. The young Marine gulped, then started talking. After we lost contact we headed for the RV point, and these things, they ambushed us. Sir advise we get the hell out of here, ASAP. That's command thinking, Corporal, Matt replied. Let's go. It was a short walk up the ramp and into the rain. Strangely, and much to Matt's surprise, it felt good to enter the stinking swamp. Very good indeed. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 46 343 Guilty Spark. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 46 343 Guilty Spark. Location surface of Halo. D603354, Spartanii Blue Team Mission Clock. There's a large tower a few hundred meters from your current position, Fohammer said over the radio. Find a way above the fog and foliage canopy and I can move in and pick you up. Roger that, Crystal replied, we're on our way. Knowing the dropship was somewhere above the mist, and eager to get the hell out, the Marines forged ahead. The Spartans cautioned them to slow down, to keep their eyes peeled, but it wasn't long before the duo found themselves back toward the middle of the pack. The tower Fohammer had mentioned appeared up ahead. The base of the column was circular, with half-rounded supports that protruded from the sides, probably for stability. Farther up, extending out from the column itself, were wing-like platforms. Their purpose wasn't clear, but the same could be said for the entire structure. The top of the shaft was lost in the mist. Matt paused to look around, heard one of the Leathernecks yell contact quickly followed by the staccato rip of an assault weapon fired on full automatic. A host of red dots had appeared on the Spartan's threat indicator. He saw a dozen of the spherical infection forms bounce out of the mist and knew that any possibility of containing the creatures underground had been lost. Matt fired short bursts from his assault weapon, popped dozens of the alien pods, and turned to confront a combat form. It was armed with a plasma pistol but chose to throw itself forward rather than fire. Matt's automatic weapon was actually touching the creature when he pulled the trigger. The ex-elite's chest opened like an obscene flower and the infection form hidden within exploded into fleshy pieces. He heard a burst of static in his comm system. Interference whined as the Mjolnir's powerful communications gear tried to scrub the signal, to no avail. It sounded like Fohammer, but he couldn't be sure. Crystal, can you clear up the comms? Matt asked. I'm working on it, she replied. But it's much harder than usual. It's almost like someone or something is trying to stop me. Well try harder, the chief said. You two focus on killing weird unknown alien zombies and I'll try harder on getting the comms cleared up, Crystal snapped back. How does that sound? Sounds like a perfectly good idea with me, Matt said. Sounds fine with me, the chief said. The tide of hostiles fell back into the ankle-deep water and regrouped. A dozen exotic-looking cylindrical machines drifted out of the trees to float over the clearing. The nearest marine yelled, what are they? And was about to shoot at them when the chief raised a cautionary hand. Hold on, Marine, let's see what they do. What happened next was both unexpected and gratifying. Each machine produced a beam of energy, speared one of the hostiles, and burned it down. Some of the combat forms took exception to this treatment and attempted to return fire, but were soon put out of action by the combined efforts of the Marines and their newfound allies. Despite the help, the Marines didn't fare well. There were just too many of the hostile creatures around. The squad dwindled until a pair of PFCs remained, then one, then finally the last of the marines fell beneath a cluster of the little infectious bastards. As the newcomers overhead rained crimson laser fire on a cluster of the combat forms, the Spartans slogged through the swamp toward the tower. High ground, and the possibility of signaling Fohammer for evac, drew them on. They climbed a supporting strut and pulled themselves onto one of the odd, leaf-like terraces that ringed the tower. Matt had a good field of fire, and he fired a burst into a combat form that strayed too close. Matt tried the radio again but was rewarded with more static. Still nothing, Matt said. Still a lot of static. Keep trying, Crystal. 
I am, she replied. Do you want to do this yourself? No, Matt said. Well shut up and let me do the work I need to do. Hold up, the chief interrupted. Do you hear that? 